M. M. Bacton. Translated by Carol Emerson and Michael Holquist. I. Mikhail Mihailovich Bakhtin is gradually emerging as one of the leading thinkers of the 20th century. This claim will strike many as extravagant, since a number of factors have until recently conspired to obscure his importance. Beyond the difficulties usually attending the careers of powerful but eccentric thinkers, there are, in Bakhtin's case, complications that are unique. Some of these in here in his times, his two most productive periods occurred during the darkest years of recent Russian history, the decade following 1917, when the country reeled under the combined effects of a lost war, revolution, civil war, and famine, and the following decade, the 30s, when Bakhtin was in exile in Kazakhstan, and most of the rest of Russia was huddling through the long Stalinist night. It was in these years that Bakhtin wrote something on the order of nine large books on topics as major and varied as Freud, Marx, and the philosophy of language. Only one of these, the Dostoevsky book, appeared under his own name during these years. Three others were published under different names, see section 3 of this introduction, some were partially lost during his forced moves, some disappeared when the Nazis burned down the publishing house that had accepted his large manuscript on the Erzy Hunks Roman, some were delayed 41 years in their publication when journals that had accepted manuscripts were shut down, as happened to the Russian contemporary in 1924, others, such as the Rabelais book, were considered too aberrant. For publication, due to their emphasis on sex and body functions, see section 2 of this introduction. Another factor that has clouded perception of the scope of Bakhtin's activity in the Anglophone world, at least, is the tradition in which he was working. He was trained as a classicist during a period when the German model of philology dominated Russian universities, thus he inherited a certain heaviness of style and a predilection for abstraction that English or American readers, accustomed to a more essayistic prose, sometimes find heavy going. Bakhtin's style while recognizably belonging to a Russian tradition of scholarly prose, is, nevertheless, highly idiosyncratic. Language in his texts works somewhat as language does in the novel, the genre that obsessed him all his life, according to Ian Watt, the rise of the novel, the genre itself works by exhaustive presentation rather than by elegant concentration. The more we know about Bakhtin's life, the clearer it becomes that he was a supreme eccentric, of an order the Russians express better than we in their word kudak, which has overtones of such intense strangeness that it borders on kudo, a wonder. And this peculiarity is reflected not only in the strange history of his texts, why, ultimately, did he publish under so many names, but in his style as well, if one may speak of a single style for one who was so concerned with other voicedness. Russians immediately sense the strangeness, again and again when we have gone to native speakers with questions about a peculiar usage of a familiar word or an unfamiliar coinage, the Russians have thrown up their hands or shaken their heads and smiled ruefully. Another difficulty the reader must confront is the unfamiliar shadings Bakhtin gives to West European cultural history. He tends to ignore the available chapterization into familiar periods and isms. It is not so much Periclean Athens or Augustan Rome that attracts him as it is the vagaries of the Hellenistic age. He is preoccupied by centuries usually ignored by others, and within these, he has great affection for figures who are even more obscure. A peculiar school of grammarians at Toulouse in the 7th century AD may appear to others as an obscure group working in a backwater during the darkest of the Dark Ages, for Bakhtin the work of these otherwise almost forgotten men constitutes an extremely important chapter in the human struggle to accommodate the mysteries of human language. He keeps returning to the Carolingian revival or the interstitial periods between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. When he does cite a familiar period, he often tends to isolate an otherwise obscure figure within it thus his focusing on Pagres of Halicarnassus or Ion of Chios among the Greeks, on Vero among the Romans, when dealing with the 19th century, it is the relatively unfamiliar Wessel or Musas he cites. Bakhtin throws a weird light on our received models of intellectual history. It is as if he set out to carnivalize to use a verb that has become modishly transitive due to his own work on Rabelais the normal periods and figures we use to define the relay of culture. 
clearly, one could make such a perverse undertaking pay its way only if possessed of two prerequisites, enormous learning and a theory capable of sustaining a balance between such an aberrant history and more conventional historical models. Of Bakhtin's preternatural erudition there can be no doubt he belongs to the tradition that produced Spitzer, Curtius, Auerbach and, somewhat later, René Wellleck. Many times when we have consulted specialists in the various fields from which Bakhtin so easily draws his recherche examples, it was only to be told that such and such a work did not exist, or, if it did, it was not characteristic. A few days later, however, after some more digging or thinking, the same specialist would call to say that indeed there was such a work, and, although little known even to most experts, it was the most precisely correct text for illustrating the point Bakhtin sought to make by invoking it. He has, then, a knowledge of West European civilization detailed enough to permit him to use traditional accounts as a dialogizing background to sustain the counter model he will propose. And that counter model is motivated by a theory that can rationalize not only its own subversions, but the effects of mainstream traditions as well. I say theory and not system the two do not always go hand in hand because Bakhtin's motivating idea is in its essence opposed to any strict formalization. Other commentators, such as Tsvet and Todorov in a forthcoming book devoted to Bakhtin, have seen this as a weakness in his work. They have come to this conclusion, I believe, because they bring to Bakhtin's work expectations based on the kind of thinking characteristic of other major theorists who engage the same issues as Bakhtin. Bakhtin is constantly working with what is emerging as the central preoccupation of our time language. But unlike others who have made substantial contributions to our understanding of language in the 20th century Saussure, Hjelms Leff, Ben Venist and, above all, Roman Jacobson, all of whom are systematic to an extraordinary degree, Bakhtin is not. If you expect a Jacobsonian order of systematic alness in Bakhtin, you are bound to be frustrated. This does not mean, however, that he is without a peculiar rigor of his own. It is rather that his concept of language stands in relation to others, of the sort that occupy linguists, much as the novel stands in opposition to other, more formalized genres. That is, the novel as backed in more than anyone else has taught us to see does not lack its organizing principles, but they are of a different order from those regulating sonnets or odes. It may be said Jacobson works with poetry because he has a Pushkinian love of order, Bakhtin, on the contrary, loves novels because he is a baggy monster. At the heart of everything Bakhtin ever did from what we know of his very earliest, lost, manuscripts to the very latest, still unpublished, work is a highly distinctive concept of language. The conception has as its enabling a priori an almost Monichean sense of opposition and struggle at the heart of existence, a ceaseless battle between centrifugal forces that seek to keep things apart, and centripetal forces that strive to make things cohere. This Zoroastrian clash is present in culture as well as nature, and in the specificity of individual consciousness, it is at work in the even greater particularity of individual utterances. The most complete and complex reflection of these forces is found in human language, and the best transcription of language so understood is the novel. Two things must immediately be added here. First, while language does serve to reflect this struggle, it is no passive stuff, no mere yielding clay. Language itself is no less immune from the effects of the struggle than anything else. Its nature as a system is even more fraught with the contest, which may be why it occupies so central a place in the activity of mind. Bakhtin, need it be said, is not working in this dichotomy of forces with the kind of binary opposition that has proved so important in structuralist linguistics, and so seductive to social scientists and humanists lusting for a greater degree of systematic alness. That opposition leads from human speech to computer language, it conduces, in other words, to machines. Bakhtin's sense of a duel between more widely implicated forces leads in the opposite direction and stresses the fragility and ineluctably historical nature of language, the coming and dying of meaning that it, as a phenomenon, shares with that other phenomenon it ventriloquates, man. Secondly, 
language must not be understood in these essays in the restricted sense in which it occupies professional linguists. As Bakhtin says, in discourse in the novel, at any given moment, a language is stratified not only into dialects in the strict sense of the word, i.e., dialects that are set off according to formal linguistic especially phonetic markers, but is, stratified as well into languages that are socio-ideological, languages belonging to professions, to genres, languages peculiar to particular generations, etc. This stratification and diversity of speech Iris Nora Sivost will spread wider and penetrate to ever deeper levels so long as a language is alive and still in the process of becoming. The two contending tendencies are not of equal force, and each has a different kind of reality attaching to it, centrifugal forces are clearly more powerful and ubiquitous theirs is the reality of actual articulation. They are always in presentia, they determine the way we actually experience language as we use it and are used by it in the dense particularity of our everyday lives. Unifying, centripetal forces are less powerful and have a complex ontological status. Their relation to centrifugal operations is akin to the interworking that anthropologists nominate as the activity of culture in modeling a completely different order called nature. As Bakhtin says, again in discourse a unitary language is not something that is given Dan, but is in its very essence something that must be posited Tsatan at every moment in the life of a language it opposes the realities of heteroglossy erasnorisi, but at the same time the sophisticated ideal or primitive delusion of a single, holistic language makes the actuality of its presence felt as a force resisting an absolute heteroglot state, it posits definite boundaries for limiting the potential chaos of variety, thus guaranteeing a more or less maximal mutual understanding. The term Bakhtin uses here, heteroglossy erasnorisi, is a master trope at the heart of all his other projects, one more fundamental than such other categories associated with his thought as polyphony or carnivalization. These are but two specific ways in which the primary condition of heteroglossia manifests itself. Heteroglossia is Bakhtin's way of referring, in any utterance of any kind, to the peculiar interaction between the two fundamentals of all communication. On the one hand, a mode of transcription must, in order to do its work of separating out texts, be a more or less fixed system. But these repeatable features, on the other hand, are in the power of the particular context in which the utterance is made, this context can refract, add to, or, in some cases, even subtract from the amount and kind of meaning the utterance may be said to have when it is conceived only as a systematic manifestation independent of context. This extraordinary sensitivity to the immense plurality of experience more than anything else distinguishes Bakhtin from other moderns who have been obsessed with language. I emphasize experience here because Bakhtin's basic scenario for modeling variety is two actual people talking to each other in a specific dialogue at a particular time and in a particular place. But these persons would not confront each other as sovereign egos capable of sending messages to each other through the kind of uncluttered space envisioned by the artists who illustrate most receiver-sender models of communication. Rather, each of the two persons would be a consciousness at a specific point in the history of defining itself through the choice it has made out of all the possible existing languages available to it at that moment of a discourse to transcribe its intention in this specific exchange. The two will, like everyone else, have been born into an environment in which the air is already a swarm with names. Their development as individuals and in this Bakhtin's thought parallels in suggestive ways that of Vygotsky in Russia, C. Emerson, 1978, and Lakin in France, C. Bruss, in Tichinik's translation of Volodynov's Freudianism, 1976, will have been prosecuted as a gradual appropriation of a specific mix of discourses that are capable of best mediating their own intentions, rather than those which sleep in the words they use before they use them. Thus each will seek, by means of intonation, pronunciation, lexical choice, gesture, and so on, to send out a message to the other with a minimum of interference from the otherness constituted by pre-existing meanings, in hearing in dictionaries or ideologies, and the otherness of the intentions present in the other person in the dialogue. 
Implicit in all this is the notion that all transcription systems including the speaking voice in a living utterance are inadequate to the multiplicity of the meanings they seek to convey. My voice gives the illusion of unity to what I say, I am, in fact, constantly expressing a plenitude of meanings, some intended, others of which I am unaware. There is in this obsession with voice and speech a parallel with the attempts of two important recent thinkers both in other ways very different from Bakhtin to come to grips with the way intimacy with our own voice conduces to the illusion of presence, who Searle in The Logical Investigations and Derrida in his 1967 essay Speech and Phenomenon. It is the need to confront this multiplicity in a principled way that impels Bakhtin to coin some of his more outre terms, the word heteroglossia itself, word with a loophole, word with a sidewards glance, into national quotation marks and so forth. He uses these rather than the more conventional terminology we associate with a linguistic concern for language first of all because traditional linguistics has taken little heed of the problem of ALD or ID in language. Bakhtin, like Austin, How to Do Things with Words, 1962, Searle, Speech Acts, 1969, and particularly Grice, the legendary but still unpublished 1967 James Lectures on Logic and Conversation, stresses the speech aspect of language, utterance, to emphasize the immediacy of the kind of meaning he is after. He does so as well to highlight his contention that language is never except for certain linguists what linguists say it is. There is no such thing as a general language, a language that is spoken by a general voice, that may be divorced from a specific saying, which is charged with particular overtones. Language, when it means, is somebody talking to somebody else, even when that someone else is one's own inner addressee. Bakhtin's theory of metalanguage is extremely complicated and deserves detailed study. I have merely alluded to it here in order to provide a context for the more particular subject matter unifying these four essays the novel. I began with Bakhtin's insistence on the primacy of speech because what he has to say about novels is incomprehensible if the emphasis on utterance is not always kept in mind. In section 4 we shall once again take up the relationship between Bakhtin's ideas about language and his distinctive theory of the novel's extra-literary importance. 2. Bakhtin was born November 16, 1895 in Orel into an old family of the nobility, dating from at least the 14th century that no longer owned property at the time of his birth. Bakhtin's father was a bank official who worked in several cities as Mikhail Mihailovich was growing up. The early years of his childhood were spent in Orel, then in Vilnius, Lithuania, and finally Odessa, where he finished the gymnasium and entered the historical and philological faculty of the local university in 1913. He soon transferred to Petersburg University, where his brother Nikolaj, later professor of Greek and linguistics at Birmingham University, was a student. It was an exhilarating time to be in St. Petersburg. There was the stimulation of attacks and counter-attacks by symbolists, AC mice and futurists in poetry. Criticism, too, took on a new urgency and glamour, the very year Bakhtin came to the city Shklovsky published the article that was to be the first salvo in the battles that raged around the formalists. The university was an especially exciting place to be, notably in the areas of Bakhtin's interests. D.K. Petrov, the distinguished Hispanist and student of Baudouin de Courtenay, the philosopher A. Ivodinskij and Alexander N. Veslovskij, a founder of the modern study of comparative literature, were teaching at this time. But Bakhtin was influenced particularly by the great classicist F. F. Zelenskij, some of Bakhtin's key concepts can be traced back to suggestions in Zelenskij's works, primarily those dealing with the Roman oratorical tradition. During these years Bakhtin laid the foundations of his prodigious knowledge of philosophy, especially classical and German thinkers. Vidinskij was the leading Russian Kantian, and N0. Loskij, another of Bakhtin's teachers, had studied under Wendell Band and Wund. In 1918 Bakhtin finished the university and moved to Navel, a West Russian city, where he taught school for two years. It was here that the members of the first Bakhtin circle, with the exception of P. N. Medvedev, who became associated with it in 1920 in Vitebsk, came together, left Pumpianskij, 
later professor in the philological faculty at Leningrad University, V. N. Velozinov, later a linguist, but at this time a musicologist and would-be symbolist poet, M. V. Judina, later one of Russia's greatest concert pianists, I. I. Solerdinskij, later artistic director of the Leningrad Philharmonic, and B. M. Zubakin, archaeologist, mason, and grand eccentric. There were others as well who attended discussions less frequently, but who shared the passionate interest of the group in threshing out literary, religious, and political topics. But the most frequent topic of discussion, the subject of most burning concern for the majority of the group certainly for Bakhtin was German philosophy. At this point Bakhtin thought of himself essentially as a philosopher and not as a literary scholar. A very important member of the group for him, then, was Matvey Hysayek Kagan, later an editor of the Monumental Encyclopedia of Soviet Energy Resources, but at this time still a professional philosopher a philosopher, moreover, who had just returned from Germany, where he had spent almost ten years studying at Marburg and Berlin. He had been close to the Marburg Neocantians, he translated Naderp and was highly thought of by Hermann Cohen and Ernst Kassirer. Kagan was Bakhtin's best friend in these years, in some ways filling the personal and intellectual gap left by the departure of Bakhtin's brother, Nikolaj. We can see traces of Kagan's influence in the concern for such neo-Kantian preoccupations as axiology and the need to rethink the mind-slash-world opposition that are present in Bakhtin's first published work, Art and Responsibility. This small 1919 piece is actually a précis of a major work on moral philosophy to which Bakhtin devoted himself while in Navel that was never published, except in portions, and then only 60 years later, in 1979. In 192 oh he moved to Vitebsk, in the same general area. Vitebsk was at that time a cultural boom town, an island of light in the dark currents of revolution and civil war, a refuge for such artists as L. Lysitskij, Malevich, and Mark Chagall. Several prominent scientists also lived in the Belarusian city at this time, as well as leading musicians from the former Mariinskij Theater who taught at the conservatory. A lively journal, Iskustvo, was started, and there were constant lectures and discussions. Two events of great personal importance occurred during the Vitebsk period, in 1921 Bakhtin married Elena Alexandrovna Okolovic, who was indispensable to him until her death in 1971, and in 1923 the bone disease that was to plague Bakhtin all his life and that would lead to the amputation of a leg in 1938 made its first appearance. In 1924 Bakhtin moved back to Leningrad, working at the Historical Institute and consulting for the State Publishing House. Bakhtin was finally moved to let some of his work see the light of day. In the fate of an early article we can see the emergence of a vicious pattern that was to repeat itself throughout his life, continually, Bakhtin's manuscripts were suppressed or actually lost, by chance or by the opposition of determined enemies. Just as Bakhtin's on the question of the methodology of aesthetics in written works was about to appear, Ruskij Sovramanik, the journal that had commissioned the piece, ceased publication. Thus this seminal work was not published until 51 years later. These were nevertheless fruitful years for Bakhtin, during which he continued his constant discussions, now with a circle made up of such friends and followers as the poet N. A. Kljuv, the renowned biologist I. I. Konov, the experimental writers Konstantin Vaginov and Daniel Karms, the indologist M. I. Tubianskij. Although Bakhtin had been studying and thinking ceaselessly during these years, his first major published work finally appeared only in 1929, The Magisterial Problems of Dostoevsky's Art, in which Bakhtin's revolutionary concept of dialogism, polyphony, was first announced to the world. The book, controversial as only a radically new vision of an old topic can be, was nevertheless well received. Some including the Minister of Education and the leading party intellectual Anatoly Lunakarsky, even recognized it to be the revolutionary document that it has indeed proved to be. The impact of the book was muffled, however, because just as it appeared, Bakhtin was sent to the wilds of Kazakhstan. He spent the next six years in exile as a bookkeeper in the obscure town of Kustanej. 
several of his closest associates disappeared forever during the purges of the late 193 OS. Bakhtin somehow continued to work even in Kustanej, and several of his most important essays, such as Discourse, Sloval in the novel, were outfitten during these years. He was supplied books from the Saul Tykovshchetrin Library in Leningrad and the Lenin Library in Moscow by his friends. In 1936 he was able to teach courses in the Mordovian Pedagogical Institute in Saransk and in 1937 moved to the town of Kumri, 200 kilometers from Moscow, where he finished work on a major book devoted to the 18th century German novel, Erzy Hunk's Roman. This manuscript was accepted by the Sovetskij Pisatel Publishing House, but the only copy of it disappeared during the confusion of the German invasion yet another example of the hex at work in Bakhtin's publishing career. The only other copy of this manuscript Bakhtin an inveterate smoker used as paper to roll his own cigarettes during the dark days of the German invasion, which gives some idea, perhaps, of how cavalierly Bakhtin regarded his own thoughts once they had already been thought through. It was only after the most strenuous arguments by Vadim Koyanov and Serge Bakarov that Bakhtin could be persuaded first of all to reveal the whereabouts of what unpublished manuscripts he had, in a rat-infested woodshed in Saransk, and then to permit them to be retranscribed for publication. From 1940 to the end of World War II Bakhtin lived in the environs of Moscow. In 1940 he had submitted a long dissertation on Rabelais, but it could not be defended until after the war was over. In 1946 and 1949 his defense of the dissertation split the Moscow scholarly world into two camps, the original and unorthodox manuscript was accepted by the official opponents appointed to preside over the defense, but other professors felt strongly enough about Bakhtin to intervene against its acceptance. There were several stormy meetings, one lasting seven hours, until the government finally stepped in, in the end the state accrediting bureau denied his doctorate. Thus Rabelais and folk culture of the Middle Ages and Renaissance, which has since gone through many editions in several languages, had to wait until 1965, 19 years later, before it was published. But Bakhtin's friends were no less determined than his enemies, and a group that had been attracted to him during his stay in Saransk in 1936 now invited him back to be the chairman of the General Literature Department. Thus began Bakhtin's long and affectionate relationship with the institution that, when it was upgraded from teacher's college to university in 1957, made him head of the expanded Department of Russian and World Literature. A beloved teacher himself, whenever he lectured the hall was sure to be crowded, he influenced generations of young people who went out to teach. In August of 1961 Bakhtin was forced to retire due to declining health. In 1969 he returned to Moscow for medical treatment, living in the city until his death on March 7, 197 s. These last years were busy and fulfilling for Bakhtin, finally bringing him the fame and influence he so long had been denied. A group of young scholars at Moscow University, under Vtur Ben, and at the Gorkij Institute, most notably V. Kozinov and Espikarov, yet another Bakhtin circle, energetically took up his cause. He was also aided by the eminent linguist and theoretician, V. V. Ivanov. The Dostoevsky book was republished in 1963, largely due to the extraordinary efforts of Kozinov, whose role in this affair does him honor. Its appearance created a sensation that helped to rekindle interest in basic questions of literary study. In 1965 the Rabelais book was published following a series of programmatic articles in leading journals. In 1975 a collection of Bakhtin's major essays outlining a historical poetics for the novel, Questions of Literature and Aesthetics, from which the four essays in this volume are taken, came out soon after his death. Just before he died he learned that Yale University was trying to arrange for him to be awarded an honorary degree. 3. There is a great controversy over the authorship of three books that have been ascribed to Bakhtin, Freudianism, 1927 and Marxism and the Philosophy of Language, 1929, Second ed. 193o, both published under the name of V. N. Volojinov, and The Formal Method in Literary Scholarship, 1928, published under the name of P. N. Medvedev. 
This is not the place to go into the arcana of Bakhtin's textology. The question is of a complexity that requires extended treatment on its own. The view of the present editor is that 90% of the text of the three books in question is indeed the work of Bakhtin himself. 4. The most immediate contribution these essays make is to the theory of the novel, a particularly vexed area of literary scholarship. The enormous success of the novel in the 19th century has obscured the fact that for most of its history it was a marginal genre, little studied and frequently denounced. Even in an age such as our own, when there is no dearth of books devoted to the novel, there is very little agreement as to what the word means. Consider three exemplary titles in which the substantive novel is preceded by the definite article, Luckock's Theory of the Novel, 1920, Ian Watts' The Rise of the Novel, 1957, and Lucien Goldman's Towards a Sociology of the Novel, 1964, English TR 1975. These are all important books that have greatly advanced our understanding of certain kinds of novels, but each in its own way dramatizes the same shortcoming, they seek to elevate one kind of novel into a definition of the novel as such, as does René Girard in another very influential book, Deceit, Desire, and the novel 1961. They lack a field theory capable of encompassing not only the texts nominated by the others as novels, but two millennia of long prose fictions preceding the 17th century the period when, according to consensus, the novel experienced its birth. The same view holds that the novel rose in the 18th century and triumphed in the 19th its death in the 20th century is a foregone conclusion by the same historical logic. A major reason why so little powerfully syncretic work has been done in the area of novels, even by those who recognize the dilemma posed by excluding pre-17th century narratives such as Scholes and Kellogg, the nature of narrative 19661, is that the absolute novelty of the novel has not been adequately recognized. Bakhtin's advantage over everyone else working on novel theory is that he is able to include more texts from the past in his scheme than anyone else and this because, paradoxically, he more than others perceives the novel as new. Not new when it is said to have arisen, but new whenever that kind of text made its appearance, as it has done since at least the ancient Greeks, a text that merely found its most comprehensive form in Cervantes and those who have come after. In order to see what kind of text might have so radical a novelty, we shall have to rethink the basic categories of genre and style. Syncretic chronicles of such genres as the ode, the lyric, or tragedy may be written extending back to classical times, because each such history will have as its subject a set of formal characteristics so fixed from the earliest days of European culture that nuanced modulations, in their surface features, at least, can be recognized with relative ease. It is probably for this reason that such discursively homogeneous genres accord so well with received ideas about the periodization of general history into such chapters as classical antiquity, the age of Louis XIV and so forth. So militantly protean a form as the novel raises serious problems for those who seek to confine it to the linear shape of most histories. The difficulty is compounded if we recognize further that such histories usually begin by presupposing the very organizing categories that it is the nature of novels to resist. Histories are like novels in that they set out to provide more or less comprehensive accounts of social systems. Histories occupy themselves with relationships between the strata of legal codes, religious beliefs, economic organization, family structure, and so forth, in order to create a series of moments in which the interaction of these forces can be seen in their simultaneity as well as their continuity. And novels, too, concern themselves more or less with such interrelationships, the particular assemblage of discourses that define specific cultures. But histories differ from novels in that they insist on a homology between the sequence of their own telling, the form they impose to create a coherent explanation in the form of a narrative on the one hand, and the sequence of what they tell on the other. This templating of what is enunciated with the act of enunciation is a narrative consequence of the historian's professional desire to tell we es igent lich joasenist. The novel, by contrast, dramatizes the gaps that always exist between what is told and the telling of it, constantly experimenting with social, discursive, and narrative asymmetries, 
the formal teratology that led Henry James to call them fluid puddings. History has perhaps most often been compared with the novel because both presume a certain completeness of inventory. Each in its own way strives to give narrative shape to material of encyclopedic variety and plentitude. Thus, a good history of Russia, for instance, might very well seek to be what Belinsky said Evgeny Jonigin was, an encyclopedia of Russian life, like the novel, such a history would describe rank, manners, differences between the capital and the provinces and so forth. But as Bakhtin has said of Pushkin's work, it is not an encyclopedia that merely catalogues inert institutions, the brute things of everyday life, Russian life speaks in all its voices in Evgeny Jonigin, in all the languages and styles of the era. Literary language is not represented in the novel as it is in other genres as a unitary, completely finished off, in dividably adequate language it is represented precisely as a living mix of varied and opposing voices Rasnora Sivast. The emphasis on social variety dramatized as contests between different voices speaking various intralanguages of the abstract system we call the Russian language is what defines the devilish difference Javelske Jaraznikaj making Evgeny Jonigin a novel in verse, and not just a long poem. And insofar as Evgeny Jonigin is a dialogized system made up of the images of languages, styles, and consciousnesses that are concrete and inseparable from language, it is typical of all novels. It dramatizes in these features both the difficulty of defining the novel as a genre and the reason the question of its history is so fraught. Other genres are constituted by a set of formal features for fixing language that pre-exist any specific utterance within the genre. Language, in other words, is assimilated to form. The novel by contrast seeks to shape its form to languages, it has a completely different relationship to languages from other genres since it constantly experiments with new shapes in order to display the variety and immediacy of speech diversity. It is thus best conceived either as a supergenre, whose power consists in its ability to engulf and ingest all other genres, the different and separate languages peculiar to each, together with other stylized but non-literary forms of language, or not a genre in any strict, traditional sense at all. In either case it is obvious that the history of what might be called novels, when they are defined by their proclivity to display different languages interpenetrating each other, will be extremely complicated. The only history of the novel adequate to such complexity has been proposed by Mikhail Bakhtin, whose definition of the genre as a consciously structured hybrid of languages I have used in the preceding remarks. Bakhtin has succeeded in forging a history capable of comprehending the very earliest classical texts, such as the Margits traditionally ascribed to Homer, Hellenistic and Roman texts and medieval romances, as well as the titles that are usually advanced in more traditional accounts of the genre, such as Guzman Alfaric and Don Quixote. It is a history that includes as well elements from the oral tradition of folklore going back to prehistoric times. And Bakhtin has been able to do this because he has grasped that the novel cannot be studied with the same set of ideas about the relation of language to style that we bring to bear on other genres. Most versions of literary stylistics whether Spitzer's or Vinogradov's assume that language operates more or less as professional linguists tell us it does, both in our everyday lives and in literary texts. Literary texts simply intensify certain capabilities of language that are potential in spoken speech as well, Poetry is violence practiced on ordinary speech, to paraphrase the young Jacobson. Style in this view means the sum of the operations performed by the poet in order to accomplish the violence necessary to mark the text off as literature. Valuable work has been done in most genres by critics presuming style so understood. The reason is that not only most critics, but most genres begin with this assumption, the homogeneity of the genre corresponds to ideas about the privileged status of a unitary, centripetalizing language shared by its practitioners on the one hand and its students on the other. The novel is utterly different from such genres because it presumes a completely other relationship to language. But, according to Bakhtin, this has not yet been perceived by its students who if they are not utterly lost in the morass of gossipy character analysis, 
ethical high-mindedness and watered-down psychology that frequently passes as novel criticism continue to view the novel through the optic of a traditional stylistic that has proved so successful with other text types, but is quite inappropriate to novels. The most recent form this approach has taken is a concern no longer for a Lansonian attention to the language of the text, but rather for the language of the plot what, following Prop's groundbreaking work, has been called the morphology or syntagmatics of narrative. Attempts have been made to apply to the novel the kind of structural analysis that has been so remarkably successful with short formulaic forms such as folk tales, detective stories, and industrial folklore, that is, serial novels for children, Tom Swift, etc. The work of men such as Griemas in France, Du Lens, 1970, or Van Dijk in Holland, some aspects of text grammars, 1972, has led others, such as Meir Sternberg what is exposition. In the theory of the novel, ed. John Halperin, 1974, to conclude that the novel, too, might lend itself to tree diagrams and Freitag pyramids. Such critics forget what Eken Baum pointed out in 1925, that the novel and the short story are forms not only different in kind but also inherently at odds. 0. Henry and the Short Story The lugubrious results of these analyses serve to confirm what Bakhtin concluded long ago, the utter inadequacy of most existing literary theory is exposed when it is forced to deal with the novel, see epic and novel. The situation he decried in the 30s is no better in the 70s. This situation Bakhtin addresses in the four essays in this collection. V. By the time Bakhtin came to write these essays he had completed the Dostoevsky book, which made what appeared at the time to be rather extravagant claims for that author's uniqueness. The second edition, 1963, has attached to it new material that seeks rather to place the Dostoevsky novel into a tradition. The new material and the point of view that it entails are drawn from work on the history of the novel Bakhtin pursued during the 34 years that intervened between the two editions. In those years Bakhtin came to regard the Dostoevsky novel not so much as an absolutely unprecedented event in the history of the genre, but rather as the purest expression of what always had been implicit in it. Viewing the history of the novel through the optic of the Dostoevsky example had revolutionary consequences. The novel ceases to be merely one genre among many, epic and novel. It becomes not only the leading hero in the drama of literary development in our time, epic and novel, but the most significant force at work even in those early periods when most other scholars would argue that there were no novels being written at all. Such scholars would, within their own terms, be correct in asserting that there were no novels in Plato's Athens or during the Middle Ages, or at least no novel as we have come to know it. But Bakhtin is clearly not referring to that concept of a novel that begins with Cervantes or Richardson. These books, and especially the 19th century psychological novel that evolved from them, have become the canon of the genre novel. The majority of literary scholars are most at home when dealing with canons, which is why Bakhtin said that literary theory is helpless to deal with the novel. Rather, Novel is the name Bakhtin gives to whatever force is at work within a given literary system to reveal the limits, the artificial constraints of that system. Literary systems are comprised of canons, and novelization is fundamentally anti-canonical. It will not permit generic monologue. Always it will insist on the dialogue between what a given system will admit as literature and those texts that are otherwise excluded from such a definition of literature. What is more conventionally thought of as the novel is simply the most complex and distilled expression of this impulse. The history of the novel so conceived is very long, but it exists outside the bounds of what traditional scholars would think of as strictly literary history. Bakhtin's history would be charted, among other ways, in devaluation of a given culture's higher literary forms, the parodies of knightly romances, Cervantes, pastorals, Sorrel, sentimental fictions, stern, fielding. But these texts are merely late examples of a tendency that has been abroad at least since the ancient Greeks. Bakhtin comes very close to naming Socrates as the first novelist, since the gadfly role he played, and which he played out in the drama of precisely the dialogue, 
is more or less what the role of the novel always has been. That role has been assumed by such unexpected forms as the confession, the utopia, the epistle, or the Menippine satire, in which Bakhtin is particularly interested. Even the drama, Ibsen and other naturalists, the long poem, Child Harold or Don Juan, or the lyric, as in Heine, become masks for the novel during the 19th century. As formerly distinct literary genres are subjected to the novel's intensifying anti-generic power, their systematic purity is infected and they become novelized. The first essay in this volume seeks to establish the distinctiveness of the novel by opposing it to the epic. What emerges is a definition of novels as peculiarly suited to our post-lapsarian, post-industrial civilization, since it thrives on precisely the kind of diversity the epic, and by extension, myth, and all other traditional forms of narrative, sets out to purge from its world. The essay posits a novel defined by what could be called the rule of genre inclusiveness, the novel can include, ingest, devour other genres and still retain its status as a novel, but other genres cannot include novelistic elements without impairing their own identity as epics, odes, or any other fixed genre. This essay will inevitably be compared with the use Lukacs, in his theory of the novel, makes of the same contrast, and will, no doubt, be compared as well to the way Auerbach, Mimesis, 19461, distinguishes between Homeric and Biblical texts. Bakhtin differs from Lukacs in his evaluation of the novel's fallen state, just as his concept of heteroglossia is a happy redaction of the conditions otherwise so gloomily charted by Derrida's epigones as difference, so his concept of the novel's relation to epic is an affirming version of what the pessimistic Lukacs means when he says the novel is the characteristic text of an age of absolute sinfulness. Bakhtin differs from Auerbach, with whom he shares, otherwise, many suggestive parallels, both in his life and in his work, in that the Bible could never represent the novel in a contrast with epic, since both, Bible and epic, would share a presumption of authority, a claim to absolute language, utterly foreign to the novel's joyous awareness of the inadequacies of its own language. But since the novel is aware of the impossibility of full meaning, presence, it is free to exploit such a lack to its own hybridizing purposes. The second essay, From the Prehistory of Novelistic Discourse, is less conventional than the first, and outlines in a most economical way how a number of disparate texts from the distant past finally coalesced into what we now know as the modern novel. It is a thumbnail history of the force Bakhtin calls novelness, an epistemological capability larger than any concrete expression of it before the novel as a text type emerges in its own right. The third essay introduces one of Bakhtin's coinages in its title. Chronotope is a category that no brief introduction, much less glossary, can adequately adumbrate. The long essay uses the concept as yet another way to define the distinctiveness of the novel by means of its history, using differing ratios of time-space projection as the unit for charting changes. The fourth essay in this volume, Discourse in the Novel, is one of Bakhtin's most suggestive and, with the exception of certain chapters in Marxism and the philosophy of language, the most comprehensive statement of his philosophy of language. It has as its skeleton yet another model for a history of discourse that eventuates in the supreme self-consciousness, consciousness of the other, marked by the heteroglossia of the modern novel. It will be clear from even so cursory an overview that the essays in this volume have been arranged in order of their complexity, with the simplest and most conventional appearing first, and the most difficult appearing last. The study of the novel as a genre is distinguished by peculiar difficulties. This is due to the unique nature of the object itself, the novel is the sole genre that continues to develop, that is as yet uncompleted. The forces that define it as a genre are at work before our very eyes, the birth and development of the novel as a genre takes place in the full light of the historical day. The generic skeleton of the novel is still far from having hardened, and we cannot foresee all its plastic possibilities. We know other genres, as genres, in their completed aspect, that is, as more or less fixed pre-existing forms into which one may then pour artistic experience. The primordial process of their formation lies outside historically documented observation. 
We encounter the epic as a genre that has not only long since completed its development, but one that is already antiquated. With certain reservations we can say the same for the other major genres, even for tragedy. The life they have in history, the life with which we are familiar, is the life they have lived as already completed genres, with a hardened and no longer flexible skeleton. Each of them has developed its own canon that operates in literature as an authentic historical force. All these genres, or in any case their defining features, are considerably older than written language and the book, and to the present day they retain their ancient oral and auditory characteristics. Of all the major genres only the novel is younger than writing and the book, it alone is organically receptive to new forms of mute perception, that is, to reading. But of critical importance here is the fact that the novel has no canon of its own, as do other genres, only individual examples of the novel are historically active, not a generic canon as such. Studying other genres is analogous to studying dead languages, studying the novel, on the other hand, is like studying languages that are not only alive, but still young. This explains the extraordinary difficulty inherent in formulating a theory of the novel. For such a theory has at its heart an object of study completely different from that which theory treats in other genres. The novel is not merely one genre among other genres. Among genres long since completed and in part already dead, the novel is the only developing genre. It is the only genre that was born and nourished in a new era of world history and therefore it is deeply akin to that era, whereas the other major genres entered that era as already fixed forms, as an inheritance, and only now are they adapting themselves some better, some worse to the new conditions of their existence. Compared with them, the novel appears to be a creature from an alien species. It gets on poorly with other genres. It fights for its own hegemony in literature, wherever it triumphs, the other older genres go into decline. Significantly, the best book on the history of the ancient novel that by Irwin Road does not so much recount the history of the novel as it does illustrate the process of disintegration that affected all major genres in antiquity. The mutual interaction of genres within a single unified literary period is a problem of great interest and importance. In certain eras the Greek classical period, the golden age of Roman literature, the neoclassical period all genres in high literature, that is, the literature of ruling social groups, harmoniously reinforce each other to a significant extent, the whole of literature, conceived as a totality of genres, becomes an organic unity of the highest order. But it is characteristic of the novel that it never enters into this whole, it does not participate in any harmony of the genres. In these eras the novel has an unofficial existence, outside high literature. Only already completed genres, with fully formed and well-defined generic contours, can enter into such a literature as a hierarchically organized, organic whole. They can mutually delimit and mutually complement each other, while yet preserving their own generic natures. Each is a unit, and all units are interrelated by virtue of certain features of deep structure that they all have in common. The great organic poetics of the past those of Aristotle, Horace, Boileau are permeated with a deep sense of the wholeness of literature and of the harmonious interaction of all genres contained within this whole. It is as if they literally hear this harmony of the genres. In this is their strength the inimitable, all-embracing fullness and exhaustiveness of such poetics. And they all, as a consequence, ignore the novel. Scholarly poetics of the 19th century lack this integrity, they are eclectic, descriptive, their aim is not a living and organic fullness but rather an abstract and encyclopedic comprehensiveness. They do not concern themselves with the actual possibility of specific genres coexisting within the living whole of literature in a given era, they are concerned rather with their coexistence in a maximally complete anthology. Of course these poetics can no longer ignore the novel they simply add it, albeit in a place of honor, to already existing genres, and thus it enters the roster as merely one genre among many, in literature conceived as a living whole, on the other hand, it would have to be included in a completely different way. We have already said that the novel gets on poorly with other genres. 
there can be no talk of a harmony deriving from mutual limitation and complementariness. The novel parodies other genres, precisely in their role as genres, it exposes the conventionality of their forms and their language, it squeezes out some genres and incorporates others into its own peculiar structure, reformulating and reaccentuating them. Historians of literature sometimes tend to see in this merely the struggle of literary tendencies and schools. Such struggles of course exist, but they are peripheral phenomena and historically insignificant. Behind them one must be sensitive to the deeper and more truly historical struggle of genres, the establishment and growth of a generic skeleton of literature. Of particular interest are those eras when the novel becomes the dominant genre. All literature is then caught up in the process of becoming, and in a special kind of generic criticism. This occurred several times in the Hellenic period, again during the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance, but with special force and clarity beginning in the second half of the 18th century. In an era when the novel reigns supreme, almost all the remaining genres are to a greater or lesser extent novelized, drama, for example Ibsen, Hauptmann, the whole of naturalist drama, epic poetry, for example, Child Harold, and especially Byron's Don Juan, even lyric poetry, as an extreme example, Heine's lyrical verse. Those genres that stubbornly preserve their old canonic nature begin to appear stylized. In general any strict adherence to a genre begins to feel like a stylization, a stylization taken to the point of parody, despite the artistic intent of the author. In an environment where the novel is the dominant genre, the conventional languages of strictly canonical genres begin to sound in new ways, which are quite different from the ways they sounded in those eras when the novel was not included in high literature. Parodic stylizations of canonized genres and styles occupy an essential place in the novel. In the era of the novel's creative ascendancy and even more so in the periods of preparation preceding this era literature was flooded with parodies and travesties of all the high genres, parodies precisely of genres, and not of individual authors or schools, parodies that are the precursors, companions to the novel, in their own way studies for it. But it is characteristic that the novel does not permit any of these various individual manifestations of itself to stabilize. Throughout its entire history there is a consistent parodying or travestying of dominant or fashionable novels that attempt to become models for the genre, parodies on the chivalric romance of adventure, Dit Aventures, the first such parody, belongs to the 13th century, on the Baroque novel, the pastoral novel, Sarles L. E. Berger Extravagant, B. The Sentimental Novel, Fielding, and the second Grandison of Musas, and so forth. This ability of the novel to criticize itself is a remarkable feature of this ever-developing genre. What are the salient features of this novelization of other genres suggested by us above? They become more free and flexible, their language renews itself by incorporating extra-literary heteroglossia and the novelistic layers of literary language, they become dialogized, permeated with laughter, irony, humor, elements of self-parody and finally this is the most important thing the novel inserts into these other genres an indeterminacy, a certain semantic open-endedness, a living contact with unfinished, still evolving contemporary reality, the open-ended present. As we will see below, all these phenomena are explained by the transposition of other genres into this new and peculiar zone for structuring artistic models, a zone of contact with the present in all its open-endedness, a zone that was first appropriated by the novel. It is of course impossible to explain the phenomenon of novelization purely by reference to the direct and unmediated influence of the novel itself. Even where such influence can be precisely established and demonstrated, it is intimately interwoven with those direct changes in reality itself that also determine the novel and that condition its dominance in a given era. The novel is the only developing genre and therefore it reflects more deeply, more essentially, more sensitively, and rapidly, reality itself in the process of its unfolding. Only that which is itself developing can comprehend development as a process. The novel has become the leading hero in the drama of literary development in our time precisely because it best of all reflects the tendencies of a new world still in the making, it is, after all, 
the only genre born of this new world and in total affinity with it. In many respects the novel has anticipated, and continues to anticipate, the future development of literature as a whole. In the process of becoming the dominant genre, the novel sparks the renovation of all other genres, it infects them with its spirit of process and inconclusiveness. It draws them ineluctably into its orbit precisely because this orbit coincides with the basic direction of the development of literature as a whole. In this lies the exceptional importance of the novel, as an object of study for the theory as well as the history of literature. Unfortunately, historians of literature usually reduce the struggle between the novel and other already completed genres, all these aspects of novelization, to the actual real-life struggle among schools and trends. A novelized poem, for example, they call a romantic poem, which of course it is, and believe that in so doing they have exhausted the subject. They do not see beneath the superficial hustle and bustle of literary process the major and crucial fates of literature and language, whose great heroes turn out to be first and foremost genres, and whose trends and schools are but second or third rank protagonists. The utter inadequacy of literary theory is exposed when it is forced to deal with the novel. In the case of other genres literary theory works confidently and precisely, since there is a finished and already formed object, definite and clear. These genres preserve their rigidity and canonic quality in all classical eras of their development, variations from era to era, from trend to trend or school to school are peripheral and do not affect their ossified generic skeleton. Right up to the present day, in fact, theory dealing with these already completed genres can add almost nothing to Aristotle's formulations. Aristotle's poetics, although occasionally so deeply embedded as to be almost invisible, remains the stable foundation for the theory of genres. Everything works as long as there is no mention of the novel. But the existence of novelized genres already leads theory into a blind alley. Faced with the problem of the novel, genre theory must submit to a radical restructuring. Thanks to the meticulous work of scholars, a huge amount of historical material has accumulated and many questions concerning the evolution of various types of novels have been clarified but the problem of the novel genre as a whole has not yet found anything like a satisfactory principled resolution. The novel continues to be seen as one genre among many, attempts are made to distinguish it as an already completed genre from other already completed genres, to discover its internal canon that would function as a well-defined system of rigid generic factors. In the vast majority of cases, work on the novel is reduced to mere cataloging, a description of all variants on the novel albeit as comprehensive as possible. But the results of these descriptions never succeed in giving us as much as a hint of comprehensive formula for the novel as a genre. In addition, the experts have not managed to isolate a single definite, stable characteristic of the novel without adding a reservation, which immediately disqualifies it altogether as a generic characteristic. Some examples of such characteristics with reservations would be, the novel is a multi-layered genre, although there also exist magnificent single-layered novels, the novel is a precisely plotted and dynamic genre, although there also exist novels that push to its literary limits the art of pure description, the novel is a complicated genre, Although novels are mass-produced as pure and frivolous entertainment like no other genre, the novel is a love story, although the greatest examples of the European novel are utterly devoid of the love element, the novel is a prose genre, although there exist excellent novels in verse. One could of course mention a large number of additional generic characteristics for the novel similar to those given above, which are immediately annulled by some reservation innocently appended to them. Of considerably more interest and consequence are those normative definitions of the novel offered by novelists themselves, who produce a specific novel and then declare it the only correct, necessary, and authentic form of the novel. Such, for instance, is Rousseau's foreword to his La Nouvelle Heloise, Whelan's to his Agathon degree Wessels to his Tobias Nauts, in such a category belong the numerous declarations and statements of principle by the Romantics on Wilhelm Meister, Lucinda, and other texts. Such statements are not attempts to incorporate all the possible variants of the novel into a single eclectic definition, 
but are themselves part and parcel of the living evolution of the novel as a genre. Often they deeply and faithfully reflect the novel's struggle with other genres and with itself, with other dominant and fashionable variants of the novel, at a particular point in its development. They come closer to an understanding of the peculiar position of the novel in literature, a position that is not commensurate with that of other genres. Especially significant in this connection is a series of statements that accompanied the emergence of a new novel type in the 18th century. The series opens with Fielding's reflections on the novel and its hero in Tom Jones. It continues in We Lands Forward to Agathon, and the most essential link in the series is Blankenberg's Versuch Fiber den Roman. By the end of the series, we have, in fact, that theory of the novel later formulated by Hegel. In all these statements, each reflecting the novel in one of its critical stages, Tom Slash One's, Agathon, Wilhelm Meister, the following prerequisites for the novel are characteristic, are, the novel should not be poetic, as the word poetic is used in other genres of imaginative literature, 2, the hero of a novel should not be heroic in either the epic or the tragic sense of the word, he should combine in himself negative as well as positive features, low as well as lofty, ridiculous as well. As serious, 3, the hero should not be portrayed as an already completed and unchanging person but as one who is evolving and developing, a person who learns from life, 4, the novel should become for the contemporary world what the epic was for the ancient world, an idea that Blankenberg expressed very precisely, and that was later repeated by Hegel. All these positive prerequisites have their substantial and productive side taken together, they constitute a criticism, from the novel's point of view, of other genres and of the relationship these genres bear to reality, their stilted heroizing, their narrow and unlifelike poeticalness, their monotony and abstractness, the prepackaged and unchanging nature of their heroes. We have here, in fact, a rigorous critique of the literariness and poeticalness inherent in other genres and also in the predecessors of the contemporary novel, the heroic Baroque novel and the sentimental novels of Richardson. These statements are reinforced significantly by the practice of these novelists themselves. Here the novelist's texts as well as the theory connected with item ergs consciously and unambiguously as a genre that is both critical and self-critical, one fated to revise the fundamental concepts of literariness and poeticalness dominant at the time. On the one hand, the contrast of novel with epic, and the novel's opposition to the epic, is but one moment in the criticism of other literary genres, in particular, a criticism of epic heroization, but on the other hand, this contrast aims to elevate the significance of the novel, making of it the dominant genre in contemporary literature. The positive prerequisites mentioned above constitute one of the high points in the novel's coming to self-consciousness. They do not yet of course provide a theory of the novel. These statements are also not distinguished by any great philosophical depth. They do however illustrate the nature of the novel as a genre no less if perhaps no more than do other existing theories of the novel. I will attempt below to approach the novel precisely as a genre in the making, one in the vanguard of all modern literary development. I am not constructing here a functional definition of the novelistic canon in literary history, that is, a definition that would make of it a system of fixed generic characteristics. Rather, I am trying to grope my way toward the basic structural characteristics of this most fluid of genres, characteristics that might determine the direction of its peculiar capacity for change and of its influence and effect on the rest of literature. I find three basic characteristics that fundamentally distinguish the novel in principle from other genres, i, its stylistic three-dimensionality, which is linked with the multi-languaged consciousness realized in the novel, two, the radical change it affects in the temporal coordinates of the literary image, 3, the new zone opened by the novel for structuring literary images, namely, the zone of maximal contact with the present, with contemporary reality, in all its open-endedness. These three characteristics of the novel are all organically interrelated and have all been powerfully affected by a very specific rupture in the history of European civilization, its emergence from a socially isolated and culturally deaf semi-patriarchal society, and its entrance into international and interlingual contacts and relationships. 
a multitude of different languages, cultures, and times became available to Europe, and this became a decisive factor in its life and thought. In another work I have already investigated the first stylistic peculiarity of the novel, the one resulting from the active polyglossia of the new world, the new culture and its new creative literary consciousness. I will summarize here only the basic points. Polyglossia had always existed, it is more ancient than pure, canonic monoglossia, but it had not been a factor in literary creation, an artistically conscious choice between languages did not serve as the creative center of the literary and language process. Classical Greeks had a feeling both for languages and for the epochs of language, for the various Greek literary dialects, tragedy is a polyglot genre, but creative consciousness was realized in closed, pure languages, although in actual fact they were mixed. Polyglossia was appropriated and canonized among all the genres. The new cultural and creative consciousness lives in an actively polyglot world. The world becomes polyglot, once and for all and irreversibly. The period of national languages, coexisting but closed and deaf to each other, comes to an end. Languages throw light on each other, one language can, after all, see itself only in the light of another language. The naive and stubborn coexistence of languages within a given national language also comes to an end that is, there is no more peaceful coexistence between territorial dialects, social and professional dialects and jargons, literary language, generic languages within literary language, epochs in language and so forth. All this set into motion a process of active, mutual cause and effect and inter-illumination. Words and language began to have a different feel to them, objectively they ceased to be what they had once been. Under these conditions of external and internal inter-illumination, each given language even if its linguistic composition, phonetics, vocabulary, morphology, etc., were to remain absolutely unchanged is, as it were, reborn, becoming qualitatively a different thing for the consciousness that creates in it. In this actively polyglot world, completely new relationships are established between language and its object, that is, the real world, and this is fraught with enormous consequences for all the already completed genres that had been formed during eras of closed and deaf monoglossia. In contrast to other major genres, the novel emerged and matured precisely when intense activization of external and internal polyglossia was at the peak of its activity, this is its native element. The novel could therefore assume leadership in the process of developing and renewing literature in its linguistic and stylistic dimension. In the above-mentioned work I try to elucidate the profound stylistic originality of the novel, which is determined by its connection with polyglossia. Let us move on to the two other characteristics, both concerned with the thematic aspect of structure in the novel as a genre. These characteristics can be best brought out and clarified through a comparison of the novel with the epic. The epic as a genre in its own right may, for our purposes, be characterized by three constitutive features, i, a national epic past in Goethe's and Schiller's terminology the absolute past serves as the subject for the epic, Two, national tradition, not personal experience and the free thought that grows out of it, serves as the source for the epic, Three. An absolute epic distance separates the epic world from contemporary reality, that is, from the time in which the singer, the author and his audience, lives. We will deal in more detail with each of these constitutive features of the epic. The world of the epic is the national heroic past, it is a world of beginnings and peak times in the national history, a world of fathers and of founders of families, a world of firsts and bests. The important point here is not that the past constitutes the content of the epic. The formally constitutive feature of the epic as a genre is rather the transferal of a represented world into the past, and the degree to which this world participates in the past. The epic was never a poem about the present, about its own time, one that became a poem about the past only for those who came later. The epic, as the specific genre known to us today, has been from the beginning a poem about the past, and the authorial position imminent in the epic and constitutive for it, that is, the position of the one who utters the epic word, 
is the environment of a man speaking about a past that is to him inaccessible, the reverent point of view of a descendant. In its style, tone, and manner of expression, epic discourse is infinitely far removed from discourse of a contemporary about a contemporary address to contemporaries, own again, my good friend, was born on the banks of the Neva, where perhaps you were also born, or once shown, my reader. Both the singer and the listener, imminent in the epic as a genre, are located in the same time and on the same evaluative, hierarchical, plane, but the represented world of the hero stands on an utterly different and inaccessible time and value plane, separated by epic distance. The space between them is filled with national tradition. To portray an event on the same time and value plane as oneself and one's contemporaries, and an event that is therefore based on personal experience and thought, is to undertake a radical revolution, and to step out of the world of epic into the world of the novel. It is possible, of course, to conceive even my time as heroic, epic time, when it is seen as historically significant, one can distance it, look at it as if from afar, not from one's own vantage point but from some point in the future, one can relate to the past in a familiar way as if relating to my present. But in so doing we ignore the presentness of the present and the pastness of the past, we are removing ourselves from the zone of my time, from the zone of familiar contact with me. We speak of the epic as a genre that has come down to us already well defined and real. We come upon it when it is already completely finished, a congealed and half moribund genre. Its completedness, its consistency, and its absolute lack of artistic naivete bespeak its old age as a genre and its lengthy past. We can only conjecture about this past, and we must admit that so far our conjectures have been rather poor. Those hypothetical primordial songs that preceded both the epic and the creation of a generic epic tradition, songs about contemporaries that directly echoed events that had just occurred such songs we do not know, although we must presume they existed. We can only guess at the nature of those original Edenic songs, or of the Kentileness. And we have no reason to assume that they are any more closely related to the later and better known epic songs than to our topical feuilletons or popular ditties. Those heroicized epic songs about contemporaries that are available to us and that we do know existed arose only after the epic was already an established form, and arose on the basis of an already ancient and powerful epic tradition. These songs transfer to contemporary events and contemporaries the ready-made epic form, that is, they transfer to these events the time and value contour of the past, thus attaching them to the world of fathers, of beginnings, and peak times canonizing these events, as it were, while they are still current. In a patriarchal social structure the ruling class does, in a certain sense, belong to the world of fathers and is thus separated from other classes by a distance that is almost epic. The epic incorporation of the contemporary hero into a world of ancestors and founders is a specific phenomenon that developed out of an epic tradition long since completed, and that therefore is as little able to explain the origin of the epic as is, say, the neoclassical ode. Whatever its origins, the epic as it has come down to us is an absolutely completed and finished generic form, whose constitutive feature is the transferal of the world it describes to an absolute past of national beginnings and peak times. The absolute past is a specifically evaluating, hierarchical, category. In the epic worldview, beginning, first, founder, ancestor, that which occurred earlier and so forth are not merely temporal categories but valorized temporal categories, and valorized to an extreme degree. This is as true for relationships among people as for relations among all the other items and phenomena of the epic world. In the past, everything is good, all the really good things, i.e., the first things, occur only in this past. The epic absolute past is the single source and beginning of everything good for all later times as well. In ancient literature it is memory, and not knowledge, that serves as the source and power for the creative impulse. That is how it was, it is impossible to change it, the tradition of the past is sacred. There is as yet no consciousness of the possible relativity of any past. The novel, by contrast, is determined by experience, knowledge, and practice, the future. 
In the era of Hellenism a closer contact with the heroes of the Trojan epic cycle began to be felt, epic is already being transformed into novel. Epic material is transposed into novelistic material, into precisely that zone of contact that passes through the intermediate stages of familiarization and laughter. When the novel becomes the dominant genre, epistemology becomes the dominant discipline. The epic past is called the absolute past for good reason, it is both monochronic and valorized, hierarchical, it lacks any relativity, that is, any gradual, purely temporal progressions that might connect it with the present. It is walled off absolutely from all subsequent times, and above all from those times in which the singer and his listeners are located. This boundary, consequently, is imminent in the form of the epic itself and is felt and heard in its every word. To destroy this boundary is to destroy the form of the epic as a genre. But precisely because it is walled off from all subsequent times, the epic past is absolute and complete. It is as closed as a circle, inside it everything is finished, already over. There is no place in the epic world for any open-endedness, indecision, indeterminacy. There are no loopholes in it through which we glimpse the future, it suffices unto itself, neither supposing any continuation nor requiring it. Temporal and valorized definitions are here fused into a single inseparable whole, as they are also fused in the semantic layers of ancient languages. Everything incorporated into this past was simultaneously incorporated into a condition of authentic essence and significance, but therefore also took on conclusiveness and finality, depriving itself, so to speak, of all rights and potential for a real continuation. Absolute conclusiveness and closedness is the outstanding feature of the temporally valorized epic past. Let us move on to tradition. The epic past, walled off from all subsequent times by an impenetrable boundary, is preserved and revealed only in the form of national tradition. The epic relies entirely on this tradition. Important here is not the fact that tradition is the factual source for the epic what matters rather is that a reliance on tradition is imminent in the very form of the epic, just as the absolute past is imminent in it. Epic discourse is a discourse handed down by tradition. By its very nature the epic world of the absolute past is inaccessible to personal experience and does not permit an individual, personal point of view or evaluation. One cannot glimpse it, grope for it, touch it, one cannot look at it from just any point of view, it is impossible to experience it, analyze it, take it apart, penetrate into its core. It is given solely as tradition, sacred and sacrosanct, evaluated in the same way by all and demanding a pious attitude toward itself. Let us repeat, the important thing is not the factual sources of the epic, not the content of its historical events, nor the declarations of its authors the important thing is this formal constitutive characteristic of the epic as a genre, to be more precise, the formal substantive characteristic its reliance on impersonal and sacrosanct tradition, on a commonly held evaluation and point of view which excludes any possibility of another approach and which therefore displays a profound piety. Toward the subject described and toward the language used to describe it, the language of tradition. The absolute past as the subject for epic and sacrosanct tradition as its sole source also determine the nature of epic distance that is, the third constitutive characteristic of the epic as a genre. As we have already pointed out, the epic past is locked into itself and walled off from all subsequent times by an impenetrable boundary, isolated, and this is most important, from that eternal present of children and descendants in which the epic singer and his listeners are located, which figures in as an event in their lives and becomes the epic performance. On the other hand, tradition isolates the world of the epic from personal experience, from any new insights, from any personal initiative in understanding and interpreting, from new points of view and evaluations. The epic world is an utterly finished thing, not only as an authentic event of the distant past but also on its own terms and by its own standards, it is impossible to change, to rethink, to re-evaluate anything in it. It is completed, conclusive and immutable, as a fact, an idea, and a value. This defines absolute epic distance. One can only accept the epic world with reverence, 
it is impossible to really touch it, for it is beyond the realm of human activity, the realm in which everything humans touch is altered and rethought. This distance exists not only in the epic material, that is, in the events and the heroes described, but also in the point of view and evaluation one assumes toward them, point of view and evaluation are fused with the subject into one inseparable whole. Epic language is not separable from its subject, for an absolute fusion of subject matter and spatial temporal aspects with valorized, hierarchical, ones is characteristic of semantics in the epic. This absolute fusion and the consequent unfreedom of the subject was first overcome only with the arrival on the scene of an active polyglossia and interillumination of languages, and then the epic became a semi-conventional, semi-moribund genre. Thanks to this epic distance, which excludes any possibility of activity and change, the epic world achieves a radical degree of completedness not only in its content but in its meaning and its values as well. The epic world is constructed in the zone of an absolute distanced image, beyond the sphere of possible contact with the developing, incomplete and therefore rethinking and re-evaluating present. The three characteristics of the epic posited by us above are, to a greater or lesser extent, also fundamental to the other high genres of classical antiquity and the Middle Ages. At the heart of all these already completed high genres lie the same evaluation of time, the same role for tradition, and a similar hierarchical distance. Contemporary reality as such does not figure in as an available object of representation in any of these high genres. Contemporary reality may enter into the high genres only in its hierarchically highest levels, already distanced in its relationship to reality itself. But the events, victors, and heroes of high contemporary reality are, as it were, appropriated by the past as they enter into these high genres, for example, Pinder's Odes, or the works of Simonides, they are woven by various intermediate links and connective tissue into the unified fabric of the heroic past and tradition. These events and heroes receive their value and grandeur precisely through this association with the past, the source of all authentic reality and value. They withdraw themselves, so to speak, from the present day with all its inconclusiveness, its indecision, its openness, its potential for rethinking and re-evaluating. They are raised to the valorized plane of the past, and assume they're a finished quality. We must not forget that absolute past is not to be confused with time in our exact and limited sense of the word, it is rather a temporally valorized hierarchical category. It is impossible to achieve greatness in one's own time. Greatness always makes itself known only to descendants, for whom such a quality is always located in the past, it turns into a distanced image, it has become an object of memory and not a living object that one can see and touch. In the genre of the memorial, the poet constructs his image in the future and distanced plane of his descendants, cf the inscriptions of oriental despots, and of Augustus. In the world of memory, a phenomenon exists in its own peculiar context, with its own special rules, subject to conditions quite different from those we meet in the world we see with our own eyes, the world of practice and familiar contact. The epic past is a special form for perceiving people and events in art. In general the act of artistic perception and representation is almost completely obscured by this form. Artistic representation here is representation subspecie eternitatis. One may, and in fact one must, memorialize with artistic language only that which is worthy of being remembered, that which should be preserved in the memory of descendants, an image is created for descendants, and this image is projected onto their sublime and distant horizon. Contemporaneity for its own sake, that is to say, a contemporaneity that makes no claim on future memory, is molded in clay, contemporaneity for the future, for descendants, is molded in marble or bronze. The interrelationship of times is important here. The valorized emphasis is not on the future and does not serve the future, no favors are being done it, such favors face an eternity outside time, what is served here is the future memory of a past, a broadening of the world of the absolute past, an enriching of it with new images, at the expense of contemporaneity, a world that is always opposed in principle to any merely transitory past. In the already completed high genres, 
tradition also retains its significance although under conditions of open and personal creativity, its role becomes more conventionalized than in the epic. In general, the world of high literature in the classical era was a world projected into the past, onto the distanced plane of memory, but not into a real, relative past tied to the present by uninterrupted temporal transitions, it was projected rather into a valorized past of beginnings and peak times. This past is distanced, finished, and closed like a circle. This does not mean, of course, that there is no movement within it. On the contrary, the relative temporal categories within it are richly and subtly worked out, nuances of earlier, later, sequences of moments, speeds, durations, etc., there is evidence of a high level of artistic technique in matters of time. But within this time, completed and locked into a circle, all points are equidistant from the real, dynamic time of the present, insofar as this time is whole, it is not localized in an actual historical sequence, it is not relative to the present or to the future, it contains within itself, as it were, the entire fullness of time. As a consequence all high genres of the classical era, that is, its entire high literature, are structured in the zone of the distanced image, a zone outside any possible contact with the present in all its open-endedness. As we have said, contemporaneity as such, that is, one that preserves its own living contemporary profile, cannot become an object of representation for the high genres. Contemporaneity was reality of a lower order in comparison with the epic past. Least of all could it serve as the starting point for artistic ideation or evaluation. The focus for such an idea of evaluation could only be found in the absolute past. The present is something transitory, it is flow, it is an eternal continuation without beginning or end, it is denied an authentic conclusiveness and consequently lacks an essence as well. The future as well is perceived either as an essentially indifferent continuation of the present, or as an end, a final destruction, a catastrophe. The temporally valorized categories of absolute beginning and absolute end are extremely significant in our sense of time and in the ideologies of past times. The beginning is idealized, the end is darkened, catastrophe, the twilight of the gods. This sense of time and the hierarchy of times described by us here permeate all the high genres of antiquity and the Middle Ages. They permeated so deeply into the basic foundation of these genres that they continue to live in them in subsequent eras up to the 19th century, and even further. This idealization of the past in high genres has something of an official air. All external expressions of the dominant force and truth, the expression of everything conclusive, were formulated in the valorized hierarchical category of the past, in a distanced and distant image, everything from gesture and clothing to literary style, for all are symbols of authority. The novel, however, is associated with the eternally living element of unofficial language and unofficial thought, holiday forms, familiar speech, profanation. The dead are loved in a different way. They are removed from the sphere of contact, one can, and indeed must speak of them in a different style. Language about the dead is stylistically quite distinct from language about the living. In the high genres all authority and privilege, all lofty significance and grandeur, abandon the zone of familiar contact for the distanced plane, clothing, etiquette, the style of a hero's speech and the style of speech about him. It is in this orientation toward completeness that the classicism of all non-novel genres is expressed. Contemporaneity, flowing and transitory, lo, present this life without beginning or end was a subject of representation only in the low genres. Most importantly, it was the basic subject matter in that broadest and richest of realms, the common people's creative culture of laughter. In the aforementioned work I try to indicate the enormous influence exercised by this realm in the ancient world as well as the Middle Ages on the birth and formation of novelistic language. It was equally significant for all other historical factors in the novelistic genre, during their emergence and early formation. Precisely here, in popular laughter, the authentic folkloric roots of the novel are to be sought. The present, contemporary life as such, I myself and my contemporaries, 
My time all these concepts were originally the objects of ambivalent laughter, at the same time cheerful and annihilating. It is precisely here that a fundamentally new attitude toward language and toward the word is generated. Alongside direct representation laughing at living reality there flourish parody and travesty of all high genres and of all lofty models embodied in national myth. The absolute past of gods, demigods and heroes is here, in parodies and even more so in travesties, contemporized, it is brought low, represented on a plane equal with contemporary life, in an everyday environment, in the low language of contemporaneity. In classical times this elemental popular laughter gave rise directly to a broad and varied field of ancient literature, one that the ancients themselves expressively labeled Sputagiloian, that is, the field of serio-comical. The weekly plotted mimes of Saffron H. All the bucolic poems, the fable, early memoir literature, the epidemia of Ion of Chios, the homily of Critias, pamphlets all belong to this field. Here the ancients themselves included the Socratic dialogues, as a genre, here belong Roman satire, Lucilius K. Horace, Perseus, Juvenal, the extensive literature of the Symposia and finally Menippine satire, as a genre, and dialogues of the Lucianic type. All these genres, permeated with the serio-comical, are authentic predecessors of the novel. In addition, several of these genres are thoroughly novelistic, containing in embryo and sometimes in developed form the basic elements characteristic of the most important later prototypes of the European novel. The authentic spirit of the novel as a developing genre is present in them to an incomparably greater degree than in the so-called Greek novels, the sole ancient genre bearing the name. The Greek novel Greek romance had a powerful influence on the European novel precisely in the Baroque era, that is, precisely at that time when novel theory was beginning to be reworked, Abbe Hude, T and when the very term novel was being tightened and made more precise. Out of all novelistic works of antiquity, the term novel was, therefore, attached to the Greek novel alone. Nevertheless, the serio-comical genres mentioned above anticipate the more essential historical aspects in the development of the novel in modern times, even though they lack that sturdy skeleton of plot and composition that we have grown accustomed to demand from the novel as a genre. This applies in particular to the Socratic dialogues, which may be called to rephrase Friedrich Schlegel dash the novels of their time, and also to Menippine satire, including the satiricon of Petronius, whose role in the history of the novel is immense and as yet inadequately appreciated by scholarship. These serio-comical genres were the first authentic and essential step in the evolution of the novel as the genre of becoming. Precisely what is this novelistic spirit in these serio-comical genres, and on what basis do we claim them as the first step in the development of the novel? It is this, contemporary reality serves as their subject, and even more important it is the starting point for understanding, evaluating and formulating such genres. For the first time, the subject of serious literary representation, although, it is true, at the same time comical, is portrayed without any distance, on the level of contemporary reality, in a zone of direct and even crude contact. Even where the past or myth serves as the subject of representation in these genres there is no epic distance, and contemporary reality provides the point of view. Of special significance in this process of demolishing distance is the comical origin of these genres, they derive from folklore, popular laughter. It is precisely laughter that destroys the epic, and in general destroys any hierarchical, distancing and valorized, distance. As a distanced image a subject cannot be comical, to be made comical, it must be brought close. Everything that makes us laugh is close at hand, all comical creativity works in a zone of maximal proximity. Laughter has the remarkable power of making an object come up close, of drawing it into a zone of crude contact where one can finger it familiarly on all sides, turn it upside down, inside out, peer at it from above and below, break open its external shell, look into its center, doubt it, take it apart, dismember it, lay it bare and expose it, examine it freely and experiment with it. Laughter demolishes fear and piety before an object, before a world, 
making of it an object of familiar contact and thus clearing the ground for an absolutely free investigation of it. Laughter is a vital factor in laying down that prerequisite for fearlessness without which it would be impossible to approach the world realistically. As it draws an object to itself and makes it familiar, laughter delivers the object into the fearless hands of investigative experiment both scientific and artistic and into the hands of free experimental fantasy. Familiarization of the world through laughter and popular speech is an extremely important and indispensable step in making possible free, scientifically knowable and artistically realistic creativity in European civilization. The plane of comic, humorous, representation is a specific plane in its spatial as well as its temporal aspect. Here the role of memory is minimal, in the comic world there is nothing for memory and tradition to do. One ridicules in order to forget. This is the zone of maximally familiar and crude contact, laughter means abuse, and abuse could lead to blows. Basically this is uncrowning, that is, the removal of an object from the distanced plane, the destruction of epic distance, an assault on and destruction of the distanced plane in general. In this plane, the plane of laughter, one can disrespectfully walk around whole objects, therefore, the back and rear portion of an object, and also its innards, not normally accessible for viewing, assume a special importance. The object is broken apart, laid bare, its hierarchical ornamentation is removed the naked object is ridiculous, its empty clothing, stripped and separated from its person, is also ridiculous. What takes place is a comical operation of dismemberment. One can play games with the comical that is, contemporize it, serving as the objects of the game we have the primordial artistic symbols of space and time above, below, in front of, behind, earlier, later, first, last, past, present, brief, momentary, long, and so forth. What reigns supreme here is the artistic logic of analysis, dismemberment, turning things into dead objects. We possess a remarkable document that reflects the simultaneous birth of scientific thinking and of a new artistic prose model for the novel. These are the Socratic dialogues. For our purposes, everything in this remarkable genre, which was born just as classical antiquity was drawing to a close, is significant. Characteristically it arises as apomemoniamata, that is, as a genre of the memoir type, as transcripts based on personal memories of real conversations among contemporaries, characteristic, also, is the fact that a speaking and conversing man is the central image of the genre. Characteristic, too, is the combination of the image of Socrates, the central hero of the genre, wearing the popular mask of a bewildered fool, almost a margit, degree with the image of a wise man of the most elevated sort, in the spirit of legends about seven wise men, this combination produces the ambivalent image of wise ignorance. Characteristic also is the ambivalent self-praise in the Socratic dialogue, I am wiser than everyone, because I know that I know nothing. In the image of Socrates one can detect a new type of prose heroization. Around this image, carnivalized legends spring up, for example, Socrates' relationship with Xantippe, the hero turns into a jester, compare the more recent carnivalization of legends surrounding Dante, Pushkin, etc. Characteristic, even canonic, for the genre is the spoken dialogue framed by a dialogized story. Characteristic also is the proximity of its language to popular spoken language, as near as was possible for classical Greece, these dialogues in fact open the path to Attic prose, and are connected with the essential renovation of the literary prose language and with a shift in languages in general. Characteristically this genre is at the same time a rather complex system of styles and dialects, which enter it as more or less parroted models of languages and styles, we have before us therefore a multi-style genre, as is the authentic novel. Moreover the figure of Socrates himself is characteristic for the genre he is an outstanding example of heroization in novelistic prose, so very different from epic heroization. It is, finally, profoundly characteristic and for us this is of utmost importance that we have laughter, Socratic irony, 
the entire system of Socratic degradations combined with a serious, lofty, and for the first time truly free investigation of the world, of man and of human thought. Socratic laughter, reduced to irony, and Socratic degradations, an entire system of metaphors and comparisons borrowed from the lower spheres of life from tradespeople, from everyday life, etc., bring the world closer and familiarize it in order to investigate it fearlessly and freely. As our starting point we have contemporary reality, the living people who occupy it together with their opinions. From this vantage point, from this contemporary reality with its diversity of speech and voice, there comes about a new orientation in the world and in time, including the absolute past of tradition, through personal experience and investigation. It is canonical for the genre that even an accidental and insignificant pretext can ordinarily and deliberately serve as the external and most immediate starting point for a dialogue, the todayness of the day was emphasized in all its randomness, accidental encounters, etc. In other serio-comical genres we will come upon other aspects, nuances, and consequences of this radical shift of the temporally valorized center of artistic orientation, and of the revolution in the hierarchy of times. A few words now about Menippine satire. Its folklore roots are identical with those of the Socratic dialogue, to which it is genetically related, it is usually considered a product of the disintegration of the Socratic dialogue. The familiarizing role of laughter is here considerably more powerful, sharper, and coarser. The liberty to crudely degrade, to turn inside out the lofty aspects of the world and world views, might sometimes seem shocking. But to this exclusive and comic familiarity must be added an intense spirit of inquiry and a utopian fantasy. Nothing is left of the distant epic image of the absolute past, the entire world and everything sacred in it is offered to us without any distancing at all, in a zone of crude contact, where we can grab at everything with our own hands. In this world, utterly familiarized, the subject moves with extreme and fantastic freedom, from heaven to earth, from earth to the nether world, from the present into the past, from the past into the future. In the comic afterlife visions of Menippine satire, the heroes of the absolute past, real-life figures from various eras of the historic past, for example, Alexander of Macedonia, and living contemporaries jostle one another in a most familiar way, to talk, even to brawl. This confrontation of times from the point of view of the present is extremely characteristic. In Menippine satire the unfettered and fantastic plots and situations all serve one goal to put to the test and to expose ideas and ideologues. These are experimental and provocative plots. The appearance of the utopian element in this genre is symptomatic, although it is, to be sure, timid and shallow. The inconclusive present begins to feel closer to the future than to the past, and begins to seek some valorized support in the future, even if this future is as yet pictured merely as a return to the golden age of Saturn. In Roman times, Menippine satire was closely associated with the Saturnalia and with the freedom of Saturnalian laughter. Menippine satire is dialogic, full of parodies and travesties, multi styled, and does not fear elements of bilingualism in Var Rok and especially in Boethius the Consolation of Philosophy. The Satyricon of Petronius is good proof that Menippine satire can expand into a huge picture, offering a realistic reflection of the socially varied and heteroglot world of contemporary life. For almost all the above-mentioned genres, the serio-comical is characterized by a deliberate and explicit autobiographical and memoirist approach. The shift of the temporal center of artistic orientation, which placed on the same temporally valorized plane the author and his readers, on the one hand, and the world and heroes described by him, on the other, making them contemporaries, possible acquaintances, friends, familiarizing their relations, we again recall the novelistic opening of Own Again, permits the author, in all his various masks and faces, to move freely onto the field of his represented world a field that in the epic had been absolutely inaccessible and closed. The field available for representing the world changes from genre to genre and from era to era as literature develops. It is organized in different ways and limited in space and time by different means. 
but this field is always specific. The novel comes into contact with the spontaneity of the inconclusive present, this is what keeps the genre from congealing. The novelist is drawn toward everything that is not yet completed. He may turn up on the field of representation in any authorial pose, he may depict real moments in his own life or make allusions to them, he may interfere in the conversations of his heroes, he may openly polemicize with his literary enemies and so forth. This is not merely a matter of the author's image appearing within his own field of representation important here is the fact that the underlying, original formal author, the author of the authorial image, appears in a new relationship with the represented world. Both find themselves now subject to the same temporally valorized measurements, for the depicting authorial language now lies on the same plane as the depicted language of the hero, and may enter into dialogic relations and hybrid combinations with it, indeed, it cannot help but enter into such relations. It is precisely this new situation, that of the original formally present author in a zone of contact with the world he is depicting, that makes possible at all the appearance of the authorial image on the field of representation. This new positioning of the author must be considered one of the most important results of surmounting epic, hierarchical, distance. The enormous formal, compositional, and stylistic implications this new positioning of the author has for the specific evolution of the novel as a genre require no further explanation. Let us consider in this connection Gogol's Dead Souls. The form of his epic Gogol modeled on the Divine Comedy, it was in this form that he imagined the greatness of his work lay. But what in fact emerged was Menapin's satire. Once having entered the zone of familiar contact he was unable to leave it, and he was unable to transfer into the sphere distanced and positive images. The distanced images of the epic and the images of familiar contact can never meet on the same field of representation, Pathos broke into the world of Menapin satire like a foreign body, affirmative pathos became abstract and simply fell out of the work. Gogol could not manage the move from hell to purgatory and then to paradise with the same people and in the same work, no continuous transition was possible. The tragedy of Gogol is to a very real extent the tragedy of a genre, taking genre not in its formalistic sense, but as a zone and a field of valorized perception, as a mode for representing the world. Gogol lost Russia, that is, he lost his blueprint for perceiving and representing her, he got muddled somewhere between memory and familiar contact to put it bluntly, he could not find the proper focus on his binoculars. But as a new starting point for artistic orientation, contemporaneity by no means excludes the depiction of a heroic past, and without any travesty. As an example we have Xenophon's Syrapedia, not, of course, a serio-comical work, but one that does lie on the borderline. Its subject is the past, its hero is Cyrus the Great. But the starting point of representation is Xenophon's own contemporary reality, it is that which provides the point of view and value orientation. It is characteristic that the heroic past chosen here is not the national past but a foreign and barbaric past. The world has already opened up, one's own monolithic and closed world, the world of the epic, has been replaced by the great world of one's own plus the others. This choice of an alien heroism was the result of a heightened interest, characteristic for Xenophon's time, in the Orient and Eastern culture, ideology, and socio-political forms. A light was expected from the East. Cultural interanimation, interaction of ideologies and languages had already begun. Also characteristic was the idealization of the Oriental despot, and here one senses Xenophon's own contemporary reality with its idea, shared widely by his contemporaries, of renovating Greek political forms in a spirit close to Oriental autocracy. Such an idealization of Oriental autocracy is of course deeply alien to the entire spirit of Hellenic national tradition. Characteristic and even extremely typical for the time was the concept of an individual's upbringing, this was to become one of the most important and productive themes for the new European novel. Also characteristic is the intentional and completely explicit transfer onto the image of Cyrus the Great of the features of Cyrus the Younger, a contemporary of Xenophon in whose campaign Xenophon participated. And one also senses here the personality of another contemporary and close friend of Xenophon, Socrates, 
thus are elements of the memoir introduced into the work. As a final characteristic we might mention the form of the work itself dialogues framed by a story. In such a way, contemporary reality and its concerns become the starting point and center of an artistic ideological thinking and evaluating of the past. This past is given us without distancing, on the level of contemporary reality, although not, it is true, in its low but in its high forms, on the level of its most advanced concerns. Let us comment upon the somewhat utopian overtones in this work that reflect a slight, and uncertain, shift of its contemporaneity from the past toward the future. Serapidia is a novel, in the most basic sense of the word. The depiction of a past in the novel in no sense presumes the modernization of this past, in Xenophon there are, of course, traces of such modernization. On the contrary, only in the novel have we the possibility of an authentically objective portrayal of the past as the past. Contemporary reality with its new experiences is retained as a way of seeing, it has the depth, sharpness, breadth, and vividness peculiar to that way of seeing, but should not in any way penetrate into the already portrayed content of the past, as a force modernizing and distorting the uniqueness of that past. After all, every great and serious contemporaneity requires an authentic profile of the past, an authentic other language from another time. The revolution in the hierarchy of times outlined above makes possible a radical revolution in the structuring of the artistic image as well. The present, in its so-called wholeness, although it is, of course, never whole, is in essence and in principle inconclusive, by its very nature it demands continuation, it moves into the future, and the more actively and consciously it moves into the future the more tangible and indispensable its inconclusiveness becomes. Therefore, when the present becomes the center of human orientation in time and in the world, time and world lose their completedness as a whole as well as in each of their parts. The temporal model of the world changes radically, it becomes a world where there is no first word, no ideal word, and the final word has not yet been spoken. For the first time in artistic ideological consciousness, time and the world become historical, they unfold, albeit at first still unclearly and confusedly, as becoming, as an uninterrupted movement into a real future, as a unified, all-embracing and unconcluded process. Every event, every phenomenon, everything, every object of artistic representation loses its completedness, its hopelessly finished quality and its immutability that had been so essential to it in the world of the epic absolute past, walled off by an unapproachable boundary from the continuing and unfinished present. Through contact with the present, an object is attracted to the incomplete process of a world in the making, and is stamped with the seal of inconclusiveness. No matter how distant this object is from us in time, it is connected to our incomplete, present-day, continuing temporal transitions, it develops a relationship with our unpreparedness, with our present. But meanwhile our present has been moving into an inconclusive future. And in this inconclusive context all the semantic stability of the object is lost, its sense and significance are renewed and grow as the context continues to unfold. This leads to radical changes in the structuring of the artistic image. The image acquires a specific actual existence. It acquires a relationship in one form or another, to one degree or another to the ongoing event of current life in which we, the author and readers, are intimately participating. This creates the radically new zone for structuring images in the novel, a zone of maximally close contact between the represented object and contemporary reality in all its inconclusiveness and consequently a similarly close contact between the object and the future. Prophecy is characteristic for the epic, prediction for the novel. Epic prophecy is realized wholly within the limits of the absolute past, if not in a given epoch, then within the limits of the tradition it encompasses, it does not touch the reader and his real time. The novel might wish to prophesize facts, to predict and influence the real future, the future of the author and his readers. But the novel has a new and quite specific problematicalness, characteristic for it is an eternal rethinking and re-evaluating. That center of activity that ponders and justifies the past is transferred to the future. This modernity of the novel is indestructible, 
and verges on an unjust evaluation of times. Let us recall the re-evaluation of the past that occurred during the Renaissance, the darkness of the Gothic Age, in the 18th century, Voltaire, and that is inherent in positivism, the exposure of myth, legend, heroization, a maximum departure from memory and a maximum reduction of the concept of knowledge, even to the point of empiricism, a mechanical faith in progress as the highest criterion. Let us now touch upon several artistic features related to the above. The absence of internal conclusiveness and exhaustiveness creates a sharp increase in demands for an external and formal completedness and exhaustiveness, especially in regard to plotline. The problems of a beginning, an end, and fullness of plot are posed anew. The epic is indifferent to formal beginnings and can remain incomplete, that is, where it concludes is almost arbitrary. The absolute past is closed and completed in the whole as well as in any of its parts. It is, therefore, possible to take any part and offer it as the whole. One cannot embrace, in a single epic, the entire world of the absolute past, although it is unified from a plot standpoint, to do so would mean a retelling of the whole of national tradition, and it is sufficiently difficult to embrace even a significant portion of it. But this is no great loss, because the structure of the whole is repeated in each part, and each part is complete and circular like the whole. One may begin the story at almost any moment, and finish at almost any moment. The Iliad is a random excerpt from the Trojan cycle. Its ending, the burial of Hector, could not possibly be the ending from a novelistic point of view. But epic completedness suffers not the slightest as a result. The specific impulse to end how does the war end? Who wins? What will happen to Achilles? And so forth is absolutely excluded from the epic by both internal and external motifs, the plotline of the tradition was already known to everyone. This specific impulse to continue, what will happen next, and the impulse to end, how will it end, are characteristic only for the novel and are possible only in a zone where there is proximity and contact, in a zone of distanced images they are impossible. In distanced images we have the whole event, and plot interest, that is, the condition of not knowing, is impossible. The novel, however, speculates in what is unknown. The novel devises various forms and methods for employing the surplus knowledge that the author has, that which the hero does not know or does not see. It is possible to utilize this authorial surplus in an external way, manipulating the narrative, or it can be used to complete the image of an individual, an externalization that is peculiarly novelistic. But there is another possibility in this surplus that creates further problems. The distinctive features of the novelistic zone emerge in various ways in various novels. A novel need not raise any problematic questions at all. Take, for example, the adventuristic boulevard romance. There is no philosophy in it, no social or political problems, no psychology. Consequently none of these spheres provides any contact with the inconclusive events of our own contemporary reality. The absence of distance and of a zone of contact are utilized here in a different way, in place of our tedious lives we are offered a surrogate, true, but it is the surrogate of a fascinating and brilliant life. We can experience these adventures, identify with these heroes, such novels almost become a substitute for our own lives. Nothing of the sort is possible in the epic and other distanced genres. And here we encounter the specific danger inherent in the novelistic zone of contact, we ourselves may actually enter the novel, whereas we could never enter an epic or other distanced genre. It follows that we might substitute for our own life an obsessive reading of novels, or dreams based on novelistic models, the hero of Dostoevsky's White Knights, Bovaryism becomes possible, the real-life appearance of fashionable heroes taken from novels disillusioned, demonic, and so forth. Other genres are capable of generating such phenomena only after having been novelized, that is, after having been transposed to the novelistic zone of contact, for example, the verse narratives of Byron. Yet another phenomenon in the history of the novel and one of extreme importance is connected with this new temporal orientation and with this zone of contact, 
it is the novel's special relationship with extra-literary genres, with the genres of everyday life and with ideological genres. In its earliest stages, the novel and its preparatory genres had relied upon various extra-literary forms of personal and social reality, and especially those of rhetoric, there is a theory that actually traces the novel back to rhetoric. And in later stages of its development the novel makes wide and substantial use of letters, diaries, confessions, the forms and methods of rhetoric associated with recently established courts and so forth. Since it is constructed in a zone of contact with the incomplete events of a particular present, the novel often crosses the boundary of what we strictly call fictional literature making use first of a moral confession, then of a philosophical tract, then of manifestos that are openly political, then degenerating into the raw spirituality of a confession, a cry of the soul that has not yet found its formal contours. These phenomena are precisely what characterize the novel as a developing genre. After all, the boundaries between fiction and non-fiction, between literature and non-literature and so forth are not laid up in heaven. Every specific situation is historical. And the growth of literature is not merely development and change within the fixed boundaries of any given definition, the boundaries themselves are constantly changing. The shift of boundaries between various strata, including literature, in a culture is an extremely slow and complex process. Isolated border violations of any given specific definition, such as those mentioned above, are only symptomatic of this larger process, which occurs at a great depth. These symptoms of change appear considerably more often in the novel than they do elsewhere, as the novel is a developing genre, they are sharper and more significant because the novel is in the vanguard of change. The novel may thus serve as a document for gauging the lofty and still distant destinies of literature's future unfolding. But the changes that take place in temporal orientation, and in the zone where images are constructed, appear nowhere more profoundly and inevitably than in the process of restructuring the image of the individual in literature. Within the bounds of the present article, however, I can touch on this great and complex question only briefly and superficially. The individual in the high-distanced genres is an individual of the absolute past and of the distanced image. As such he is a fully finished and completed being. This has been accomplished on a lofty heroic level, but what is complete is also something hopelessly ready-made, he is all there, from beginning to end he coincides with himself, he is absolutely equal to himself. He is, furthermore, completely externalized. There is not the slightest gap between his authentic essence and its external manifestation. All his potential, all his possibilities are realized utterly in his external social position, in the whole of his fate and even in his external appearance, outside of this predetermined fate and predetermined position there is nothing. He has already become everything that he could become, and he could become only that which he has already become. He is entirely externalized in the most elementary, almost literal sense, everything in him is exposed and loudly expressed, his internal world and all his external characteristics, his appearance and his actions all lie on a single plane. His view of himself coincides completely with others' views of him the view of his society, his community, the epic singer and the audience also coincide. In this context, mention should be made of the problem of self-praise that comes up in Plutarch and others. I myself, in an environment that is distanced, exists not in itself or for itself but for the self's descendants, for the memory such a self anticipates in its descendants. I acknowledge myself, an image that is my own, but on this distanced plane of memory such a consciousness of self is alienated from me. I see myself through the eyes of another. This coincidence of forms the view I have of myself as self, and the view I have of myself as other bears an integral, and therefore naive, character there is no gap between the two. We have as yet no confession, no exposing of self. The one doing the depicting coincides with the one being depicted. He sees and knows in himself only the things that others see and know in him. Everything that another person the author is able to say about him he can say about himself, and vice versa. There is nothing to seek for in him, nothing to guess at, he can neither be exposed nor provoked, he is all of a piece, 
he has no shell, there is no nucleus within. Furthermore, the epic hero lacks any ideological initiative, heroes and author alike lack it. The epic world knows only a single and unified worldview, obligatory and indubitably true for heroes as well as for authors and audiences. Neither worldview nor language can, therefore, function as factors for limiting and determining human images, or their individualization. In the epic, characters are bounded, preformed, individualized by their various situations and destinies, but not by varying truths. Not even the gods are separated from men by a special truth, they have the same language, they all share the same worldview, the same fate, the same extravagant externalization. These traits of the epic character, shared by and large with other highly distanced genres, are responsible for the exclusive beauty, wholeness, crystal clarity and artistic completedness of this image of man. But at the same time such traits account for his limitations and his obvious woodenness under conditions obtaining in a later period of human existence. The destruction of epic distance and the transferal of the image of an individual from the distanced plane to the zone of contact with the inconclusive events of the present, and consequently of the future, result in a radical restructuring of the image of the individual in the novel and consequently in all literature. Folklore and popular comic sources for the novel played a huge role in this process. Its first and essential step was the comic familiarization of the image of man. Laughter destroyed epic distance, it began to investigate man freely and familiarly, to turn him inside out, expose the disparity between his surface and his center, between his potential and his reality. A dynamic authenticity was introduced into the image of man, dynamics of inconsistency and tension between various factors of this image, man ceased to coincide with himself, and consequently man ceased to be exhausted entirely by the plots that contain them. Of these inconsistencies and tensions laughter plays up, first of all, the comic sides, but not only the comic sides, in the serio-comical genres of antiquity, images of a new order emerge for example, the imposing, newly and more complexly integrated heroic image of Socrates. Characteristic here is the artistic structuring of an image out of durable popular masks masks that had great influence on the novelistic image of man during the most important stages of the novel's development, the serio-comical genres of antiquity, Rabelais, Cervantes. Outside his destiny, the epic and tragic hero is nothing, he is, therefore, a function of the plot fate assigns him, he cannot become the hero of another destiny or another plot. On the contrary, popular masks Macus, Pulcinello, Harlequin are able to assume any destiny and can figure into any situation, they often do so within the limits of a single play, but they cannot exhaust their possibilities by those situations alone, they always retain, in any situation and in any destiny, a happy surplus of their own, their own rudimentary but inexhaustible human face. Therefore these masks can function and speak independent of the plot, but, moreover, it is precisely in these excursions outside the plot proper in the Atalan Trices, in the Lazi of Italian comedy that they best of all reveal a face of their own. Neither an epic nor a tragic hero could ever step out in his own character during a pause in the plot or during an intermission, he has no face for it, no gesture, no language. In this is his strength and his limitation. The epic and tragic hero is the hero who, by his very nature, must perish. Popular masks, on the contrary, never perish, not a single plot in Adelan, Italian or Italianized French comedies provides for, or could ever provide for, the actual death of a Maccus, a Pulcinello, or a Harlequin. However, one frequently witnesses their fictive comic deaths, with subsequent resurrections. These are heroes of free improvisation and not heroes of tradition, heroes of a life process that is imperishable and forever renewing itself, forever contemporary these are not heroes of an absolute past. These masks and their structure, the non-coincidence with themselves, and with any given situation the surplus, the inexhaustibility of their self and the like, have had, we repeat, an enormous influence on the development of the novelistic image of man. This structure is preserved even in the novel, 
although in a more complex, deeply meaningful, and serious, or serio-comical, form. One of the basic internal themes of the novel is precisely the theme of the inadequacy of a hero's fate and situation to the hero himself. The individual is either greater than his fate, or less than his condition as a man. He cannot become once and for all a clerk, a landowner, a merchant, a fiancé, a jealous lover, a father, and so forth. If the hero of a novel actually becomes something of the sort that is, if he completely coincides with his situation and his fate, as do generic, everyday heroes, the majority of secondary characters in a novel, then the surplus of humanness is realized in the main protagonist. The way in which the surplus will actually be realized grows out of the author's orientation toward form and content, that is, the ways he sees and depicts individuals. It is precisely the zone of contact with an inconclusive present, and consequently with the future, that creates the necessity of this incongruity of a man with himself. There always remain in him unrealized potential and unrealized demands. The future exists, and this future ineluctably touches upon the individual, has its roots in him. An individual cannot be completely incarnated into the flesh of existing socio-historical categories. There is no mere form that would be able to incarnate once and forever all of his human possibilities and needs, no form in which he could exhaust himself down to the last word, like the tragic or epic hero, no form that he could fill to the very brim, and yet at the same time not splash over the brim. There always remains an unrealized surplus of humanness, there always remains a need for the future, and a place for this future must be found. All existing clothes are always too tight, and thus comical, on a man. But this surplus of unfleshed out humanness may be realized not only in the hero, but also in the author's point of view, as, for example, in Gogol. Reality as we have it in the novel is only one of many possible realities, it is not inevitable, not arbitrary, it bears within itself other possibilities. The epic wholeness of an individual disintegrates in a novel in other ways as well. A crucial tension develops between the external and the internal man, and as a result the subjectivity of the individual becomes an object of experimentation and representation and first of all on the humorous familiarizing plane. Coordination breaks down between the various aspects, man for himself alone and man in the eyes of others. This disintegration of the integrity that an individual had possessed in epic, and in tragedy, combines in the novel with the necessary preparatory steps toward a new, complex wholeness on a higher level of human development. Finally, in a novel the individual acquires the ideological and linguistic initiative necessary to change the nature of his own image, there is a new and higher type of individualization of the image. In the antique stage of novelistic development there appeared remarkable examples of such hero ideologues the image of Socrates, the image of a laughing Epicurus in the so-called Hippocratic novel, the deeply novelized image of Diogenes in the thoroughly dialogized literature of the cynics and in Menippine satire, where it closely approximates the image of the popular mask, and, finally, the image of Menippius in Lucian. As a rule, the hero of a novel is always more or less an ideologue. What all this suggests is a somewhat abstract and crude schematization for restructuring the image of an individual in the novel. We will summarize with some conclusions. The present, in its all open-endedness, taken as a starting point and center for artistic and ideological orientation, is an enormous revolution in the creative consciousness of man. In the European world this reorientation and destruction of the old hierarchy of temporalities received its crucial generic expression on the boundary between classic antiquity and Hellenism, and in the New World during the late Middle Ages and Renaissance. The fundamental constituents of the novel as a genre were formed in these eras, although some of the separate elements making up the novel were present much earlier, and the novel's roots must ultimately be sought in folklore. In these eras all other major genres had already long since come to completion, they were already old and almost ossified genres. They were all permeated from top to bottom with a more ancient hierarchization of temporalities. The novel, from the very beginning, developed as a genre that had at its core a new way of conceptualizing time. The absolute past, 
tradition, hierarchical distance played no role in the formation of the novel as a genre such spatio-temporal categories did play a role, though insignificant, in certain periods of the novel's development, when it was slightly influenced by the epic for example in the Baroque novel. The novel took shape precisely at the point when epic distance was disintegrating, when both the world and man were assuming a degree of comic familiarity, when the object of artistic representation was being degraded to the level of a contemporary reality that was inconclusive and fluid. From the very beginning the novel was structured not in the distanced image of the absolute past but in the zone of direct contact with inconclusive present-day reality. At its core lay personal experience and free creative imagination. Thus a new, sober artistic prose novelistic image and a new critical scientific perception came into being simultaneously. From the very beginning, then, the novel was made of different clay than the other already completed genres, it is a different breed, and with it and in it is born the future of all literature. Once it came into being, it could never be merely one genre among others, and it could not erect rules for interrelating with others in peaceful and harmonious coexistence. In the presence of the novel, all other genres somehow have a different resonance. A lengthy battle for the novelization of the other genres began, a battle to drag them into a zone of contact with reality. The course of this battle has been complex and tortuous. The novelization of literature does not imply attaching to already completed genres a generic canon that is alien to them, not theirs. The novel, after all, has no canon of its own. It is, by its very nature, not canonic. It is plasticity itself. It is a genre that is ever questing, ever examining itself and subjecting its established forms to review. Such, indeed, is the only possibility open to a genre that structures itself in a zone of direct contact with developing reality. Therefore, the novelization of other genres does not imply their subjection to an alien generic canon, on the contrary, novelization implies their liberation from all that serves as a break on their unique development, from all that would change them along with the novel into some sort of stylization of forms that have outlived themselves. I have developed my various positions in this essay in a somewhat abstract way. There have been few illustrations, and even these were taken only from an ancient period in the novel's development. My choice was determined by the fact that the significance of that period has been greatly underestimated. When people talk about the ancient period of the novel they have traditionally had in mind the Greek novel alone. The ancient period of the novel is enormously significant for a proper understanding of the genre. But in ancient times the novel could not really develop all its potential, this potential came to light only in the modern world. We indicated that in several works of antiquity, the inconclusive present begins to sense a greater proximity to the future than to the past. The absence of a temporal perspective in ancient society assured that this process of reorientation toward a real future could not complete itself, after all, there was no real concept of a future. Such a reorientation occurred for the first time during the Renaissance. In that era, the present, that is, a reality that was contemporaneous, for the first time began to sense itself not only as an incomplete continuation of the past, but as something like a new and heroic beginning. To reinterpret reality on the level of the contemporary present now meant not only to degrade, but to raise reality into a new and heroic sphere. It was in the Renaissance that the present first began to feel with great clarity and awareness an incomparably closer proximity and kinship to the future than to the past. The process of the novel's development has not yet come to an end. It is currently entering a new phase. For our era is characterized by an extraordinary complexity and a deepening in our perception of the world, there is an unusual growth in demands on human discernment, on mature objectivity and the critical faculty. These are features that will shape the further development of the novel as well. I. The stylistic study of the novel began only very recently. Classicism of the 17th and 18th centuries did not recognize the novel as an independent poetic genre and classified it with the mixed rhetorical genres. The first theoreticians of the novel Abbe Hude, essay, Traits are one origine de Romans, 1670, Wieland, 
in his celebrated preface to Agathon, 1766-1767, Blankenberg, Versetuber den Roman, 1774, published anonymously, and the Romantics, Friedrich Schlegel, Novelis, barely touched upon questions of style. In the second half of the 19th century there was an intensification of interest in the theory of the novel, as it had become the leading European genre too but scholarship was concentrated almost exclusively on questions of composition and thematics. Point three questions of stylistics were touched upon only in passing and then in a manner that was completely unsystematic. Beginning with the 192 OS, this situation changed rather abruptly, there appeared a large number of works dealing with the stylistics of individual novelists and of individual novels. These works are often rich in valuable observations. But the distinctive features of novelistic discourse, the stylistic specificum of the novel as a genre, remained as before unexplored. Moreover, the problem of this specificum itself, its full significance, has to this day not yet been posed. Five different stylistic approaches to novelistic discourse may be observed, i. The author's portions alone in the novel are analyzed, that is, only direct words of the author more or less correctly isolated an analysis constructed in terms of the usual, direct poetic methods of representation and expression, metaphors, comparisons, lexical register, etc., Two, instead of a stylistic analysis of the novel as an artistic whole, there is a neutral linguistic description of the novelist's language, 3, in a given novelist's language, elements characteristic of his particular literary tendency are isolated, be it romanticism, naturalism, impressionism, etc., 4, what is sought in the language of the novel is examined as an expression of the individual personality, that is, language is analyzed as the individual style of the given novelist, 5, the novel is viewed as a rhetorical genre, and its devices are analyzed from the point of view of their effectiveness as rhetoric. All these types of stylistic analysis to a greater or lesser degree are remote from those peculiarities that define the novel as a genre, and they are also remote from the specific conditions under which the word lives in the novel. They all take a novelist's language and style not as the language and style of a novel but merely as the expression of a specific individual artistic personality, or as the style of a particular literary school or finally as a phenomenon common to poetic language in general. The individual artistic personality of the author, the literary school, the general characteristics of poetic language or of the literary language of a particular era all serve to conceal from us the genre itself, with the specific demands it makes upon language and the specific possibilities it opens up for it. As a result, in the majority of these works on the novel, Relatively minor stylistic variations whether individual or characteristic of a particular school have the effect of completely covering up the major stylistic lines determined by the development of the novel as a unique genre. And all the while discourse in the novel has been living a life that is distinctly its own, a life that is impossible to understand from the point of view of stylistic categories formed on the basis of poetic genres in the narrow sense of that term. The differences between the novel, and certain forms close to it, and all other genres poetic genres in the narrow sense are so fundamental, so categorical, that all attempts to impose on the novel the concepts and norms of poetic imagery are doomed to fail. Although the novel does contain poetic imagery in the narrow sense, primarily in the author's direct discourse, it is of secondary importance for the novel. What is more, this direct imagery often acquires in the novel quite special functions that are not direct. Here, for example, is how Pushkin characterizes Lenskai's poetry, Evgeny Jonagin, 2RO, 1-4. A development of the final comparison follows. The poetic images, specifically the metaphoric comparisons, representing Lenskai's song do not here have any direct poetic significance at all. They cannot be understood as the direct poetic images of Pushkin himself, although formally, of course, the characterization is that of the author. Here Lenskai's song is characterizing itself, in its own language, in its own poetic manner. Pushkin's direct characterization of Lenskai's song which we find as well in the novel sounds completely different 16. 23, I. 
thus he wrote gloomily and languidly. In the four lines cited by us above it is Lenskai's song itself, his voice, his poetic style that sounds, but it is permeated with the parodic and ironic accents of the author, that is the reason why it need not be distinguished from authorial speech by compositional or grammatical means. What we have before us is in fact an image of Lenskai's song, but not an image in the narrow sense, it is rather a novelistic image, the image of another's Kweaje language, in the given instance the image of another's poetic style, sentimental and romantic. The poetic metaphors in these lines, as an infant's dream, as the moon and others, in no way function here as the primary means of representation, as they would function in a direct, serious song written by Lenskai himself, rather they themselves have here become the object of representation, or more precisely of a representation that is parroted and stylized. This novelistic image of another's style, with the direct metaphors that it incorporates, must be taken in into national quotation marks within the system of direct authorial speech, postulated by us here, that is, taken as if the image were parodic and ironic. Were we to discard into national quotation marks and take the use of metaphors here as the direct means by which the author represents himself, we would in so doing destroy the novelistic image, obras of another's style, that is, destroy precisely that image that Pushkin, as novelist, constructs here. Lenskai's represented poetic speech is very distant from the direct word of the author himself as we have postulated it, Lenskai's language functions merely as an object of representation, almost as a material thing, the author himself is almost completely outside Lenskai's language, it is only his parodic and ironic accents that penetrate this language of another. Another example from Onegin R46, 1-71. One might think that we had before us a direct poetic maxim of the author himself. But these ensuing lines, spoken by the posited author to own again, already give an objective coloration to this maxim. Although it is part of authorial speech, it is structured in a realm where own again's voice and own again's style hold sway. We once again have an example of the novelistic image of another's style. But it is structured somewhat differently. All the images in this excerpt become in turn the object of representation, they are represented as Onegin's style, Onegin's worldview. In this respect they are similar to the images in Lenskai's song. But unlike Lenskai's song these images, being the object of representation, at the same time represent themselves, or more precisely they express the thought of the author, since the author agrees with this maxim to a certain extent, while nevertheless seeing the limitations and insufficiency of the Onegin Byronic worldview and style. Thus the author, that is, the direct authorial word we are postulating, is considerably closer to Onegin's language than to the language of Lenskai, he is no longer merely outside it but in it as well, he not only represents this language but to a considerable extent he himself speaks in this language. The hero is located in a zone of potential conversation with the author, in a zone of dialogical contact. The author sees the limitations and insufficiency of the Wonegynsk language and worldview that was still fashionable in his, the author's, time, he sees its absurd, atomized and artificial face, a Muscovite in the cloak of a child herald, a lexicon full of fashionable words, is he not really a parody? At the same time however the author can express some of his most basic ideas and observations only with the help of this language, despite the fact that as a system it is a historical dead end. The image of another's language and outlook on the world Kuzo Jazik Morovizrini, simultaneously represented and representing, is extremely typical of the novel, the greatest novelistic images, for example, the figure of Don Quixote, belong precisely to this type. These descriptive and expressive means that are direct and poetic, in the narrow sense, retain their direct significance when they are incorporated into such a figure, but at the same time they are qualified and externalized, shown as something historically relative, delimited and incomplete in the novel they, so to speak, criticize themselves. They both illuminate the world and are themselves illuminated. Just as all there is to know about a man is not exhausted by his situation in life, so all there is to know about the world is not exhausted by a particular discourse about it, 
every available style is restricted, there are protocols that must be observed. The author represents Onegin's language, a period-bound language associated with a particular worldview, as an image that speaks, and that is therefore preconditioned, Agovoranich Govorjasaj. Therefore, the author is far from neutral in his relationship to this image, to a certain extent he even polemicizes with this language, argues with it, agrees with it, although with conditions, interrogates it, eavesdrops on it, but also ridicules it, parodically exaggerates it and so forth. In other words, the author is in a dialogical relationship with Onegin's language, the author is actually conversing with Onegin, and such a conversation is the fundamental constitutive element of all novelistic style as well as of the controlling image of Onegin's language. The author represents this language, carries on a conversation with it, and the conversation penetrates into the interior of this language image and dialogizes it from within. And all essentially novelistic images share this quality, they are internally dialogized images of the languages, styles, worldviews of another, all of which are inseparable from their concrete linguistic and stylistic embodiment. The reigning theories of poetic imagery are completely powerless to analyze these complex internally dialogized images of whole languages. Analyzing own again, it is possible to establish without much trouble that in addition to the images of Onegin's language and Lenskai's language there exists yet another complex language image, a highly profound one, associated with Tatiana. At the heart of this image is a distinctive internally dialogized combination of the language of a provincial Miss Dreamy, sentimental, Richardsonian with the folk language of fairy tales and stories from everyday life told to her by her nurse, together with peasant songs, fortune-telling and so forth. What is limited, almost comical, old-fashioned in Tatiana's language is combined with the boundless, serious and direct truth of the language of the folk. The author not only represents this language but is also in fact speaking in it. Considerable sections of the novel are presented in Tatiana's voice zone, this zone, as is the case with zones of all other characters, is not set off from authorial speech in any formally compositional or syntactical way, it is a zone demarcated purely in terms of style. In addition to the character zones, which take up a considerable portion of authorial speech in the novel, we also find in Onegin individual parodic stylizations of the languages associated with various literary schools and genres of the time, such as a parody on the neoclassical epic formulaic opening, parodic epitaphs, etc and the author's lyrical digressions themselves are by no means free of parodically stylized or parodically polemicizing elements, which to a certain degree enter into the zones of the characters as well. Thus, from a stylistic point of view, the lyrical digressions in the novel are categorically distinct from the direct lyrics of Pushkin. The former are not lyrics, they are the novelistic image of lyrics, and of the poet as lyricist. As a result, under careful analysis almost the entire novel breaks down into images of languages that are connected to one another and with the author via their own characteristic dialogical relationships. These languages are, in the main, the period-bound, generic, and common everyday varieties of the epoch's literary language, a language that is in itself ever-evolving and in process of renewal. All these languages, with all the direct expressive means at their disposal, themselves become the object of representation, are presented as images of whole languages, characteristically typical images, highly limited and sometimes almost comical. But at the same time these represented languages themselves do the work of representing to a significant degree. The author participates in the novel, he is omnipresent in it, with almost no direct language of his own. The language of the novel is a system of languages that mutually and ideologically interanimate each other. It is impossible to describe and analyze it as a single unitary language. We pause on one more example. Here are four excerpts from different sections of Onegin. I, thus a young, melodic good-for-nothing muses. I too, I, too. Our youthful Imladoi singer has gone to his untimely end. 1631, 10 to 111. 3. I sing of a young Mladaj friend, 
his checkered career in Fortune's Cruel Coil-17. 55, 6-71. 4. What if your pistol shot has shattered the temple of a dear young Malodoyi boy? 16-34, 1-2. We see here in two instances the church Slavonic form Mladaje and in two instances the Russian metathesized form Malodaj. Could it be said that both forms belong to a single authorial language and to a single authorial style, one or the other of them being chosen, say, for the meter? Any assertion of the sort would be, of course, barbaric. Certainly it is the author speaking in all four instances. But analysis shows us that these forms belong to different stylistic systems of the novel. The words Mlada Jepovec Youthful Singer, the second excerpt, lie in Lenskai's zone, are presented in his style, that is, in the somewhat archaicized style of sentimental romanticism. The words pet to sing in the sense of Pisat Stixi Ito write verses and Pavek singer and poet poet are used by Pushkin in Lenskai's zone or in other zones that are parroted and objectified, in his own language Pushkin himself says of Lenskai, thus he wrote. The scene of the duel and the lament for Lenskai, my friends, you mourn the poet. 1636, I, etc., are in large part constructed in Lenskai's zone, in his poetic style, but the realistic and sober-minded authorial voice is forever breaking in, the orchestration in this section of the novel is rather complex and highly interesting. The words I sing of a young friend, third excerpt, involve a parodic travesty on the formulaic opening of the neoclassical epic. The stylistically crude link-up of the archaic, High word Mladaje with the low word Prigetel acquaintance, friend is justified by the requirements of parody and travesty. The words Melodaj Pavsa young good for nothing and Melodaj Prigetel young friend are located on the plane of direct authorial language, consistent with the spirit of the familiar, conversational style characteristic of the literary language of the era. Different linguistic and stylistic forms may be said to belong to different systems of languages in the novel. If we were to abolish all the international quotation marks, all the divisions into voices and styles, all the various gaps between the represented languages and direct authorial discourse, then we would get a conglomeration of heterogeneous linguistic and stylistic forms lacking any real sense of style. It is impossible to lay out the languages of the novel on a single plane, to stretch them out along a single line. It is a system of intersecting planes. In Onegin, there is scarcely a word that appears as Pushkin's direct word, in the unconditional sense that would for instance be true of his lyrics or romantic poems. Therefore, there is no unitary language or style in the novel. But at the same time there does exist a center of language, a verbal ideological center, for the novel. The author, as creator of the novelistic whole, cannot be found at any one of the novel's language levels, he is to be found at the center of organization where all levels intersect. The different levels are to varying degrees distant from this authorial center. Belinsky called Pushkin's novel an encyclopedia of Russian life. But this is no inert encyclopedia that merely catalogues the things of everyday life. Here Russian life speaks in all its voices, in all the languages and styles of the era. Literary language is not represented in the novel as a unitary, completely finished off and indisputable language it is represented precisely as a living mix of varied and opposing voices Rasnora Sivast, developing and renewing itself. The language of the author strives to overcome the superficial literariness of moribund, outmoded styles and fashionable period-bound languages, it strives to renew itself by drawing on the fundamental elements of folk language, which does not mean however, exploiting the crudely obvious, vulgar contradictions between folk and other languages. Pushkin's novel is a self-critique of the literary language of the era, a product of this language's various strata, generic, everyday, currently fashionable, mutually illuminating one another. But this interillumination is not of course accomplished at the level of linguistic abstraction, Images of language are inseparable from images of various worldviews and from the living beings who are their agents people who think, talk, and act in a setting that is social and historically concrete. 
from a stylistic point of view we are faced with a complex system of languages of the era being appropriated into one unitary dialogical movement, while at the same time separate languages within this system are located at different distances from the unifying artistic and ideological center of the novel. The stylistic structure of Evgeny Jonagin is typical of all authentic novels. To a greater or lesser extent, every novel is a dialogized system made up of the images of languages, styles, and consciousnesses that are concrete and inseparable from language. Language in the novel not only represents, but itself serves as the object of representation. Novelistic discourse is always criticizing itself. In this consists the categorical distinction between the novel and all straightforward genres the epic poem, the lyric, and the drama, strictly conceived. All directly descriptive and expressive means at the disposal of these genres, as well as the genres themselves, become upon entering the novel an object of representation within it. Under conditions of the novel every direct word epic, lyric, strictly dramatic is to a greater or lesser degree made into an object, the word itself becomes a bounded agranicenage image, one that quite often appears ridiculous in this framed condition. The basic tasks for a stylistics in the novel are, therefore, the study of specific images of languages and styles, the organization of these images, their typology, for they are extremely diverse, the combination of images of languages within the novelistic whole, the transfers and switchings of languages and voices, their dialogical interrelationships. The stylistics of direct genres, of the direct poetic word, offer us almost no help in resolving these problems. We speak of a special novelistic discourse because it is only in the novel that discourse can reveal all its specific potential and achieve its true depth. But the novel is a comparatively recent genre. Indirect discourse, however, the representation of another's word, another's language in international quotation marks, was known in the most ancient times, we encounter it in the earliest stages of verbal culture. What is more, long before the appearance of the novel we find a rich world of diverse forms that transmit, mimic, and represent from various vantage points another's word, another's speech and language, including also the languages of the direct genres. These diverse forms prepared the ground for the novel long before its actual appearance. Novelistic discourse has a lengthy prehistory, going back centuries, even thousands of years. It was formed and matured in the genres of familiar speech found in conversational folk language, genres that are as yet little studied, and also in certain folkloric and low literary genres. During its germination and early development, the novelistic word reflected a primordial struggle between tribes, peoples, cultures, and languages it is still full of echoes of this ancient struggle. In essence this discourse always developed on the boundary line between cultures and languages. The prehistory of novelistic discourse is of great interest and not without its own special drama. In the prehistory of novelistic discourse one may observe many extremely heterogeneous factors at work. From our point of view, however, two of these factors prove to be of decisive importance, one of these is laughter, the other polyglossia from Nagahazisil. The most ancient forms for representing language were organized by laughter these were originally nothing more than the ridiculing of another's language and another's direct discourse. Polyglos SIA and the interanimation of languages associated with it elevated these forms to a new artistic and ideological level, which made possible the genre of the novel. These two factors in the prehistory of novelistic discourse are the subject of the present article. 2. One of the most ancient and widespread forms for representing the direct word of another is parody. What is distinctive about parody as a form? Take, for example, the parodic sonnets with which Don Quixote begins. Although they are impeccably structured as sonnets, we could never possibly assign them to the sonnet genre. In Don Quixote they appear as part of a novel but even the isolated parodic sonnet, outside the novel, could not be classified generically as a sonnet. In a parodied sonnet, the sonnet form is not a genre at all, that is, it is not the form of a whole but is rather the object of representation, the sonnet here is the hero of the parody. In a parody on the sonnet, we must first of all recognize a sonnet, recognize its form, 
its specific style, its manner of seeing, its manner of selecting from and evaluating the world the world view of the sonnet, as it were. A parody may represent and ridicule these distinctive features of the sonnet well or badly, profoundly, or superficially. But in any case, what results is not a sonnet, but rather the image of a sonnet. For the same reasons one could not under any circumstances assign to the genre of epic poem the parodic epic war between the mice and the frogs. This is an image of the Homeric style. It is precisely style that is the true hero of the work. We would have to say the same of Scarin's Virgil Travesti one could likewise not include the 15th century sermons joyo in the genre of the sermon, or parodic pater posters or Ave Marias in the genre of the prayer and so forth. All these parodies on genres and generic styles, languages, enter the great and diverse world of verbal forms that ridicule the straightforward, serious word in all its generic guises. This world is very rich, considerably richer than we are accustomed to believe. The nature and methods available for ridiculing something are highly varied, and not exhausted by parodying and travestying in a strict sense. These methods for making fun of the straightforward word have as yet received little scholarly attention. Our general conceptions of parody and travesty in literature were formed as a scholarly discipline solely by studying very late forms of literary parody, forms of the type represented by Scarin's Eneide Travestie or Platon's Verhangnis Valgable, that is, the impoverished, superficial and historically least significant forms. These impoverished and limited conceptions of the nature of the parodying and travestying word were then retroactively applied to the supremely rich and varied world of parody and travesty in previous ages. The importance of parodic travestying forms in world literature is enormous. Several examples follow that bear witness to their wealth and special significance. Let us first take up the ancient period. The literature of erudition of late antiquity Aulus Gellius, Plutarch, in his Emoralia, Macrobius and, in particular, Athenius provide sufficiently rich data for judging the scope and special character to the parodying and travestying literature of ancient times. The commentaries, citations, references and allusions made by these erudites add substantially to the fragmented and random material on the ancient world's literature of laughter that has survived. The works of such literary scholars as Dietrich, Reich, Cornford, and others have prepared us for more correct assessment of the role and significance of parodic travestying forms in the verbal culture of ancient times. It is our conviction that there never was a single strictly straightforward genre, no single type of direct discourse artistic, rhetorical, philosophical, religious, ordinary everyday that did not have its own parodying and travestying double, its own comic ironic contraparty. What is more, these parodic doubles and laughing reflections of the direct word were, in some cases, just as sanctioned by tradition and just as canonized as their elevated models. I will deal only very briefly with the problem of the so-called fourth drama, that is, the satyr play. In most instances this drama, which follows upon the tragic trilogy, developed the same narrative and mythological motifs as had the trilogy that preceded it. It was, therefore, a peculiar type of parodic travestying contraparty to the myth that had just received a tragic treatment on the stage, it showed the myth in a different aspect. These parodic travestying counter-presentations of lofty national myths were just as sanctioned and canonical as their straightforward tragic manifestations. All the tragedians Phry Nicus, Sophocles, Euripides were writers of satyr plays as well, and Aeschylus, the most serious and pious of them all, an initiate into the highest Eleusinian mysteries, was considered by the Greeks to be the greatest master of the satyr play. From fragments of Aeschylus' satyr play The Bone Gatherer's Degree we see that this drama gave a parodic, travestying picture of the events and heroes of the Trojan War, and particularly the episode involving Odysseus' quarrel with Achilles and Diomedes, where a stinking chamber pot is thrown at Odysseus' head. It should be added that the figure of comic Odysseus, a parodic travesty of his high epic and tragic image, was one of the most popular figures of satyr plays, of ancient Doric farce and pre-Aristophanic comedy, as well as of a whole series of minor comic epics, parodic speeches and disputes in which the comedy of ancient times was so rich especially in southern Italy and Sicily. 
Characteristic here is that special role that the motif of madness played in the figure of the comic Odysseus, Odysseus, as is well known, donned a clown's fool's cap, Pileus, and harnessed his horse and ox to a plow, pretending to be mad in order to avoid participation in the war. It was the motif of madness that switched the figure of Odysseus from the high and straightforward plane to the comic plane of parody and travesty. But the most popular figure of the satyr play and other forms of the parodic travestying word was the figure of the comic Hercules. Hercules, the powerful and simple servant to the cowardly, weak, and false king Eurystheus, Hercules, who had conquered death in battle and had descended into the nether world, Hercules the monstrous glutton, the playboy, the drunk, and scrapper, but especially Hercules the madman such were the motifs that lent a comic aspect to his image. In this comic aspect, heroism and strength are retained, but they are combined with laughter and with images from the material life of the body. The figure of the comic Hercules was extremely popular, not only in Greece but also in Rome, and later in Byzantium, where it became one of the central figures in the marionette theater. Until quite recently this figure lived on in the Turkish game of shadow puppets. The comic Hercules is one of the most profound folk images for a cheerful and simple heroism, and had an enormous influence on all of world literature. When taken together with such figures as the comic Odysseus and the comic Hercules, the fourth drama, which was an indispensable conclusion to the tragic trilogy, indicates that the literary consciousness of the Greeks did not view the parodic travestying reworkings of national myth as any particular profanation or blasphemy. It is characteristic that the Greeks were not at all embarrassed to attribute the authorship of the parodic work War Between the Mice and the Frogs to Homer himself. Homer is also credited with a comic work, a long poem, about the fool Marget. For any and every straightforward genre, any and every direct discourse epic, tragic, lyric, philosophical may and indeed must itself become the object of representation, the object of a parodic travestying mimicry. It is as if such mimicry rips the word away from its object, disunifies the two, shows that a given straightforward generic word epic or tragic is one-sided, bounded, incapable of exhausting the object, the process of parodying forces us to experience those sides of the object that are not otherwise included in a given genre or a given style. Parodic travestying literature introduces the permanent corrective of laughter, of a critique on the one-sided seriousness of the lofty direct word, the corrective of reality that is always richer, more fundamental, and most importantly too contradictory and heteroglot to be fit into a high and straightforward genre. The high genres are monotonic, while the fourth drama and genres akin to it retain the ancient binary tone of the word. Ancient parody was free of any nihilistic denial. It was not, after all, the heroes who were parodied, nor the Trojan War and its participants, what was parodied was only its epic heroization, not Hercules and his exploits but their tragic heroization. The genre itself, the style, the language are all put in cheerfully irreverent quotation marks, and they are perceived against a backdrop of a contradictory reality that cannot be confined within their narrow frames. The direct and serious word was revealed, in all its limitations and insufficiency, only after it had become the laughing image of that word but it was by no means discredited in the process. Thus it did not bother the Greeks to think that Homer himself wrote a parody of Homeric style. Evidence from Roman literature casts additional light on the problem of the fourth drama. In Rome its functions were filled by the Atalan literary farces. When, beginning with the period of Sulla, the Atalan farces were reworked for literature and fixed in texts, they were staged after the tragedy, during the Exodium degree thus the Atalan farces of Pomponius and Noviaci were performed after the tragedies of Axius the strictest correspondence was observed between the Atalan farces and the tragedies. The insistence upon a single source for both the serious and the comic material was more strict and sustained in Rome than had been the case in Greece. At a later date, the Atalan farces that had been performed during the tragic exodium were replaced by mimes, apparently they also travestied the material of the preceding tragedy. The attempt to accompany every tragic, or serious, treatment of material with a parallel comic, parodic travestying, 
treatment also found its reflection in the graphic arts of the Romans. In the so-called consular diptychs, comic scenes in grotesque masks were usually depicted on the left, while on the right were found tragic scenes. An analogous counterposing of scenes can also be observed in the mural paintings in Pompeii. Dieterich, who made use of the Pompeian paintings to unlock the secret of ancient comic forms, describes, for example, two frescoes arranged facing each other, on the one we see Andromeda being rescued by Perseus, on the opposite wall is a picture of a naked woman bathing in a pond with a serpent wrapped around her, peasants are trying to come to her aid with sticks and stones. This is an obvious parodic travesty of the first mythological scene. The plot of the myth is relocated in a specifically prosaic reality, Perseus himself is replaced by peasants with rude weapons, compare the knightly world of Don Quixote translated into Sancho's language. From a whole series of sources, and particularly from the 14th book of Athenaeus, we know of the existence of an enormous world of highly heterogeneous parodic travestying forms, we know, for instance, of the performances of Phalophores and Diglist's mimers who on the one hand travestied national and local myths and on the other mimicked the characteristically typical languages and speech mannerisms of foreign doctors, procurers, hetiri, peasants, slaves, and so forth. The parodic travestying literature of southern Italy was especially rich and varied. Comic parodic plays and riddles flourished there, as did parodies of the speeches of scholars and judges, and forms of parodic and agonic dialogues, one of whose variants became a structural component of Greek comedy. Here the word lived an utterly different life from that which it lived in the high, straightforward genres of Greece. It is worth remembering that the most primitive mime, that is, a wandering actor of the most banal sort, always had to possess, as a professional minimum, two skills, the ability to imitate the voices of birds and animals, and the ability to mimic the speech, facial expressions, and gesticulation of a slave, a peasant, a procurer, a scholastic pedant and a foreigner. To this very day this is still the stock in trade for the farcical actor impersonators at annual fairs. The culture of laughter was no less rich and diverse in the Roman world than it had been in the Greek. Especially characteristic for Rome was the stubborn vitality of ritualistic ridicule. Everyone is familiar with the soldier's sanctioned ritualistic ridicule of the commander returning in triumph, or the ritualistic laughter at Roman funerals and the license granted the laughter of the mime, there is no need to expand further on the Saturnalia. What is important for us here is not the ritual roots of this laughter, but rather the literature it produced, and the role played by Roman laughter in the ultimate destinies of discourse. Laughter proved to be just as profoundly productive and deathless a creation of Rome as Roman law. This laughter broke through the grim atmosphere of seriousness of the Middle Ages to fertilize the great creations of Renaissance literature, up to this day it continues to resonate in many aspects of European literature. The literary and artistic consciousness of the Romans could not imagine a serious form without its comic equivalent. The serious, straightforward form was perceived as only a fragment, only half of a whole, the fullness of the whole was achieved only upon adding the comic contraparty of this form. Everything serious had to have, and indeed did have, its comic double. As in the Saturn Alia the clown was the double of the ruler and the slave the double of the master, so such comic doubles were created in all forms of culture and literature. For this reason Roman literature, and especially the low literature of the folk, created an immense number of parodic travestying forms, they provided the matter for mimes, satires, epigrams, table talk, rhetorical genres, letters, various types of low comic folk art. It was oral tradition preeminently that transmitted many of these forms to the Middle Ages, transmitting as well the very style and logic of Roman parody, a logic that was bold and consistent. It was Rome that taught European culture how to laugh and ridicule. But of the rich heritage of laughter that was part of the written tradition of Rome only a minuscule quantity has survived, those upon whom the transmission of this heritage depended were Ajlasvi who elected the S.E. Rias word and rejected its comic reflections as a profanation, as happened, for example, with the numerous parodies on Virgil. Thus we see that alongside the great and significant models of straightforward genres and direct discourses, 
discourses with no conditions attached, there was created in ancient times a rich world of the most varied forms and variations of parodic travestying, indirect, conditional discourse. Of course our term parodic travestying discourse far from expresses the full richness of types, variants, and nuances of the laughing word. But the question arises, what unifies all these diverse forms of laughter, and what relationship do they bear to the novel? Some forms of parodic travestying literature issue directly from the form of the genres being parodied parodic poems, tragedies, Lucian's Tragopodograx Gout tragedy, for example, parodic judicial speeches and so forth. This is a parody and travesty in the narrow sense of the word. In other cases we find special forms of parody constituted as genre satire drama, improvised comedy, satire, plotless dialogue basi yozanich dialogue and others. As we have said above, parodied genres do not belong to the genres that they parody, that is, a parodic poem is not a poem at all. But the particular genres of the parodic travestying word of the sort we have enumerated here are unstable, compositionally still unshaped, lacking a firm or definite generic skeleton. It can be said, then, that in ancient times the parodic travestying word was, generically speaking, homeless. All these diverse parodic travestying forms constituted, as it were, a special extra generic or intergeneric world. But this world was unified, first of all, by a common purpose, to provide the corrective of laughter and criticism to all existing straightforward genres, languages, styles, voices, to force men to experience beneath these categories a different and contradictory reality that is otherwise not captured in them. Such laughter paved the way for the impiety of the novelistic form. In the second place, all these forms are unified by virtue of their shared subject, language itself, which everywhere serves as a means of direct expression, becomes in this new context the image of language, the image of the direct word. Consequently this extra-generic or intergeneric world is internally unified and even appears as its own kind of totality. Each separate element in it parodic dialogue, scenes from everyday life, bucolic humor, etc. is presented as if it were a fragment of some kind of unified whole. I imagine this whole to be something like an immense novel, multi-generic, multi-styled, mercilessly critical, soberly mocking, reflecting in all its fullness the heteroglossia and multiple voices of a given culture, people, and epoch. In this huge novel in this mirror of constantly evolving heteroglossia any direct word and especially that of the dominant discourse is reflected as something more or less bounded, typical and characteristic of a particular era, aging, dying, ripe for change and renewal. And in actual fact, out of this huge complex of parodically reflected words and voices the ground was being prepared in ancient times for the rise of the novel, a genre formed of many styles and many images. But the novel could not at that time gather unto itself and make use of all the material that language images had made available. I have in mind here the Greek romance, and Apuleos and Petronius. The ancient world was apparently not capable of going further than these. These parodic travestying forms prepared the ground for the novel in one very important, in fact decisive, respect. They liberated the object from the power of language in which it had become entangled as if in a net, they destroyed the homogenizing power of myth over language, they freed consciousness from the power of the direct word, destroyed the thick walls that had imprisoned consciousness within its own discourse, within its own language. A distance arose between language and reality that was to prove an indispensable condition for authentically realistic forms of discourse. Linguistic consciousness parodying the direct word, direct style, exploring its limits, its absurd sides, the face specific to an era constituted itself outside this direct word and outside all its graphic and expressive means of representation. A new mode developed for working creatively with language, the creating artist began to look at language from the outside, with another's eyes, from the point of view of a potentially different language and style. It is, after all, precisely in the light of another potential language or style that a given straightforward style is parroted, travestied, ridiculed. The creating consciousness stands, as it were, 
on the boundary line between languages and styles. This is, for the creating consciousness, a highly peculiar position to find itself in with regard to language. The Edile or Rhapsodic experienced himself in his own language, in his own discourse, in an utterly different way from the creator of war between the mice and the frogs, or the creators of margits. One who creates a direct word whether epic, tragic or lyric deals only with the subject whose praises he sings, or represents, or expresses, and he does so in his own language that is perceived as the sole and fully adequate tool for realizing the word's direct, objectivized meaning. This meaning and the objects and themes that compose it are inseparable from the straightforward language of the person who creates it, the objects and themes are born and grow to maturity in this language, and in the national myth and national tradition that permeate this language. The position and tendency of the parodic travestying consciousness is, however, completely different, it, too, is oriented toward the object but toward another's word as well a parroted word about the object that in the process becomes itself an image. Thus is created that distance between language and reality we mentioned earlier. Language is transformed from the absolute dogma it had been within the narrow framework of a sealed off and impermeable monoglossia into a working hypothesis for comprehending and expressing reality. But such a full and complete transformation can occur only under certain conditions, namely, under the condition of thoroughgoing polyglossia. Only polyglossia fully frees consciousness from the tyranny of its own language and its own myth of language. Parodic travestying forms flourish under these conditions, and only in this milieu are they capable of being elevated to completely new ideological heights. Roman literary consciousness was bilingual. The purely national Latin genres, conceived under monoglottic conditions, fell into decay and did not achieve the level of literary expression. From start to finish, the creative literary consciousness of the Romans functioned against the background of the Greek language and Greek forms. From its very first steps, the Latin literary word viewed itself in the light of the Greek word, through the eyes of the Greek word, it was from the very beginning a word with a sideways glance, a stylized word enclosing itself, as it were, in its own piously stylized quotation marks. Latin literary language in all its generic diversity was created in the light of Greek literary language. Its national distinctiveness and the specific verbal thought process inherent in it were realized in creative literary consciousness in a way that would have been absolutely impossible under conditions of monoglossia. After all, it is possible to objectivize one's own particular language, its internal form, the peculiarities of its worldview, its specific linguistic habitus, only in the light of another language belonging to someone else, which is almost as much one's own as one's native language. In his book on Plato, Wilamowitz Smolenderf writes, only knowledge of a language that possesses another mode of conceiving the world can lead to the appropriate knowledge of one's own language. I do not continue the quotation, for it primarily concerns the problem of understanding one's own language in purely cognitive linguistic terms, an understanding that is realized only in the light of a different language, one not one's own, but this situation is no less pervasive where the literary imagination is conceiving language in actual artistic practice. Moreover, in the process of literary creation, languages interanimate each other and objectify precisely that side of one's own, and of the others, language that pertains to its worldview, its inner form, the axiologically accentuated system inherent in it. For the creating literary consciousness, existing in a field illuminated by another's language, it is not the phonetic system of its own language that stands out, nor is it the distinctive features of its own morphology nor its own abstract lexicon what stands out is precisely that which makes language concrete and which makes its worldview ultimately untranslatable, that is, precisely the style of the language as a totality. For a creative, literary bilingual consciousness, and such was the consciousness of the literary Roman, language taken as a whole, that is, able to comprehend the language I call my own, Svajerod no JJ as well as the language that someone else calls his own, Svajay Kuzaj, was a concrete style, but not an abstract linguistic system. It was extremely characteristic for the literary Roman to perceive all of language, from top to bottom, 
as style a conception of language that is somewhat cold and exteriorizing. Speaking as well as writing, the Roman stylized, and not without a certain cold sense of alienation from his own language. For this reason the objective and expressive directness of the Latin literary word was always somewhat conventionalized, as indeed is every sort of stylization. An element of stylizing is inherent in all the major straightforward genres of Roman literature, it is even present in such a great Roman creation as the Aeneid. But we have to do here not only with the cultural bilingualism of literary Rome. Roman literature at the outset was characterized by trilingualism. Three souls lived in the breast of Aeneas. But three souls three language cultures lived in the breast of all the initiators of Roman literary discourse, all the translator stylizers who had come to Rome from Lower Italy, where the boundaries of three languages and cultures intersected with one another Greek, Oscan, and Roman. Lower Italy was the home of a specific kind of hybrid culture and hybrid literary forms. The rise of Roman literature is connected in a fundamental way with this trilingual cultural home, this literature was born in the interanimation of three languages one that was indigenously its own, and two that were other but that were experienced as indigenous. From the point of view of polyglossia, Rome was merely the concluding phase of Hellenism, a phase whose final gesture was to carry over into the barbarian world of Europe a radical polyglossia, and thus make possible the creation of a new type of medieval polyglossia. For all the barbarian peoples who came in contact with it, Hellenism provided a powerful and illuminating model of other languagedness. This model played a fateful role in national, straightforward forms of artistic discourse. It overwhelmed almost all of the tender shoots of national epic and lyric, born in an environment muffled by a dense monoglossia, it turned the direct word of barbarian peoples their epic and lyric word into a discourse that was somewhat conventional, somewhat stylized. And this greatly facilitated the development of all forms of parodic travestying discourse. On Hellenistic and Helleno-Roman soil there became possible a maximal distance between the speaker the creating artist, and his language, as well as a maximal distance between language itself and the world of themes and objects. Only under such conditions could Roman laughter have developed so powerfully. A complex polyglossia was, as we have seen, characteristic of Hellenism. But the Orient, which was itself always a place of many languages and many cultures, crisscrossed with the intersecting boundary lines of ancient cultures and languages, was anything but a naive monoglottic world, passive in its relationship to Greek culture. The Orient was itself bearer of an ancient and complex polyglossia. Scattered throughout the entire Hellenistic world were centers, cities, settlements where several cultures and languages directly cohabited, interweaving with one another in distinctive patterns. Such, for instance, was Samosata, Lucian's native city, which has played such an immense role in the history of the European novel. The original inhabitants of Samosata were Syrians who spoke Aramaic. The entire literary and educated upper classes of the urban population spoke and wrote in Greek. The official language of the administration and chancellery was Latin, all the administrators were Romans, and there was a Roman legion stationed in the city. A great thoroughfare passed through Samosata, strategically very important, along which flowed the languages of Mesopotamia, Persia, and even India. Lucian's cultural and linguistic consciousness was born and shaped at this point of intersection of cultures and languages. The cultural and linguistic environment of the African Apuleos and of the writers of Greek novels who were for the most part Hellenized barbarians is analogous to Lucian's. In his book on the history of the Greek novel, Erwin Rode analyzes the dissolution of the Greek national myth on Hellenistic soil, and the concomitant decline and diminution of the epic and drama forms forms that can be sustained only on the basis of a unitary national myth that perceives itself as a totality. Rode does not have much to say on the role of polyglossia. For him, the Greek novel was solely a product of the decay of the major straightforward genres. In part this is true, everything new is born out of the death of something old. But Rode was no dialectician. It was precisely what was new in all this that he failed to see. He did define, more or less correctly, 
the significance of a unitary and totalizing national myth for the creation of the major forms of Greek epic, lyric, and drama. But the disintegration of this national myth, which was so fatal for the straightforward monoglottic genres of Hellenism, proved productive for the birth and development of a new prosaic, novelistic discourse. The role of polyglossia in the slow death of the myth and the birth of novelistic matter of factness is extremely great. Where languages and cultures interanimated each other, language became something entirely different, its very nature changed, in place of a single, unitary sealed off Ptolemaic world of language, there appeared the open Galilean world of many languages, mutually animating each other. Unfortunately the Greek novel only weakly embodied this new discourse that resulted from polyglot consciousness. In essence this novel type resolved only the problem of plot, and even that only partially. What was created was a new and large multi-genre genre, one which included in itself various types of dialogues, lyrical songs, letters, speeches, descriptions of countries and cities, short stories, and so forth. It was an encyclopedia of genres. But this multi-generic novel was almost exclusively cast in a single style. Discourse was partially conventionalized, stylized. The stylizing attitude toward language, characteristic of all forms of polyglossia, found its paradigmatic expression in such novels. But semi-parodic, travestying, and ironic forms were present in them as well, there were probably many more such forms than literary scholars admit. The boundaries between semi-stylized and semi-parodic discourse were very unstable, after all, one need only emphasize ever so slightly the conventionality in stylized discourse for it to take on a light overtone of parody or irony, a sense that words have conditions attached to them, it is not, strictly speaking, I who speak, I, perhaps, would speak quite differently. But images of languages that are capable of reflecting in a polyglot manner speakers of the era are almost entirely absent in the Greek novel. In this respect certain varieties of Hellenistic and Roman satire are incomparably more novelistic than the Greek novel. At this point it becomes necessary to broaden the concept of polyglossia somewhat. We have been speaking so far of the interanimation of major national languages, Greek, Latin, each of which was in itself already fully formed and unitary, languages that had already passed through a lengthy phase of comparatively stable and peaceful monoglossia. But we saw that the Greeks, even in their classical period, had at their disposal a very rich world of parodic travestying forms. It is hardly likely that such a wealth of images of language would arise under conditions of a deaf, sealed off monoglossia. It must not be forgotten that monoglossia is always in essence relative. After all, one's own language is never a single language, in it there are always survivals of the past and a potential for other languagedness that is more or less sharply perceived by the working literary and language consciousness. Contemporary scholarship has accumulated a mass of facts that testify to the intense struggle that goes on between languages and within languages, a struggle that preceded the relatively stable condition of Greek as we know it. A significant number of Greek roots belong to the language of the people who had settled the territory before the Greeks. In the Greek literary language we encounter behind each separate genre the consolidation of a particular dialect. Behind these gross facts a complex trilaterms is concealed, a struggle between languages and dialects, between hybridizations, purifications, shifts, and renovations, the long and twisted path of struggle for the unity of a literary language and for the unity of its system of genres. This was followed by a lengthy period of relative stabilization. But the memory of these past linguistic disturbances was retained, not only as congealed traces in language but also in literary and stylistic figuration and preeminently in the parodying and travestying verbal forms. In the historical period of ancient Greek life a period that was, linguistically speaking, stable and monoglottic all plots, all subject and thematic material, the entire basic stock of images, expressions, and intonations, arose from within the very heart of the native language. Everything that entered from outside, and that was a great deal, was assimilated in a powerful and confident environment of closed-off monoglossia, one that viewed the polyglossia of the barbarian world with contempt. 
Out of the heart of this confident and uncontested monoglossia were born the major straightforward genres of the ancient Greeks their epic, lyric, and tragedy. These genres express the centralizing tendencies in language. But alongside these genres, especially among the folk, there flourished parodic and travestying forms that kept alive the memory of the ancient linguistic struggle and that were continually nourished by the ongoing process of linguistic stratification and differentiation. Closely connected with the problem of polyglossia and inseparable from it is the problem of heteroglossia within a language, that is, the problem of internal differentiation, the stratification characteristic of any national language. This problem is of primary importance for understanding the style and historical destinies of the modern European novel, that is, the novel since the 17th century. This latecomer reflects, in its stylistic structure, the struggle between two tendencies in the languages of European peoples, one a centralizing, unifying, tendency, the other a decentralizing tendency, that is, one that stratifies languages. The novel senses itself on the border between the completed, dominant literary language and the extra-literary languages that know heteroglossia, the novel either serves to further the centralizing tendencies of a new literary language in the process of taking shape, with its grammatical, stylistic, and ideological norms, or on the contrary the novel fights for the renovation of an antiquated literary language, in the interests of those strata of the national language that have remained, to a greater or lesser degree, outside the centralizing and unifying influence of the artistic and ideological norm established by the dominant literary language. The literary artistic consciousness of the modern novel, sensing itself on the border between two languages, one literary, the other extra-literary, each of which now knows heteroglossia, also senses itself on the border of time, it is extraordinarily sensitive to time in language, it senses time's shifts, the aging and renewing of language, the past and the future and all in language. Of course all these processes of shift and renewal of the national language that are reflected by the novel do not bear an abstract linguistic character in the novel, they are inseparable from social and ideological struggle, from processes of evolution and of the renewal of society and the folk. The speech diversity within language thus has primary importance for the novel. But this speech diversity achieves its full creative consciousness only under conditions of an active polyglossia. Two myths perish simultaneously, the myth of a language that presumes to be the only language, and the myth of a language that presumes to be completely unified. Therefore even the modern European novel, reflecting intralanguage heteroglossia as well as processes of aging and renewal of the literary language and its generic types, was prepared for by the polyglossia of the Middle Ages which was experienced by all European peoples and by that intense interanimation of languages that took place during the Renaissance, during that shifting away from an ideological language, Latin, and the move of European peoples toward the critical monoglossia. Characteristic of Modern Times 3. The laughing, parodic travestying literature of the Middle Ages was extremely rich. In the wealth and variety of its parodic forms, the Middle Ages was akin to Rome. It must in fact be said that in a whole series of ways the medieval literature of laughter appears to be the direct heir to Rome, and the Satinalian tradition in particular continued to live in altered form throughout the Middle Ages. The Rome of the Saturnalia, crowned with a fool's cap Piliotaroma, Marshall, B. successfully retained its force and its fascination, even during the very darkest days of the Middle Ages. But the original products of laughter among the European peoples, which grew out of local folklore, were also important. One of the more interesting stylistic problems during the Hellenistic period was the problem of quotation. The forms of direct, half-hidden, and completely hidden quoting were endlessly varied, as were the forms for framing quotations by a context, forms of international quotation marks, varying degrees of alienation or assimilation of another's quoted word. And here the problem frequently arises, is the author quoting with reverence or on the contrary with irony, with a smirk? Double entendre as regards the other's word was often deliberate. The relationship to another's word was equally complex and ambiguous in the Middle Ages. The role of the other's word was enormous at that time, 
there were quotations that were openly and reverently emphasized as such, or that were half hidden, completely hidden, half conscious, unconscious, correct, intentionally distorted, unintentionally distorted, deliberately reinterpreted and so forth. The boundary lines between someone else's speech and one's own speech were flexible, ambiguous, often deliberately distorted and confused. Certain types of texts were constructed like mosaics out of the texts of others. The so-called cento, a specific genre, was, for instance, composed exclusively out of others' verse lines and hemistics. One of the best authorities on medieval parody, Paul Lehman, states outright that the history of medieval literature and its Latin literature in particular is the history of the appropriation, reworking, and imitation of someone else's property, Ingeschicht der Aufnahme, Verarbeitung, and Nachkommen Fremden Gutes, 13 or as we would say, of another's language, another's style, another's word. The primary instance of appropriating another's discourse and language was the use made of the authoritative and sanctified word of the Bible, the Gospel, the Apostles, the Fathers and Doctors of the Church. This word continually infiltrates the context of medieval literature and the speech of educated men, clerics. But how does this infiltration occur, how does the receiving context relate to it, in what sort of international quotation marks is it enclosed? Here a whole spectrum of possible relationships toward this word comes to light, beginning at one pole with the pious and inert quotation that is isolated and set off like an icon, and ending at the other pole with the most ambiguous, disrespectful, parodic travestying use of a quotation. The transitions between various nuances on this spectrum are to such an extent flexible, vacillating and ambiguous that it is often difficult to decide whether we are confronting a reverent use of a sacred word or a more familiar, even parodic playing with it, if the latter, then it is often difficult to determine the degree of license permitted in that play. At the very dawning of the Middle Ages there appeared a whole series of remarkable parodic works. Among them is the well-known Cena Cipriani or Cyprian Feasts DD a fascinating Gothic symposium. But how was it constituted? The entire Bible, the entire Gospel was as it were cut up into little scraps, and these scraps were then arranged in such a way that a picture emerged of a grand feast at which all the personages of sacred history from Adam and Eve to Christ and his apostles eat, drink and make merry. In this work a correspondence of all details to sacred writ is strictly and precisely observed, but at the same time the entire sacred writ is transformed into carnival, or more correctly into Saturnalia. This is Pileata Biblia. But what purpose motivates the author of this work? What was his attitude toward Holy Writ? Scholars answer this question in various ways. All are agreed, of course, that some sort of play with the sacred word figures in here, but the degree of license enjoyed by this play and its larger sense are evaluated in different ways. There are those scholars who insist that the purpose of such play is innocent, that is, purely mnemonic, to teach through play. In order to help those believers, who had not long before been pagans, better remember the figures and events of sacred writ, the author of the feasts wove out of them the mnemonic pattern of a banquet. Other scholars see the feasts as straightforward blasphemous parody. We mention these scholarly opinions only as an example. They testify to the complexity and ambiguity of the medieval treatment of the sacred word as another's word. Cyprian feasts is not, of course, a mnemonic device. It is parody, and more precisely a parodic travesty. But one must not transfer contemporary concepts of parodic discourse onto medieval parody, as one also must not do with ancient parody. In modern times the functions of parody are narrow and unproductive. Parody has grown sickly, its place in modern literature is insignificant. We live, write, and speak today in a world of free and democratized language, the complex and multi-leveled hierarchy of discourses, forms, images, styles that used to permeate the entire system of official language and linguistic consciousness was swept away by the linguistic revolutions of the Renaissance. European literary languages French, German, English came into being while this hierarchy was in the process of being destroyed, and while the laughing, 
travestying genres of the late Middle Ages and Renaissance novellas, Mardi Gras, Sodiace, farces, and finally novels were in the process of shaping these languages. The language of French literary prose was created by Calvin and Rabelais but Calvin's language, the language of the middle classes, of shopkeepers and tradesmen, was an intentional and conscious lowering of, almost a travesty on, the sacred language of the Bible. The middle strata of national languages, while being transformed into the language of the higher ideological spheres and into the language of sacred writ, were perceived as a denigrating travesty of these higher spheres. For this reason these new languages provided only very modest space for parody, these languages hardly knew, and now do not know at all, sacred words, since they themselves were to a significant extent born out of a parody of the sacred word. However, in the Middle Ages the role of parody was extremely important, it paved the way for a new literary and linguistic consciousness, as well as for the great Renaissance novel. Cyprian Feasts is an ancient and excellent example of medieval paradia sacra, that is, sacred parody or to be more accurate, parody on sacred texts and rituals. Its roots go deep into ancient ritualistic parody, ritual degrading and the ridiculing of higher powers. But these roots are distant, the ancient ritualistic element in them has been reinterpreted, parody now fulfills the new and highly important functions of which we spoke above. We must first of all take into account the recognized and legalized freedom then enjoyed by parody. The Middle Ages, with varying degrees of qualification, respected the freedom of the fool's cap and allotted a rather broad license to laughter and the laughing word. This freedom was bounded primarily by feast days and school festivals. Medieval laughter is holiday laughter. The parodic travestying holiday of fools and holiday of the ass are well known, and were even celebrated in the churches themselves by the lower clergy. Highly characteristic of this tendency is Rasus Pascalis, or Paschal laughter. During the Paschal days laughter was traditionally permitted in church. The preacher permitted himself risque jokes and gay-hearted anecdotes from the church pulpit in order to encourage laughter in the congregation this was conceived as a cheerful rebirth after days of melancholy and fasting. No less productive was Christmas laughter, Rasus Natalis, as distinct from Rasus Pascalis it expressed itself not in stories but in songs. Serious church hymns were sung to the tunes of street ditties and were thus given a new twist. In addition a huge store of special Christmas carols existed in which reverent nativity themes were interwoven with folk motifs on the cheerful death of the old and the birth of the new. Parodic travestying ridicule of the old often became dominant in these songs, especially in France, where the Noel, or Christmas carol, became one of the most popular generic sources for the revolutionary street song, we recall Pushkin's Noel, with its parodic travestying use of the nativity theme. To holiday laughter, almost everything was permitted. Equally broad were the rights and liberties enjoyed by the school festivals, which played a large role in the cultural and literary life of the Middle Ages. Works created for these festivals were predominantly parodies and travesties. The medieval monastic pupil, and in later times the university student, ridiculed with a clear conscience during the festival everything that had been the subject of reverent studies during the course of the year everything from sacred writ to his school grammar. The Middle Ages produced a whole series of variants on the parodic travestying Latin grammar. Case inflection, verbal forms and all grammatical categories in general were reinterpreted either in an indecent, erotic context, in a context of eating and drunkenness or in a context ridiculing church and monastic principles of hierarchy and subordination. Heading this unique grammatical tradition is the 7th century work of Virgilius Maro Grammaticus. This is an extraordinarily learned work, stuffed with an incredible quantity of references, quotations from all possible authorities of the ancient world including some that had never existed, in a number of cases even the quotations themselves are parodic. Interwoven with serious and rather subtle grammatical analysis is a sharp parodic exaggeration of this very subtlety, and of the scrupulousness of scholarly analyses, there is a description, for example, of a scholarly discussion lasting two weeks on the question of the vocative case of ego, that is, the vocative case of I. Taken as a whole, 
Virgilius Grammaticus work is a magnificent and subtle parody of the formalistic grammatical thinking of late antiquity. It is grammatical Saturnalia, Grammatica Piliata. Characteristically, many medieval scholars apparently took this grammatical treatise completely seriously. And even contemporary scholars are far from unanimous in their evaluation of the character and degree of the parodic impulse in it. This is additional evidence, were it needed, for just how flexible the boundaries were between the straightforward and the parodically refracted word in medieval literature. Holiday and school festival laughter was fully legalized laughter. In those days it was permitted to turn the direct sacred word into a parodic travestying mask, it could be born again, as it were, out of the grave of authoritative and reverential seriousness. Under these conditions, the fact that Cyprian feasts could enjoy enormous popularity even in strict church circles becomes understandable. In the 9th century the severe abbot of Fulda, Raban Mor 99 put the work into verse, the feasts were read at the banquet tables of kings, and were performed during the paschal festivals by pupils of monastic schools. The great parodic literature of the Middle Ages was created in an atmosphere of holidays and festivals. There was no genre, no text, no prayer, no saying that did not receive its parodic equivalent. Parodic liturgies have come down to us liturgies of drunks and gamblers, liturgies about money. Numerous evangelical readings have also survived, readings that began with the traditional of illo tempore, that is, in former times. And that often included highly indiscreet stories. A great number of parodic prayers and hymns are intact as well. In his dissertation, Parodies de Themes Pyre Dans la Poesie Fran 9 Eyes du Moyen Age Helsinki, 19141, the Finnish scholar Eero Ilvonen published the texts of six parodies on the Pater Noster, two on the Credo and one on the Ave Maria, but he gives only the macaronic Latin French texts. One cannot begin to conceive of the huge number of parodic Latin and macaronic prayers and hymns in medieval manuscript codices. In his Paradia Sacra, F. Novity surveys but a small part of this literature. Point 14 The stylistic devices employed in this parodying, travestying, reinterpreting, and reaccentuating are extremely diverse. These devices have so far been very little studied, and such studies as there are have lacked the necessary stylistic depth. Alongside the specific Paradia Sacra, we find a diverse parodying and travestying of the sacred word in other comic genres and in literary works of the Middle Ages, for example in the comic beast epics. The sacred, authoritative, direct word in another's language that was the hero of this entire grand parodic literature, primarily Latin, but in part macaronic. This word, its style, and the way it means, became an object of representation, both word and style were transformed into a bounded and ridiculous image. The Latin Paradia Sacra is projected against the background of the vulgar national language, the accentuating system of this vulgar language penetrates to the very heart of the Latin text. In essence Latin parody is, therefore, a bilingual phenomenon, although there is only one language, this language is structured and perceived in the light of another language, and in some instances not only the accents but also the syntactical forms of the vulgar language are clearly sensed in the Latin parody. Latin parody is an intentional bilingual hybrid. We now come upon the problem of the intentional hybrid. Every type of parody or travesty, every word with conditions attached, with irony, enclosed in international quotation marks, every type of indirect word is in a broad sense an intentional hybrid but a hybrid compounded of two orders, one linguistic, a single language, and one stylistic. In actual fact, in parodic discourse two styles, two languages, both intralingual, come together and to a certain extent are crossed with each other, the language being parroted, for example, the language of the heroic poem, and the language that parodies, low prosaic language, familiar conversational language, the language of the realistic genres, normal language, healthy literary language as the author of the parody conceived it. This second parodying language, against whose background the parody is constructed and perceived, does not if it is a strict parody enter as such into the parody itself, but is invisibly present in it. 
it is the nature of every parody to transpose the values of the parodied style, to highlight certain elements while leaving others in the shade, parody is always biased in some direction, and this bias is dictated by the distinctive features of the parodying language, its accentual system, its structure we feel its presence in the parody and we can recognize that presence, just as we at other times recognize clearly the accentual system, syntactic construction, tempi and rhythm of a specific vulgar language within purely Latin parody, that is, we recognize a Frenchman or a German as the author of the parody. Theoretically it is possible to sense and recognize in any parody that normal language, that normal style, in light of which the given parody was created. But in practice it is far from easy and not always possible. Thus it is that in parody two languages are crossed with each other, as well as two styles, two linguistic points of view, and in the final analysis two speaking subjects. It is true that only one of these languages, the one that is parodied, is present in its own right, the other is present invisibly, as an actualizing background for creating and perceiving. Parody is an intentional hybrid, but usually it is an intralinguistic one, one that nourishes itself on the stratification of the literary language into generic languages and languages of various specific tendencies. Every type of intentional stylistic hybrid is more or less dialogized. This means that the languages that are crossed in it relate to each other as do rejoinders in a dialogue, there is an argument between languages, an argument between styles of language. But it is not a dialogue in the narrative sense, nor in the abstract sense, rather it is a dialogue between points of view, each with its own concrete language that cannot be translated into the other. Thus every parody is an intentional dialogized hybrid. Within it, languages and styles actively and mutually illuminate one another. Every word used with conditions attached, every word enclosed in international quotation marks, is likewise an intentional hybrid if only because the speaker insulates himself from this word as if from another language, as if from a style, when it sounds to him, for example, too vulgar, or on the contrary too refined, or too pompous, or if it bespeaks a specific tendency, a specific linguistic manner and so forth. But let us return to the Latin Paradia Sacra. It is an intentional dialogized hybrid, but a hybrid of different languages. It is a dialogue between languages, although one of them, the vulgar, is present only as an actively dialogizing backdrop. What we have is a never-ending folkloric dialogue, the dispute between a dismal sacred word and a cheerful folk word, a dispute that resembles the well-known medieval dialogues between Solomon and the cheerful rogue Markolf except that Markolf argued with Solomon in Latin, and here the arguments are carried on in various languages. Another sacred word, uttered in a foreign language, is degraded by the accents of vulgar folk languages, re-evaluated and reinterpreted against the backdrop of these languages, and congeals to the point where it becomes a ridiculous image, the comic carnival mask of a narrow and joyless pedant, an unctuous hypocritical old bigot, a stingy and dried up miser. This manuscript tradition of Paradia Sacra, prodigious in scope and almost a thousand years long, is a remarkable and as yet poorly read document testifying to an intense struggle and interanimation among languages, a struggle that occurred everywhere in Western Europe. This was a language drama played out as if it were a gay farce. It was linguistic Saturnalia lingua sacra piliata. The sacred Latin word was a foreign body that invaded the organism of the European languages. And throughout the Middle Ages, national languages, as organisms, repulsed this body. It was not, however, the repelling of a thing, but rather of a conceptualizing discourse that had made a home for itself in all the higher reaches of national ideological thought processes. The repulsion of this foreign-born sacred word was a dialogized operation, and was accomplished under cover of holiday and festival merrymaking, it was precisely the old ruler, the old year, the winter, the fast that was driven out. Such was the Paradia Sacra. But the remainder of medieval Latin literature was also in its essence a great and complex dialogized hybrid. It is no wonder that Paul Lehman defines it as the appropriation, reworking and imitation of someone else's property, that is, of someone else's word. 
This reciprocal orientation of each word to the other occurs across the entire spectrum of tones from reverent acceptance to parodic ridicule so that it is often very difficult to establish precisely where reverence ends and ridicule begins. It is exactly like the modern novel, where one often does not know where the direct authorial word ends and where a parodic or stylized playing with the character's language begins. Only here, in the Latin literature of the Middle Ages, the complex and contradictory process of accepting and then resisting the other's word, the process of reverently heeding it while at the same time ridiculing it, was accomplished on a grand scale throughout all the Western European world, and left an eradicable mark on the literary and linguistic consciousness of its peoples. In addition to Latin parody there also existed, as we have already mentioned, macaronic parody. This is an already fully developed, intentionally dialogized bilingual, and sometimes trilingual, hybrid. In the bilingual literature of the Middle Ages we also find all possible types of relationships to the other's word from reverence to merciless ridicule. In France, for example, the so-called epitrophases were widespread. Here, a verse of sacred writ, part of the apostolic epistles read during the Mass, is accompanied by lines of octosyllabic verse in French that piously translate and paraphrase the Latin text. The French language functioned in such a pious and commentating way in a whole series of macaronic prayers. Here, for example, is an excerpt from a macaronic paternoster of the 13th century, the beginning of the final stanza. In this hybrid the French portion piously and affirmatively translates and completes the Latin portion. But here is the beginning of a pater noster of the 14th century describing the disasters of war. Here the French portion sharply ridicules the sacred Latin word. It interrupts the opening words of the prayer and gives a picture of life in heaven as something peaceful and marvelous compared to our earthly woes. The style of the French portion does not correspond to the high style of the prayer, as it does in the first example, high style is in fact deliberately vulgarized. This is a crude earthly rejoinder to the otherworldly pomposity of the prayer. There are an extraordinarily large number of macaronic texts of varying degrees of piety and parody. The macaronic verse from Carmen Aburana is universally known. We might also recall the macaronic language of liturgical dramas. There, national languages often serve as a comic rejoinder, lowering the lofty Latin portions of the drama. The macaronic literature of the Middle Ages is likewise an extremely important and interesting document in the struggle and interanimation among languages. There is no need to expand upon the great parodic travestying literature of the Middle Ages that exists in national folk languages. This literature constituted a fully articulated superstructure of laughter, erected over all serious straightforward genres. Here, as in Rome, the tendency was toward a laughing double for every serious form. We recall the role of medieval clowns, those professional creators of the second level, who with the doubling effect of their laughter ensured the wholeness of the serial laughing word. We recall all the different kinds of comic intermedia and anthrax that played a role in the fourth drama of Greece and in the cheerful exodium of Rome. A clear example of just this doubling effect of laughter can be found at the second level, the level of the fool, in the tragedies and comedies of Shakespeare. Echoes of this comic parallelism can still be heard today for example, in the rather common doubling by a circus clown of the serious and dangerous numbers of a program, or in the half-joking role of our masters of ceremonies. All the parodic travestying forms of the Middle Ages, and of the ancient world as well, modeled themselves on folk and holiday merrymaking, which throughout the Middle Ages bore the character of carnival and still retained in itself ineradicable traces of Saturnalia. At the waning of the Middle Ages and during the Renaissance the parodic travestying word broke through all remaining boundaries. It broke through into all strict and closed straightforward genres, it reverberated loudly in the epics of the Spielmanner and Cantastori, it penetrated the lofty chivalric romance. Devilry almost completely overwhelmed the mystery rites, of which devilry was originally only a part. Such major and extremely important genres as the Sodi made their appearance. And there arrived on the scene, at last, the great Renaissance novel The Novels of Rabelais and Cervantes. It is precisely in these two works that the novelistic word, 
prepared for by all the forms analyzed above as well as by a more ancient heritage, revealed its full potential and began to play such a titanic role in the formulation of a new literary and linguistic consciousness. In the Renaissance, this interanimation of languages that was working to destroy bilingualism reached its highest point. It became, in addition, extraordinarily more complex. In the second volume of his classic work, Ferdinand Bruno, the historian of the French language, poses the question, why was the task of transition to a national language accomplished precisely during the Renaissance, that period whose tendencies were otherwise overwhelmingly toward the classical? And the answer he provides is absolutely correct, the very attempt of the Renaissance to establish the Latin language in all its classical purity inevitably transformed it into a dead language. It was impossible to sustain the classic Ciceronian purity of Latin while using it in the course of everyday life and in the world of objects of the 16th century, that is, while using it to express concepts and objects from the contemporary scene. The re-establishment of a classically pure Latin restricted its area of application to essentially the sphere of stylization alone. It was as if the language were being measured against a new world. And the language could not be stretched to fit. At the same time classical Latin illuminated the face of medieval Latin. This face, as it turned out, was hideous, but this face could only be seen in the light of classical Latin. And thus there came about that remarkable image of a language the letters of obscure people. This satire is a complex intentional linguistic hybrid. The language of obscure people is parroted, that is, it coalesces into a stereotype, it is exaggerated, reduced to a type when measured against the standard of the proper and correct Latin of the humanists. At the same time, beneath the Latin language of these obscure people their native German tongue shines distinctly through, they take the syntactical constructions of the German language and fill them with Latin words, and they even translate specific German expressions literally into Latin, their intonation is coarse, Germanic. From the point of view of the obscure people this hybrid is not intentional, they write in the only way they can. But this Latin-German hybrid is intentionally exaggerated and highlighted by the parodying intention of the authors of the satire. One must note, however, that this linguistic satire has something of the air of the study about it, a somewhat abstract and grammatical character. The poetry of the macaronics was also complex linguistic satire, but it was not a parody on kitchen Latin, it was a travesty that aimed at lowering the Latin used by the Ciceronian purists with their lofty and strict lexical norms. The macaronics worked with correct Latin constructions, as distinct from the obscure people, but into these constructions they introduced an abundance of words from their native vulgar tongue, Italian, having given them an external Latin formulation. The Italian language and the style of the low genres the facetious tales and so forth functioned as an actualizing backdrop against which macaronic poetry could be perceived, with the themes of body and material emphasized and thereby degraded. The language of the Ciceronians featured a high style, it was, in essence, a style rather than a language. It was this style that the macaronics parroted. In the linguistic satires of the Renaissance, the letters of obscure people, the poetry of the macaronics, three languages thus animate one another, medieval Latin, the purified and rigorous Latin of the humanists and the national vulgar tongue. At the same time two worlds are animating each other, a medieval one and a new folk humanist one. We also hear the same old folkloric quarrel of old with new, we hear the same old folkloric disgracing and ridiculing of the old old authority, old truth, the old word. The letters of obscure people, the poetry of the macaronics and a series of other analogous phenomena indicate to what extent this process of interanimation of languages, the measuring of them against their current reality and their epoch, was a conscious process. They indicate further to what extent forms of language, and forms of worldview, were inseparable from each other. And they indicate, finally, to what extent the old and new worlds were characterized precisely by their own peculiar languages, by the image of language that attached to each. Languages quarreled with each other, but this quarrel like any quarrel among great and significant cultural and historical forces could not pass on to a further phase by means of abstract and rational dialogue, 
nor by a purely dramatic dialogue, but only by means of complexly dialogized hybrids. The great novels of the Renaissance were such hybrids, although stylistically they were monoglot. In the process of this linguistic change, the dialects within national languages were also set into new motion. Their period of dark and deaf coexistence came to an end. Their unique qualities began to be sensed in a new way, in the light of the evolving and centralizing norm of a national language. Ridiculing dialectological peculiarities, making fun of the linguistic and speech manners of groups living in different districts and cities throughout the nation, is something that belongs to every people's most ancient store of language images. But during the Renaissance this mutual ridiculing of different groups among the folk took on a new and fundamental significance occurring as it did in the light of a more general interanimation of languages, and when a general, national norm for the country's language was being created. The parodying images of dialects began to receive more profound artistic formulation, and began to penetrate major literature. Thus in the Commedia dell'arte, Italian dialects were knit together with the specific types and masks of the comedy. In this respect one might even call the Commedia dell'arte a comedy of dialects. It was an intentional dialectological hybrid. Thus did the interanimation of languages occur in the very epoch that saw the creation of the European novel. Laughter and polyglossia had paved the way for the novelistic discourse of modern times. In our essay we have touched upon only two factors that were at work in the prehistory of novelistic discourse. There remains before us the very important task of studying speech genres primarily the familiar strata of folk language that played such an enormous role in the formulation of novelistic discourse and that, in altered form, entered into the composition of the novel as a genre. But this already takes us beyond the boundaries of our present study. Here, at the conclusion, we wish only to emphasize that the novelistic word arose and developed not as the result of a narrowly literary struggle among tendencies, styles, abstract worldviews but rather in a complex and centuries-long struggle of cultures and languages. It is connected with the major shifts and crises in the fates of various European languages, and of the speech life of peoples. The prehistory of the novelistic word is not to be contained within the narrow perimeters of a history confined to mere literary styles. The process of assimilating real historical time and space in literature has a complicated and erratic history, as does the articulation of actual historical persons in such a time and space. Isolated aspects of time and space, however those available in a given historical stage of human development have been assimilated, and corresponding generic techniques have been devised for reflecting and artistically processing such appropriated aspects of reality. We will give the name chronotope, literally, time-space, to the intrinsic connectedness of temporal and spatial relationships that are artistically expressed in literature. This term space-time is employed in mathematics, and was introduced as part of Einstein's theory of relativity. The special meaning it has in relativity theory is not important for our purposes, we are borrowing it for literary criticism almost as a metaphor, almost, but not entirely. What counts for us is the fact that it expresses the inseparability of space and time, time as the fourth dimension of space. We understand the chronotope as a formally constitutive category of literature, we will not deal with the chronotope in other areas of culture. In the literary artistic chronotope, spatial and temporal indicators are fused into one carefully thought out, concrete whole. Time, as it were, thickens, takes on flesh, becomes artistically visible, likewise, space becomes charged and responsive to the movements of time, plot, and history. This intersection of axes and fusion of indicators characterizes the artistic chronotope. The chronotope in literature has an intrinsic generic significance. It can even be said that it is precisely the chronotope that defines genre and generic distinctions, for in literature the primary category in the chronotope is time. The chronotope as a formally constitutive category determines to a significant degree the image of man in literature as well. The image of man is always intrinsically chronotopic. As we have said, the process of assimilating an actual historical chronotope in literature has been complicated and erratic, certain isolated aspects of the chronotope, 
available in given historical conditions, have been worked out, although only certain specific forms of an actual chronotope were reflected in art. These generic forms, at first productive, were then reinforced by tradition, in their subsequent development they continued stubbornly to exist, up to and beyond the point at which they had lost any meaning that was productive in actuality or adequate to later historical situations. This explains the simultaneous existence in literature of phenomena taken from widely separate periods of time, which greatly complicates the historical literary process. In the notes we are offering here toward a historical poetics, we will try to illustrate this process, taking our examples from the various histories of generic heterogeneity in the European novel, beginning with the so-called Greek romance and ending with the Rabelaisian novel. The relative typological stability of the novelistic chronotopes that were worked out in these periods permits us to glance ahead as well, at various novel types in succeeding periods. We do not pretend to completeness or precision in our theoretical formulations and definitions. Here and abroad, serious work on the study of space and time in art and literature has only just begun. Such work will in its further development eventually supplement, and perhaps substantially correct, the characteristics of novelistic chronotopes offered by us here. I. The Greek Romance Three basic types of novels developed in ancient times, and there are consequently three corresponding methods for artistically fixing time and space in these novels in short, there were three novelistic chronotopes. These three types turned out to be extraordinarily productive and flexible, and to a large degree determined the development of the adventure novel up to the mid-18th century. One must therefore begin with a detailed analysis of these three ancient types, in order to uncover the variants on them that are found in the European novel, and in order to discover the new element that was eventually brought forth on European soil. In the analyses that follow, we will devote our entire attention to the problem of time, the dominant principle in the chronotope, and to those things, and only those things, that have a direct and unmediated relationship to time. We will bypass all questions dealing with the origin of these types in history. We will call, provisionally, the first type of ancient novel, not first in the chronological sense, the adventure novel of ordeal. This type would include all the so-called Greek or Sophist novels written between the 2nd and 6th centuries AD. The following examples have come down to us intact, and exist in Russian translation, an Ethiopian tale or Ethiopica of Heliodorus, Lucip, and Clitophon of Achilles Tadius Speecherius and Calerha of Charit and the Ephesiaca of Xenophon of Ephesus D. Daphnis and Chloe of Longa Several other characteristic examples have survived in excerpts and paraphrases. In these novels we find a subtle and highly developed type of adventure time, with all its distinctive characteristics and nuances. This adventure time and the technique of its use in the novel is so perfected, so full, that in all subsequent evolution of the purely adventure novel nothing essential has been added to it down to the present day. The distinctive features of adventure time are thus best illustrated with material from these novels. The plots of these romances, like those of their nearest and most immediate successors, the Byzantine novels, are remarkably similar to each other, and are in fact composed of the very same elements, Motifs individual novels differ from each other only in the number of such elements, their proportionate weight within the whole plot and the way they are combined. One can easily construct a typical composite schema of this plot, taking into account the most important individual deviations and variations. Such a schema would go something like this. There is a boy and a girl of marriageable age. Their lineage is unknown, mysterious, but not always, there is, for example, no such instance in Tadeus. They are remarkable for their exceptional beauty. They are also exceptionally chaste. They meet each other unexpectedly, usually during some festive holiday. A sudden and instantaneous passion flares up between them that is as irresistible as fate, like an incurable disease. However, the marriage cannot take place straightway. They are confronted with obstacles that retard and delay their union. The lovers are parted, they seek one another, find one another, again they lose each other, again they find each other. There are the usual obstacles and adventures of lovers, 
the abduction of the bride on the eve of the wedding, the absence of parental consent, if parents exist, a different bridegroom and bride intended for either of the lovers, false couples, the flight of the lovers, their journey, a storm at sea, a shipwreck, a miraculous rescue, an attack by pirates, captivity and prison, an attempt on the innocence of the hero and heroine, the offering up of the heroine as a purifying sacrifice, wars, battles, being sold into slavery, presumed deaths, disguising one's identity, recognition and failures of recognition, presumed betrayals, attempts on chastity and fidelity, false accusations of crimes, court trials, court inquiries into the chastity and fidelity of the lovers. The heroes find their parents, if unknown. Meetings with unexpected friends or enemies play an important role, as do fortune-telling, prophecy, prophetic dreams, premonitions and sleeping potions. The novel ends happily with the lovers united in marriage. Such is the schema for the basic components of the plot. The action of the plot unfolds against a very broad and very geographical background, usually in three to five countries separated by seas, Greece, Persia, Phoenicia, Egypt, Babylon, Ethiopia, and elsewhere. There are descriptions, often very detailed, of specific features of countries, cities, structures of various kinds, works of art, pictures, for example, the habits and customs of the population, various exotic and marvelous animals and other wonders and rarities. The novel also contains fairly wide-ranging discussions on various religious, philosophical, political and scientific topics, on fate, omens, the power of eros, human passions, tears, and so forth. Large portions of these novels are taken up with speeches of the characters relevant or otherwise constructed in accordance with all the rules of a later rhetoric. Compositionally, therefore, the Greek romance strives for a certain encyclopedic quality, a quality that is characteristic of the genre. All the aspects of the novel we listed above, in their abstract form, are, without exception, in no way new neither in their plot nor in their descriptive and rhetorical aspects. They had all been encountered before and were well developed in other genres of ancient literature, love motifs, first meeting, sudden passion, melancholy, had been worked out in Hellenistic love poetry, certain other motifs, storms, shipwrecks, wars, abductions, were developed in the ancient epic, several other of these motifs, such as recognition, had played an essential role in tragedy, Descriptive motifs had already been well developed in the ancient geographical novel and in historiographic works, for example, in Herodotus, deliberations and speeches had occurred in rhetorical genres. The significance of such genres as the love elegy, the geographical novel, rhetoric, drama, the historiographic genre in the genesis of the Greek romance may be variously assessed, but one cannot deny a very real syncretism of these generic features. The Greek romance utilized and fused together in its structure almost all genres of ancient literature. But all these elements, derived from various different genres, are fused and consolidated into a new specifically novelistic unity, of which the constitutive feature is adventure novel time. The elements derived from various other genres assumed a new character and special functions in this completely new chronotope dash an alien world in adventure time and ceased to be what they had been in other genres. What then is the essence of this adventure time in the Greek romance? The first meeting of hero and heroine and the sudden flare-up of their passion for each other is the starting point for plot movement, the end point of plot movement is their successful union in marriage. All action in the novel unfolds between these two points. These points the poles of plot movement are themselves crucial events in the hero's lives, in and of themselves they have a biographical significance. But it is not around these that the novel is structured, rather, it is around that which lies, that which takes place, between them. But in essence nothing need lie between them. From the very beginning, the love between the hero and heroine is not subject to doubt, this love remains absolutely unchanged throughout the entire novel. Their chastity is also preserved, 
and their marriage at the end of the novel is directly conjoined with their love that same love that had been ignited at their first meeting at the outset of the novel, it is as if absolutely nothing had happened between these two moments, as if the marriage had been consummated on the day after their meeting. Two adjacent moments, one of biographical life, one of biographical time, are directly conjoined. The gap, the pause, the hiatus that appears between these two strictly adjacent biographical moments and in which, as it were, the entire novel is constructed is not contained in the biographical time sequence, it lies outside biographical time, it changes nothing in the life of the heroes, and introduces nothing into their life. It is, precisely, an extra-temporal hiatus between two moments of biographical time. If the situation were otherwise had, for example, the initial instantaneous passion of the heroes grown stronger as a result of their adventures and ordeals, had that passion been tested in action, thereby acquiring new qualities of a stable and tried love, had the heroes themselves matured, come to know each other better than we would have an example of a much later European novel type, one that would not be an adventure novel at all, and certainly not a Greek romance. Although the poles of the plot would have remained the same, passion at the beginning, marriage at the end, the events that retard the marriage would have acquired in themselves a certain biographical or at least psychological significance, they would give the appearance of being stretched along the real timeline of the heroes' lives, and of affecting change in both the heroes and in the events, the key events, of their lives. But this is precisely what is lacking in the Greek romance, in it there is a sharp hiatus between two moments of biographical time, a hiatus that leaves no trace in the life of the heroes or in their personalities. All the events of the novel that fill this hiatus are a pure digression from the normal course of life, they are excluded from the kind of real duration in which additions to a normal biography are made. This Greek romance time does not have even an elementary biological or matu rational duration. At the novel's outset the heroes meet each other at a marriageable age, and at the same marriageable age, no less fresh and handsome, they consummate the marriage at the novel's end. Such a form of time, in which they experience a most improbable number of adventures, is not measured off in the novel and does not add up, it is simply days, nights, hours, moments clocked in a technical sense within the limits of each separate adventure. This time adventure time, highly intensified but undifferentiated is not registered in the slightest way in the age of the heroes. We have here an extra-temporal hiatus between two biological moments the arousal of passion, and its satisfaction. When Voltaire, in his Candide, parroted the type of Greek adventure novel that was popular in the 17th and 18th centuries, the so-called Baroque novel, he took into account the real time that would have been required in such romances for the hero to experience the customary dose of adventures and turns of fate. With all obstacles overcome at the novel's end, his heroes, Candide and Cunegonde, consummate the obligatory happy marriage. But, alas, they have already grown old, and the wondrous Cunegonde resembles some hideous old witch. Consummation follows upon passion, but only when it is no longer biologically possible. It goes without saying that Greek adventure time lacks any natural, everyday cyclicity such as might have introduced into it a temporal order and indices on a human scale tying it to the repetitive aspects of natural and human life. No matter where one goes in the world of the Greek romance, with all its countries and cities, its buildings and works of art, there are absolutely no indications of historical time, no identifying traces of the era. This also explains the fact that scholarship has yet to establish the precise chronology of Greek romances, and until quite recently scholarly opinion as to the dates of origin of individual novels has differed by as much as five or six centuries. Thus all of the action in a Greek romance, all the events and adventures that fill it, constitute time sequences that are neither historical, quotidian, biographical, nor even biological and matu rational. Actions lie outside these sequences, beyond the reach of that force, inherent in these sequences, that generates rules and defines the measure of a man. In this kind of time, nothing changes, the world remains as it was, the biographical life of the heroes does not change, their feelings do not change, people do not even age. 
This empty time leaves no traces anywhere, no indications of its passing. This, we repeat, is an extratemporal hiatus that appears between two moments of a real time sequence, in this case one that is biographical. Such is adventure time as an entity. But what is it like on the inside? It is composed of a series of short segments that correspond to separate adventures, within each such adventure, time is organized from without, technically. What is important is to be able to escape, to catch up, to outstrip, to be or not to be in a given place at a given moment, to meet or not to meet and so forth. Within the limits of a given adventure, days, nights, hours, even minutes and seconds add up, as they would in any struggle or any active external undertaking. These time segments are introduced and intersect with specific link words, suddenly and at just that moment. Suddenly and at just that moment best characterize this type of time, for this time usually has its origin and comes into its own in just those places where the normal, pragmatic and premeditated course of events is interrupted and provides an opening for sheer chance, which has its own specific logic. This logic is one of random contingency sopadini, which is to say, chance simultaneity meetings and chance rupture in own meetings, that is, a logic of random disjunctions in time as well. In this random contingency, earlier and later are crucially, even decisively, significant. Should something happen a minute earlier or a minute later, that is, should there be no chance simultaneity or chance disjunctions in time, there would be no plot at all, and nothing to write a novel about. I had reached my 19th year, and my father had arranged a marriage for me the following year when fate began her game, Clitophon tells us, Lucip and Clitophon, Part 1, 3.4. This game of fate, its suddenlies and at just that moments make up the entire contents of the novel. War broke out unexpectedly between the Thracians and the Byzantines. In the novel nothing is said about the causes of the war, but thanks to it Lucip turns up in the home of Clitophon's father. As soon as I saw her, I perished on the spot, Clitophon relates. But Clitophon's father had already chosen another bride for him. The father begins to hurry the wedding along, sets it for the following day and prepares the preliminary sacrifices. When I heard about this I considered myself doomed, and began to devise some clever trick to postpone the wedding. While occupied with this, a voice unexpectedly rang out in the men's half of the house, Part 2, 12. As it happened, an eagle had carried off the sacrificial meat that Clitophon's father had prepared. This was a bad omen, and the wedding had to be postponed for several days. But just at that moment, thanks to chance, Clitophon's intended bride was abducted taken by mistake for Losip. Clitophon resolves to steal into Losip's bedroom. As soon as I entered the girl's bedchamber, the following strange thing happened to her mother. She was alarmed by a dream, part 2, 23. She enters the bedchamber and finds Clitophon there, but he manages to slip away unrecognized. The next day, however, everything is in danger of being exposed, and Clitophon and Lucip must flee. The entire escape is built on a chain of random suddenlies and at just that moments that benefit the heroes. One must admit that Konops, who kept watch over us, had just happened that day to be gone from the house, on some errand for his mistress. We were lucky, having gotten as far as the port of Baratus, we found a ship setting sail, whose mooring lines had already been prepared for unfurling. On board ship, a young man turned up alongside us quite by chance, Part 2, 31-32. He befriends them and plays a significant role in subsequent adventures. Then follows the traditional storm and shipwreck. On the third day of our voyage, a sudden fog spread over the clear sky and dimmed the light of day, Part 3, R. During the shipwreck everyone perishes except the heroes, who are saved thanks to good fortune. And here, just as the ship was sinking, some kindly deity preserved for us a portion of its cargo. They are cast up on the shore, thanks to our good fortune we were delivered to Pelusium towards evening, and joyfully came out on dry land. Part 3, 5 
it later turns out that all other characters who were thought to have perished during the shipwreck were also saved, thanks to good fortune. When in the course of the novel the heroes need emergency help, these persons manage to be in just the right place at just the right time. Convinced that Lucip has been abducted by bandits as a sacrificial offering, Clitophon decides to commit suicide, I took up the sword, in order to end my life on the very spot of Lucip's immolation. Suddenly I see it was a moonlit night two people, running directly toward me, they turn out to be Manilas and Satyrus. Although seeing my friends alive was very unexpected, I did not embrace them and was not overwhelmed with joy. Part 3, 17 Of course the friends prevent the suicide and announce that Lucip is alive. Toward the end of the novel, Clitophon is sentenced to death on a false accusation and before his death is to be tortured. They chained me down, took off my clothes, hung me on the rack, some of the torturers brought whips, others a noose, and a fire was kindled. Clinius let out a howl and began to invoke the gods when suddenly, in full view of all, a priest of Artemis approached, crowned with laurel. His approach signified the arrival of a festive procession in honor of the goddess. When this happens, an execution must be postponed for several days until the participants in the procession have finished their sacrificial offerings. In such a way was I then released from my chains, Part 7, 12. Several days after the postponement, everything is cleared up, and events take yet another turn, not of course without a number of new random coincidences and interruptions. Lucip, it turns out, is alive. The novel ends with happy marriages. As we see, and we have cited here only an insignificant number of random contingencies, Adventure Time lives a rather fraught life in the romance, one day, one hour, even one minute earlier or later have everywhere a decisive and fatal significance. The adventures themselves are strung together in an extra-temporal and in effect infinite series, this series can be extended as long as one likes, in itself it has no necessary internal limits. Greek romances are comparatively short. In the 17th century, the length of similarly constructed novels increases by 10 to 15 times. There are no internal limits to this increase. For all the days, hours, minutes that are ticked off within the separate adventures are not united into a real-time series, they do not become the days and hours of a human life. These hours and days leave no trace, and therefore, one may have as many of them as one likes. All moments of this infinite adventure time are controlled by one force chance. As we have seen, this time is entirely composed of contingency of chance meetings and failures to meet. Adventuristic chance time is the specific time during which irrational forces intervene in human life, the intervention of fate, dick, gods, demons, sorcerers or in later adventure novels those novelistic villains who as villains use chance meetings or failures to meet for their own purposes, they lie in wait, they bide their time, we have a veritable downpour of suddenlies and at just that moments. Moments of adventuristic time occur at those points when the normal course of events, the normal, intended or purposeful sequence of life's events is interrupted. These points provide an opening for the intrusion of non-human forces fate, gods, villains and it is precisely these forces, and not the heroes, who in adventure time take all the initiative. Of course the heroes themselves act in adventure time they escape, defend themselves, engage in battle, save themselves but they act, as it were, as merely physical persons, and the initiative does not belong to them. Even love is unexpectedly sent to them by all-powerful arrows. In this time, persons are forever having things happen to them, they might even happen to win a kingdom, a purely adventuristic person is a person of chance. He enters adventuristic time as a person to whom something happens. But the initiative in this time does not belong to human beings. We may take it for granted that moments of adventure time, all these suddenlies and at just that moments, cannot be foreseen with the help of analysis, study, wise foresight, experience, etc., alone. Such things are better understood through fortune-telling, omens, legends, oracular predictions, prophetic dreams and premonitions. 
Greek romances are indeed filled with all these. Hardly had fate begun her game with Clitophon when he had a prophetic dream revealing his future meeting with Lucip and their adventures. The novel is subsequently filled with similar events. Fate and the gods hold all initiative in their hands, and they merely inform people of their will. At night the gods frequently like to reveal the future to people, says Achilles Tatius through his Clitophon, and not that they may be spared suffering for they cannot control what fate has decreed but that they may bear their sufferings more easily, Part R, 3. Whenever Greek adventure time appears in the subsequent development of the European novel, initiative is handed over to chance, which controls meetings and failures to meet either as an impersonal, anonymous force in the novel or as fate, as divine foresight, as romantic villains or romantic secret benefactors. Examples of the latter one can still find in Walter Scott's historical novels. Alongside chance, in its various guises, a number burr of other types of predictions inevitably figure in the novel, prophetic dreams and premonitions in particular. It is not mandatory, of course, for an entire novel to be constructed in adventure time of the Greek type. One need only have a certain admixture of these time elements to other time sequences for its special accompanying effects to appear. In the 17th century, the fates of nations, kingdoms and cultures were also drawn into this adventure time of chance, gods and villains, a time with its own specific logic. This occurs in the earliest European historical novels, for example in Discutteris Artemis, or the Grand Cyrus IX in Lohenstein's Arminius and Tusnelda and in the historical novels of La Calpernide. Pervading these novels is a curious philosophy of history that hands over the settling of historical destinies to an extra-temporal hiatus that exists between two moments of a real-time sequence. Through the connecting link of the Gothic novel, this sequence of moments in a historical Baroque novel also survives into the historical novel of Walter Scott, determining several of its characteristics, undercover activities of secret benefactors and villains, the specific role of chance, various sorts of predictions and premonitions. In Walter Scott's novels these moments are not, of course, the dominant ones. Let us hasten to add that we are not talking here of chance tacking any specific initiative in Greek adventure time, nor of chance in general. In general, Chance is but one form of the principle of necessity and as such has a place in any novel, as it has its place in life itself. Even in human time sequences that are more real, that are of varying degrees of reality, corresponding to moments of Greek initiative generated chance, there are moments, one cannot of course even speak in a general way of their strict correspondence, of human error, crime, sometimes even in the Baroque novel, fluctuations and choice decisions made on the basis of human initiative. To conclude our analysis of adventure time in the Greek romance, we must deal with one more general aspect, namely, individual motifs that are included as constituent elements in novelistic plots. Such motifs as meeting-slash-parting, separation, loss-slash-acquisition, search-slash-discovery, recognition-slash-non-recognition and so forth enter as constituent elements into plots, not only of novels of various eras and types but also into literary works of other genres, epic, dramatic, even lyric. By their very nature these motifs are chronotopic, although it is true the chronotope is developed in different ways in the various genres. We shall discuss here only one motif, but the one that is probably the most important the motif of meeting. As we have already shown in our analysis of the Greek romance, in any meeting the temporal marker, at one and the same time, is inseparable from the spatial marker, in one and the same place. In the negative motif, they did not meet, they were parted, the chronotopicity is retained but one or another member of the chronotope bears a negative sign, they did not meet because they did not arrive at the given place at the same time, or at the same time they were in different places. The inseparable unity of time and space markers, a unity without emerging, gives to the chronotope of meeting an elementary clear, formal, almost mathematical character. But this character is of course highly abstract. The motif of meeting is after all impossible in isolation, it always enters as a constituent element of the plot into the concrete unity of the entire work and, 
consequently, is part of the concrete chronotope that subs ums it, in our case, it enters adventure time and a foreign, but not alien, country. In different works the motif of meeting may have different nuances depending on concrete associations, such as the emotional evaluation of meetings, a meeting may be desirable or undesirable, joyful or sad, sometimes terrifying, perhaps even ambivalent. In various contexts the motif of meeting may, of course, be expressed by various verbal stratagems. It may assume a multiply metaphoric or singly metaphoric meaning and may, finally, become a symbol, one that is sometimes very profound. Quite frequently in literature the chronotope of meeting fulfills architectonic functions, it can serve as an opening, sometimes as a culmination, even as a denouement, a finale, of the plot. A meeting is one of the most ancient devices for structuring a plot in the epic, and even more so in the novel. Of special importance is the close link between the motif of meeting and such motifs as parting, escape, acquisition, loss, marriage and so forth, which are similar to the motif of meeting in their unity of space and time markers. Of special importance is the close link between the motif of meeting and the chronotope of the road, the open road, and of various types of meetings on the road. In the chronotope of the road, the unity of time and space markers is exhibited with exceptional precision and clarity. The importance of the chronotope of the road in literature is immense, it is a rare work that does not contain a variation of this motif, and many words are directly constructed on the road chronotope, and on road meetings and adventures. The motif of meeting is also closely related to other important motifs, especially the motif of recognition slash non-recognition, which plays an enormous role in literature, for example, in ancient tragedy. The motif of meeting is one of the most universal motifs, not only in literature, it is difficult to find a work where this motif is completely absent, but also in other areas of culture and in various spheres of public and everyday life. In the scientific and technical realm where purely conceptual thinking predominates, there are no motifs as such, but the concept of contact is equivalent in some degree to the motif of meeting. In mythological and religious realms the motif of meeting plays a leading role, of course, in sacred legends and holy writ, both in Christian works such as the Gospels and in Buddhist writings, and in religious rituals. The motif of meeting is combined with other motifs, for example that of apparition, epiphany, in the religious realm. In those areas of philosophy that are not strictly scientific, the motif of meeting can be of considerable importance, in Schelling, for example, or in Max Schieler and particularly in Martin Buber. A real-life chronotope of meeting is constantly present in organizations of social and governmental life. Everyone is familiar with organized social meetings of all possible sorts, and how important they are. In the life of the state, meetings are also very important. Let us mention here only diplomatic encounters, always strictly regulated, where the time, place, and makeup of these encounters are dependent upon the rank of the person being met. And finally, everyone knows the importance of meetings, sometimes the entire fate of a man may depend on them, in life, and in the daily affairs of any individual. Such is the chronotopic motif of meeting. We shall return to the more general question of chronotopes and chronotopicity at the end of our essay but we shall now resume our analysis of the Greek romance. In what sort of space is the adventure time of Greek romances realized? For Greek adventure time to work, one must have an abstract expanse of space. The world of the Greek romance is of course chronotopic, but the link between space and time has, as it were, not an organic but a purely technical, and mechanical, nature. In order for the adventure to develop it needs space, and plenty of it. The contingency that governs events is inseparably tied up with space, measured primarily by distance on the one hand and by proximity on the other, and varying degrees of both. To prevent Clitophon's suicide, his friends must turn up in that place where he is planning to commit it, to manage this, that is to be the right time in the right place, they run, that is they overcome spatial distance. In order for Clitophon to be saved at the end of the novel, 
the procession led by the priest of Artemis must arrive at the place of execution before the execution takes place. Abduction presumes a rapid removal of the abducted to a distant and unknown place. Pursuit presumes overcoming distance, as well as other spatial obstacles. Captivity and prison presume guarding and isolating the hero in a definite spot in space, impeding his subsequent spatial movement toward his goal, that is, his subsequent pursuits and searches and so forth. Abductions, escape, pursuit, search and captivity all play an immense role in the Greek romance. It, therefore, requires large spaces, land, and seas, different countries. The world of these romances is large and diverse. But this size and diversity is utterly abstract. For a shipwreck one must have a sea, but which particular sea, in the geographical and historical sense, makes no difference at all. For escape it is important to go to another country, for kidnappers it is important to transport their victim to another country but which particular country again makes no difference at all. The adventuristic events of the Greek romance have no essential ties with any particular details of individual countries that might figure in the novel, with their social or political structure, with their culture or history. None of these distinctive details contribute in any way to the event as a determining factor, the event is determined by chance alone, by random contingency in a given spatial locus, a given country, city, and so forth. The nature of a given place does not figure as a component in the event, the place figures in solely as a naked, abstract expanse of space. All adventures in the Greek romance are thus governed by an interchangeability of space, what happens in Babylon could just as well happen in Egypt or Byzantium and vice versa. Separate adventures, complete in themselves, are also interchangeable in time, for adventure time leaves no defining traces and is therefore in essence reversible. The adventure chronotope is thus characterized by a technical, abstract connection between space and time, by the reversibility of moments in a temporal sequence, and by their interchangeability in space. In this chronotope all initiative and power belongs to chance. Therefore, the degree of specificity and concreteness of this world is necessarily very limited. For any concretization geographic, economic, socio-political, quotidian would fetter the freedom and flexibility of the adventures and limit the absolute power of chance. Every concretization, of even the most simple and everyday variety, would introduce its own rule-generating force, its own order, its inevitable ties to human life and to the time specific to that life. Events would end up being interwoven with these rules, and to a greater or lesser extent would find themselves participating in this order, subject to its ties. This would critically limit the power of chance, the movement of the adventures would be organically localized and tied down in time and space. But if one were to depict one's own native world, the indigenous reality surrounding one, such specificity and concretization would be absolutely unavoidable, at least to some degree. A depiction of one's own world no matter where or what it is could never achieve that degree of abstractness necessary for Greek adventure time. Therefore, the world of the Greek romance is an alien world, everything in it is indefinite, unknown, foreign. Its heroes are there for the first time, they have no organic ties or relationships with it, the laws governing the socio-political and everyday life of this world are foreign to them, they do not know them, in this world, therefore, they can experience only random contingency. But in the Greek romance the alien quality of this world is not emphasized and we cannot therefore call it exotic. Exoticism presupposes a deliberate opposition of what is alien to what is one's own, the otherness of what is foreign is emphasized, savored, as it were, and elaborately depicted against an implied background of one's own ordinary and familiar world. There is none of this in the Greek romance. In it everything is foreign, including the hero's homeland, the hero and the heroine usually have different homelands, there is no implied native, ordinary, familiar world, the native country of the author and his readers, against whose background the otherness and foreignness of what is foreign might be clearly projected. Of course there is in these romances a minimal degree of some presumed native, ordinary, normal world, the world of the author and his readers, 
there are some indices for perceiving the wonders and rarities of this other world. But this degree is so minuscule that scholarship has been almost entirely unable to devise a method for analyzing in these romances the presumed real world and real era of their authors. The world of Greek romances is an abstract alien world, and furthermore one utterly and exclusively other, since the native world from which the author came and from which he is now watching is nowhere to be found in it. Therefore, nothing in this world limits the absolute power of chance, and for that reason all these abductions, escapes, captivities and liberations, alleged deaths and resurrections and other adventures follow upon each other with such remarkable speed and ease. But as we have already indicated, many items and events in this abstract alien world are described in minute detail. How can this be reconciled with the principle of abstraction? The abstraction is still there, because every feature described in Greek romances is described as if it were isolated, single, and unique. Nowhere are we given a description of the country as a whole, with its distinctive characteristics, with the features that distinguish it from other countries, within a matrix of relationships. Only separate structures are described, without any connection to an encompassing whole, we have isolated natural phenomena for example, the strange animals that breed in a given country. The customs and everyday life of the folk are nowhere described, what we get instead is a description of some strange isolated quirk, connected to nothing. This isolation and disconnectedness permeates all the objects described in the novel. Thus the sum total of these objects does not equal the countries that are depicted, or more precisely, enumerated, in the novel, but rather each object is sufficient unto itself. All these isolated things described in the novel are unusual, strange, rare, that is precisely why they are described. In Lucip and Clitophon, for example, one finds a description of a strange beast called a Nile horse, a hippopotamus. It happened that the warriors caught a noteworthy river beast. Thus begins the description. Further on, an elephant is described and one hears of remarkable things pertaining to its appearance on the earth, part 4, 2 to 4. Elsewhere a crocodile is described, I saw another Nile beast, even more extraordinarily strong than the river horse. It was called a crocodile, part 4, 14. Since there is no scale for measuring these items and events, no clear background of the usual, of one's own world, against which to perceive unusual things, they take on the nature of curiosities, wonders, rarities. Thus in the Greek romance, the spaces of an alien world are filled with isolated curiosities and rarities that bear no connection to each other. These self-sufficient items curious, odd, wondrous are just as random and unexpected as the adventures themselves, they are made of the same material, they are congealed suddenly, adventures turned into things, offspring of the same chance. As a result, the chronotope of Greek romances an alien world in adventure time possesses its own peculiar consistency and unity. It has its own ineluctable logic that defines all its characteristics. Although in the abstract its motifs taken separately are not, as we have said above, knew they had already been well developed in other genres preceding the Greek romance still, when combined in this new chronotope, they become subject to its ineluctable logic and thus acquire an utterly new meaning and special functions. In other genres these motifs were connected with different, more concrete, and condensed chronotopes. In Alexandrian poetry the love motifs, first meeting, sudden love, lover's melancholy, first kiss and so forth, were developed in large part within a bucolic pastoral idyllic chronotope. This is a small but very concrete and condensed lyric epic chronotope that has played no small role in world literature. A specific and cycled, but not, strictly speaking, cyclical, idyllic time functions here, a blend of natural time, cyclic, and the everyday time of the more or less pastoral, at times even agricultural, life. This time possesses its own definite semi-cyclical rhythm, but it has fused bodily with a specific insular idyllic landscape, one worked out in meticulous detail. This is a dense and fragrant time, like honey, a time of intimate lover scenes and lyric outpourings, a time saturated with its own strictly limited, 
sealed off segment of nature's space, stylized through and through, we will not deal here with other variations of the love idyllic chronotope in Hellenic and Roman poetry. In the Greek romance, of course, nothing of this chronotope remains. A single exception exists, and it is an oddity, longest Daphnis and Chloe. At its center we have a pastoral idyllic chronotope, but a chronotope riddled with decay, its compact isolation and self-imposed limits destroyed, surrounded on all sides by an alien world and itself already half-alien, natural idyllic time is no longer as dense, it is cut through by shafts of adventure time. Longus Idol cannot, of course, be definitively categorized as a Greek adventure romance. And this work gives rise to its own line of descendants in the further historical development of the novel. Those factors in a Greek romance, of compositional as well as narrative interest, associated with travel through foreign countries had already been well developed in the ancient novel of travel. The world of the travel novel bears no resemblance to the alien world of the Greek romance. First and foremost we have at the center of the travel novel's world the author's own real homeland, which serves as organizing center for the point of view, the scales of comparison, the approaches and evaluations determining how alien countries and cultures are seen and understood, it is not compulsory that the native country be evaluated positively, but it must absolutely provide us with a scale and a background. In the novel of travel, this sense of a native country in itself that is, as an internal organizing center for seeing and depicting that is located at home radically changes the entire picture of a foreign world. Furthermore, the hero in such a novel is the public and political man of ancient times, a man governed by his socio-political, philosophical, and utopian interests. In addition, the factor of the journey itself, the itinerary, is an actual one, it imparts to the temporal sequence of the novel a real and essential organizing center. In such novels, finally, biography is the crucial organizing principle for time. We will not discuss here the various possible forms a novel of travel might assume, the adventure factor is regularly associated with one such form, but it does not serve as the dominant organizing principle in such a novel. It plays quite another role. This is not the place to investigate in detail the other chronotopes of other genres of ancient literature, including the major genres of epic and drama. We will merely point out that at their heart lies folk mythological time, in which ancient historical time, with its specific constraints, begins to come into its own. The time of ancient epic and drama was profoundly localized, absolutely inseparable from the concrete features of a characteristically Greek natural environment, and from the features of a man-made environment, that is, of specifically Greek administrative units, cities, and states. In every aspect of his natural world the Greek saw a trace of mythological time, he saw in it a condensed mythological event that would unfold into a mythological scene or tableau. Historical time was equally concrete and localized in epic and tragedy it was tightly interwoven with mythological time. These classical Greek chronotopes are more or less the antipodes of the alien world as we find it in Greek romances. Thus the various motifs and factors, of a narrative as well as a compositional nature, worked out and still alive in other ancient genres, bore in them completely different character and functions from those obtaining in the Greek adventure romance, under conditions characteristic of the romance's specific chronotope. In the romance they entered into a new and unique artistic unity, one, moreover, that was far from being a mere mechanical melange of various ancient genres. Now that we better understand the specific character of the Greek romance, we can consider the problem of portraying an individual in such novels. The distinctive features of all the narrative devices in the novel will also become clear in the course of our discussion. How indeed can a human being be portrayed in the adventure time that we have outlined above, where things occur simultaneously by chance and also fail to occur simultaneously by chance, where events have no consequences, where the initiative belongs everywhere exclusively to chance. It goes without saying that in this type of time, an individual can be nothing other than completely passive, completely unchanging. As we have said earlier, to such an individual things can merely happen. He himself is deprived of any initiative. 
he is merely the physical subject of the action. And it follows that his actions will be by and large of an elementary spatial sort. In essence, all the characters' actions in Greek romance are reduced to enforced movement through space, escape, persecution, quests, that is, to a change in spatial location. Human movement through space is precisely what provides the basic indices for measuring space and time in the Greek romance, which is to say, for its chronotope. It is nevertheless a living human being moving through space and not merely a physical body in the literal sense of the term. While it is true that his life may be completely passive dash fate runs the game he nevertheless endures the game fate plays. And he not only endures he keeps on being the same person and emerges from this game, from all these turns of fate and chance, with his identity absolutely unchanged. This distinctive correspondence of an identity with a particular self is the organizing center of the human image in the Greek romance. And one must not underestimate the significance, the profound ideological implications raised by this factor of human identity. In this way the Greek romance reveals its strong ties with a folklore that predates class distinctions, assimilating one of the essential elements in the folkloric concept of a man, one that survives to the present in various aspects of folklore, especially in folk tales. No matter how impoverished, how denuded a human identity may become in a Greek romance, there is always preserved in it some precious kernel of folk humanity, one always senses a faith in the indestructible power of man in his struggle with nature and with all inhuman forces. If we carefully examine the narrative and compositional aspects of Greek romance, we will be impressed by the enormous role played by such devices as recognition, disguise, temporary changes of dress, presumed death, with subsequent resurrection, presumed betrayal, with subsequent confirmation of unswerving fidelity, and finally the basic compositional, that is, organizing, motif of a test of the hero's integrity, their selfhood. In all these instances the narrative plays directly with traits of human identity. Even this basic complex of motifs meeting slash separation, search slash find is but another narrative expression reflecting the same concern for individual human identity. Let us first consider the compositional organizing device of testing the heroes. At the beginning of this essay we define the earliest type of ancient novel as an adventure novel of ordeal. The term novel of ordeal, profunx roman, has long been applied primarily to the 17th century Baroque novel by literary historians, who view it as the furthest extent of the European development of the Greek novel. The shaping force of the idea of trial stands out with extraordinary clarity in the Greek romance in fact, the general theme of trial literally takes on judicial and legal expression. The majority of adventures in a Greek romance are organized precisely as trials of the hero and heroine, especially trials of their chastity and mutual fidelity. But other things may also be tested, their nobility, courage, strength, fearlessness, and more rarely their intelligence. Chance throws the path of our heroes not merely with dangers but also with temptations of every possible sort, they are placed in the most ticklish situations, but they always emerge with their honor intact. In the artful fabrication of such extremely complex situations, one sees evidence in a Greek romance of the overly ingenious casuistry of the second sophistic. For this reason the trials are somewhat external and formal, and rather judicial and rhetorical as well. What is important here is not only the organization of separate adventures. The novel as a whole is conceived precisely as a test of the heroes. Greek adventure time, as we already know, leaves no traces neither in the world nor in human beings. No changes of any consequence occur, internal or external, as a result of the events recounted in the novel. At the end of the novel that initial equilibrium that had been destroyed by chance is restored once again. Everything returns to its source, everything returns to its own place. The result of this whole lengthy novel is that the hero marries his sweetheart. And yet people and things have gone through something, something that did not, indeed, change them but that did, in a manner of speaking, affirm what they, and precisely they, were as individuals, something that did verify and establish their identity, their durability and continuity. 
The hammer of events shatters nothing and forges nothing it merely tries the durability of an already finished product. And the product passes the test. Thus is constituted the artistic and ideological meaning of the Greek romance. No artistic genre can organize itself around suspense alone, for the very good reason that to be suspenseful there must be matters of substance to engage. And only a human life, or at least something directly touching it, is capable of evoking such suspense. This human factor must be revealed in some substantial aspect, however slight, that is, it must possess some degree of living reality. The Greek romance is a very malleable instance of the novelistic genre, one that possesses an enormous life force. It is precisely the use of the trial as a compositional idea that has proved especially productive in the history of the novel. We encounter it in the medieval courtly romance, in its early and especially later manifestation. It is to a significant degree the organizing principle behind Amatus and Pomeran of England we have already referred to its influence on the Baroque novel, where the idea of testing is enriched with specific ideological content where a set of specific ideals emerge embodied in the hero undergoing a trial dash the night without fear and above reproach. This absolute irreproachability of the heroes results in a certain stiltedness, leading Boileau to sharply criticize the Baroque novel in his Lucianic dialogue Sur les Heroes de Romans. In the period following the Baroque, the organizational importance of the trial diminishes sharply. But it does not die out entirely, and is retained as one of the organizing ideas of the novel in all subsequent eras. It is filled with varied ideological content, and the trial qua trial increasingly leads to negative results as in the 19th and early 20th century, when we encounter just such variations on the theme of the trial. One meets especially often the kind of trial that seeks to identify the hero's calling, his chosenness, his genius. We see one such variant in the testing of the Napoleonic parvenu in the French novel. Another version would be the testing of the hero's physical health and his ability to cope successfully with life. And finally, we have later variants on the theme of the trial in that mass of third-rate novels that deal with the testing of a moral reformer, a Nietzschean, an immoralist, an emancipated woman and so forth. But all these European variants on the novel of Ordeal, whether pure or mixed in form, depart significantly from that test of identity, in its lapidary, yet forceful, expression, that is present in the Greek romance. It is true that certain aspects of this preoccupation with human identity are retained such as the motifs of recognition, presumed death, and so on but they have been made more complex, and have lost their original lapidary force. The link of these motifs with folklore in the Greek romance although it is already sufficiently remote from folklore is nevertheless more unmediated. To fully understand the human image in a Greek romance and the distinctive features of its identity, and consequently the distinctive way its identity is put to the test, we must take into consideration the fact that human beings in such works as distinct from all classical genres of ancient literature are individuals, private persons. This feature corresponds to the abstract alien world of the Greek romance, in such a world, a man can only function as an isolated and private individual, deprived of any organic connection with his country, his city, his own social group, his clan, even his own family. He does not feel himself to be a part of the social whole. He is a solitary man, lost in an alien world. And he has no mission in this world. Privacy and isolation are the essential features of the human image in a Greek romance, and they are inevitably linked up with the peculiarities of adventure time and abstract space. It is for this reason that the human being in a Greek romance differs in principle so sharply from the public figure of the more ancient genres and, in particular, from that public and political man we see in the novel of travel. But at the same time this private and isolated man of the Greek romance quite often behaves, on the surface, like a public man, and precisely like the public man of the rhetorical and historical genres. He delivers long speeches that are rhetorically structured and in which he seeks to enlighten us with the private and intimate details of his love life, his exploits and adventures but all this not in the form of an intimate confession rather in the form of a public accounting. Finally, in the majority of these novels legal procedures play a critical role, 
they serve to sum up the adventures of the heroes and provide a legal and judicial affirmation of their identity, especially in its most crucial aspect the lover's fidelity to each other, and in particular the chastity of the heroine. As a result, all the major moments of the novel are publicly and rhetorically highlighted and justified, an apologia, and all those moments, taken as a whole, receive a final legal and judicial stamp of approval. If, in the final analysis, we should ask what, more than anything else, defines the unity of the human image in a Greek romance, we would have to answer that this unity is characterized precisely by what is rhetorical and judicial in it. These rhetorical, judicial, and public moments, however, assume an external form that is not consistent with the internal and authentic content of an individual man. His internal content is absolutely private, the basic givens of his life, the goals by which he is guided, all his trials and exploits are of an exclusively personal sort and have no social or political significance at all. After all, the pivot around which content is organized is the main character's love for each other and those internal and external trials to which this love is subjected. All other events have meaning in the novel only by virtue of their relationship to this pivot. Characteristically, even such events as war have meaning only, and exclusively, at the level of the hero's love activities. In Lucip and Clitophon, for example, the action begins with a war between the Byzantines and the Thracians for the sole purpose of enabling Lucip to end up in Clitophon's father's house, thus making possible their first meeting. This war is mentioned again at the end of the novel, so that its conclusion might be celebrated by the religious procession honoring Artemis that motivates Clitophon's release from torture and execution. Characteristically it is not private life that is subjected to and interpreted in light of social and political events, but rather the other way around social and political events gain meaning in the novel only thanks to their connection with private life. And such events are illuminated in the novel only insofar as they relate to private fates, their essence as purely social and political events remains outside the novel. Thus, the public and rhetorical unity of the human image is to be found in the contradiction between it and its purely private content. This contradiction is highly characteristic of the Greek romance. It is also characteristic as we will see below of several later rhetorical genres, in particular of autobiography. In general, the ancient world did not succeed in generating forms and unities that were adequate to the private individual and his life. Although personal life had already become private and persons individualized, although the sense of the private had begun to infiltrate literature in ancient times, still, it was able to develop forms adequate to itself only in the minor, lyrico-epic genres and in the small everyday genres, the comedy and novella of common life. In the major genres the private life of an individualized person was only externally and inadequately arrayed, and, therefore, in forms that were inorganic and formalistic, either public and bureaucratic or public and rhetorical. This public and rhetorical side of the individual, which is responsible for his unity and which he bears with him throughout his adventures, also has an external, formalistic and conventional nature in the Greek romance. In general, the homogenization of all that is heterogeneous in a Greek romance, in the history of its origins as well as in its essence as a genre, a homogenization that results in a huge, almost encyclopedic genre, is achieved only at the cost of the most extreme abstraction, schematization, and a denuding of all that is concrete and merely local. The chronotope of the Greek romance is the most abstract of all novelistic chronotopes. This most abstract of all chronotopes is also the most static. In such a chronotope the world and the individual are finished items, absolutely immobile. In it there is no potential for evolution, for growth, for change. As a result of the action described in the novel, nothing in its world is destroyed, remade, changed or created anew. What we get is a mere affirmation of the identity between what had been at the beginning and what is at the end. Adventure time leaves no trace. Such is the first type of ancient novel. We will have to return to isolated aspects of it in connection with the further development of methods for expressing time in the novel. As we have suggested above, this novelistic type, and several of its defining characteristics in particular, 
especially Adventure Time itself, exhibit great liveliness and flexibility in the subsequent history of the novel. 11 Apuleos and Petronius Let us now pass to the second type of ancient novel, which we will provisionally call the adventure novel of everyday life. In a strict sense only two works belong to this category, the Satyricon of Petronius, which has come down to us in comparatively few fragments, and the Golden Ass of Apuleius, which has survived in its entirety. But the characteristic features of this type occur in other genres as well, primarily in satires and in the Hellenistic diatribe, as well as in several works from early Christian literature on the lives of saints, a sinful life, filled with temptation, followed by crisis and rebirth. The key to our analysis of this second type of ancient novel is Apuleo's The Golden Ass. We will also mention some of the distinctive features of other surviving examples of this type. In this second type, what strikes us first of all is the mix of adventure time with everyday time a quality we sought to express in our provisional designation of the type as an adventure everyday novel. Of course a merely mechanical mix of these two different times is out of the question. Both adventure and everyday time change their essential forms in this combination, as they are subject to the conditions of the completely new chronotope created by this novel. Thus there emerges a new type of adventure time, one sharply distinct from Greek adventure time, one that is a special sort of everyday time. The plot I see Yuzet of the Golden Ass is in no sense an extra-temporal hiatus between two adjacent moments of real-life sequence. On the contrary, it is precisely the course of the hero's, Lucius, life in its critical moments that makes up the plot of the novel. But two special prerequisites are essential to the portrayal of this life, which define the peculiar nature of time in this novel. These prerequisites are, I, that the course of Lucius' life be given to us sheathed in the context of a metamorphosis, and, two, that the course of his life must somehow correspond to an actual course of travel, to the wanderings of Lucius throughout the world in the shape of an S. The basic plot of the novel The Life Story of Lucius is presented as the course of a life sheathed in a metamorphosis as is also the case in the inserted novella about Cupid and Psyche, which turns out to be a parallel semantic variant of the basic plot. The themes of metamorphosis, transformation particularly human transformation and identity, particularly human identity, are drawn from the treasury of pre-class world folklore. The folkloric image of man is intimately bound up with transformation and identity. This combination may be seen with particular clarity in the popular folk tale, Skazkaj. The folk tale image of man throughout the extraordinary variety of folkloric narratives always orders itself around the motifs of transformation and identity, no matter how varied in its turn the concrete expression of these motifs might be. The motifs of transformation and identity, which began as matters of concern for the individual, are transferred to the entire human world, and to nature, and to those things that man himself has created. We will discuss later those distinctive features of popular folktale time where this transformation identity motif is revealed in the image of man, in connection with Rabelais. In ancient times the idea of metamorphosis underwent an extremely complex and multi-branched path of development. One of the branches on this path is Greek philosophy, where the idea of transformation along with that of identity plays an enormous role, in fact the central mythological sheath of these ideas is retained as late as Democritus and Aristophanes, and even they did not succeed in casting it off completely. Another branch would be the cultic development of the idea of metamorphosis, transformation, in ancient mysteries, especially the Eleusinian mysteries. In the later stages of their development these ancient mysteries increasingly succumbed to the influence of oriental cults, which had their own specific forms of metamorphosis. The original forms of the Christian cult would be included in this line of development. We should also add to this group those crude magical forms of metamorphosis that were exceedingly widespread in the 1st and 2nd century AD, forms that were practiced by charlatans of various sorts and occupied a permanent place in the everyday life of the era. A third branch would be the continuing presence of transformation motifs in purely popular folklore. This folklore has not, of course, come down to us in its pure form, but we know of its existence through the influence it exercised, 
its reflection in literature, for example, in Apuleo's novella about Cupid and Psyche. And finally, a fourth branch is the development of the idea of metamorphosis in literature proper. Only this branch concerns us in the present context. It is of course obvious that the literary development of this idea did not take place in isolation from all those other forms that the theme assumed and that we have enumerated above. One need only mention the influence of the Eleusinian mystery tradition on Greek tragedy. Philosophical forms of transformation undoubtedly had an effect on literature, as did the influence of folklore referred to above. Metamorphosis or transformation is a mythological sheath for the idea of development but one that unfolds not so much in a straight line as spasmodically, a line with knots in it, one that therefore constitutes a distinctive type of temporal sequence. The makeup of this idea is extraordinarily complex, which is why the types of temporal sequences that develop out of it are extremely varied. If we look closely at the ways Hesiod, in both his works and days and his Theogony, took this complex mythological theme and with great artistry broke it down into a variety of sequences, we observe the following, a specific genealogical series unfolding, a distinctive sequence of shifts in ages and generations, the myth of the five ages, golden, silver, bronze, Trojan, or heroic and iron, an irreversible theogonic sequence of metamorphosis in nature, including the cyclical series of metamorphosis for grain and an analogical series of metamorphosis in the vine of the grape. What is more, for Hesiod even the cyclical sequence of everyday agricultural labor is structured, in its own way, like a metamorphosis of the farmer. With all the above we are still far from exhausting all the temporal sequences Hesiod generated that use the idea of metamorphosis as their mythological etiology. All these series have in common the fact of sequentiality, items that follow upon one another, but a sequentiality whose units assume extremely varied forms, or images, forms utterly different from one another. Thus, in the theogonic process the era of Zeus replaces the era of Kronos, as the ages change, golden, silver, etc., so do the generations of men, while in another series it is the seasons that replace each other. The images we are given of various eras, generations, seasons, and phases of agricultural labor differ profoundly from one another. But amid all this diversity the unity of the theogonic process, of the historical process, of nature, and of agricultural life is preserved. The conception of metamorphosis in Hesiod, as in other early philosophical systems and classical mysteries, has far-reaching implications, the word metamorphosis itself, in Hesiod, is not used in the specific sense of a miraculous, instantaneous transformation of one being into another, a definition bordering on the magical, this definition the word acquired only in the Roman and Hellenistic era. The word appeared with this meaning only at a later stage in the development of the metamorphosis theme. Ovid's Metamorphoses is typical of this later stage. Here the general idea of metamorphosis has already become the private metamorphosis of individual, isolated beings and is already acquiring the characteristics of an external, miraculous transformation. The idea of representing the whole world of cosmogonic and historical process from the point of view of metamorphosis beginning with the creation of the cosmos out of chaos and ending with the transformation of Caesar into a star is retained. But this idea is now actualized through a selection of metamorphoses taken from the whole of the mythological and literary tradition, of which separate instances are superficially vivid but without connection to one another. They are metamorphoses only in the narrower sense of the word, changes that are deployed in a series lacking any internal unity. Each such metamorphosis suffices unto itself and constitutes in itself a closed, poetic whole. The mythological sheath of metamorphosis is no longer able to unite those temporal sequences that are major and essential. Time breaks down into isolated, self-sufficient temporal segments that mechanically arrange themselves into no more than single sequences. One can observe this same disintegration of the mythological unity of ancient temporal sequences in Ovid's Fasti, a work of great importance for studying the sense of time in the Roman and Hellenistic era. In Apuleius, metamorphosis acquires an even more personal, isolated and quite openly magical nature. Almost nothing remains of its former breadth and force. 
metamorphosis has become a vehicle for conceptualizing and portraying personal, individual fate, a fate cut off from both the cosmic and the historical whole. Nevertheless, the idea of metamorphosis retains enough energy, thanks to the influence of an unmediated folklore tradition, to comprehend the entire lifelong destiny of a man, at all its critical turning points. Herein lies its significance for the genre of the novel. This is not the place for an in-depth analysis of the essence of the metamorphosis itself Lucius' transformation into an ass, his reverse transformation into a man and his mystical purification. Such an analysis is not necessary for our purposes. Furthermore, the genesis of the theme metamorphosis into an ass is itself very complex. Apuleo's treatment of the theme is also complex, and to this day it has not been fully explicated. For our immediate purposes all this is of no essential importance. We are concerned only with the functions of this metamorphosis in the structure of a novel of the second type. Metamorphosis serves as the basis for a method of portraying the whole of an individual's life in its more important moments of crisis, for showing how an individual becomes other than what he was. We are offered various sharply differing images of one and the same individual, images that are united in him as various epochs and stages in the course of his life. There is no evolution in the strict sense of the word, what we get, rather, is crisis and rebirth. This is what essentially distinguishes the Apulian plot from the plots of the Greek romance. The events that Apuleius describes determine the life of the hero, they define his entire life. But of course his entire life, from childhood through old age and death, is not laid out for us. This is not, therefore, a biographical life in its entirety. In the crisis type of portrayal we see only one or two moments that decide the fate of a man's life and determine its entire disposition. In keeping with this principle, the novel provides us with two or three different images of the same individual, images that have been disjoined and rejoined through his crisis and rebirths. In the major plot, Apuleius presents three images of Lucius, Lucius before his transformation into an ass, Lucius the ass and Lucius mysteriously purified and renewed. In the parallel plot we have only two images of Psyche, before she is purified by redemptive suffering, and after. But here the progression of the heroine's rebirth is not broken down into three sharply differentiated images of her, as in the case of Lucius. In early Christian crisis hagiographies belonging to this type, we also have as a rule only two images of an individual, images that are separated and reunited through crisis and rebirth, the image of the sinner, before rebirth, and the image of the holy man or saint, after crisis and rebirth. Three image sequences are sometimes met with, especially where there is a particular emphasis and development of that portion of the saint's life devoted to ascesis, or to purification through suffering, to a struggle with oneself, corresponding to the segment of time Lucius spends as an ass. From what has been said, it should be clear that a novel of this type does not, strictly speaking, unfold in biographical time. It depicts only the exceptional, utterly unusual moments of a man's life, moments that are very short compared to the whole length of a human life. But these moments shape the definitive image of the man, his essence, as well as the nature of his entire subsequent life. But the further course of that life, with its biographical pace, its activities and labors, stretches out after the rebirth and consequently already lies beyond the realm of the novel. Thus, Lucius, having passed through three initiations, enters upon his biographical life as a rhetorician and a priest. These, then, are the constitutive features of adventure time of the second type. It is not the time of a Greek romance, a time that leaves no traces. On the contrary, it leaves a deep and eradicable mark on the man himself as well as on his entire life. It is, nevertheless, decidedly adventure time, a time of exceptional and unusual events, events determined by chance, which, moreover, manifest themselves in fortuitous encounters, temporal junctures, and fortuitous non-encounters, temporal disjunctions. But in the second type of adventure time this logic of chance is subordinated to another and higher logic that contains it, in the literal sense. 
the witches made Photos accidentally took the wrong box and in place of a cream for transforming men into birds gave Lucius the cream for turning men into asses. It was an accident that at that moment the roses necessary to reverse this transformation were not to be found in the house. It was an accident that on that very night robbers attacked the house and drove away the ass. And in all subsequent adventures of the ass itself, and of its various masters as well, chance continues to play a major role. Time and again, it is chance that prevents the reverse transformation from ass back into man. But the power of chance and the initiative that lies with it is limited, it can act only within the limits of that area marked out for it. It is not chance but voluptuousness, youthful frivolity and prurient curiosity that urged Lucius onto that dangerous entanglement with witchcraft. He himself is guilty. He undoes the game of chance by his own prurience. The primary initiative, therefore, belongs to the hero himself and to his own personality. It is true that this initiative is not positive in a creative sense, but this is not very important, what we have is guilt, moral weakness, error, and in its Christian hagiographic variant, sin, as initiating forces. The first image of the hero is characterized by this negative initiative youthful, frivolous, unrestrained, a voluptuary, curious in a careless way. He attracts the power of chance to himself. The initial link of the adventure sequence is thus determined not by chance, but by the hero himself and by the nature of his personality. The final link the conclusion of the entire adventure sequence is likewise not determined by chance. Lucius is saved by the goddess Isis, who shows him what he must do to regain human form. The goddess Isis functions here not as a synonym for good fortune, as do the gods in a Greek romance, but as Lucius Patronus, directing him to his purification, demanding from him highly detailed purifying rituals and ascesis. Characteristically, visions and dreams have a very different meaning in Apuleius from what they had in a Greek romance. In the Greek romance, dreams and visions make men aware of the will of the gods or of chance, they could not be used as a means for avoiding the blows of fate or for taking measures against such a fate, but were granted rather that men may bear their sufferings more easily, Achilles Tadius. Dreams and visions, therefore, do not incite the heroes to any activity. In Apuleius, on the contrary, dreams and visions provide instructions to the heroes, telling them what to do, how to act in order to change their fate, that is, they force the heroes to take definite steps, to act. Thus both the initial and the final links in the chain of adventures lie beyond the power of chance. As a consequence the nature of the entire chain is altered. It becomes more active, it changes the hero himself and his fate. The series of adventures that the hero undergoes does not result in a simple affirmation of his identity, but rather in the construction of a new image of the hero, a man who is now purified and reborn. Therefore, the chance governing within the limits of separate adventures must be interpreted in a new way. In this connection, the speech delivered by the priest of Isis after Lucius' purification is characteristic, the golden ass, Bookiful M. Here you are, Lucius, after so many misfortunes sent you by fate, after having endured so many tempests, have you finally reached a peaceful haven, the altars of mercy. Neither your noble lineage, nor your position, nor learning itself in which you so excelled, could avail you, but because you had become a slave of voluptuousness, owing to the passion of your youthful years, you have received a fateful retribution for your prurient curiosity. But blind fate, tormenting you with the worst possible dangers, herself not knowing how, led you to your present blessedness. She must now go and rage somewhere else, she must seek out another victim on whom to practice her cruelty. For among those who have dedicated their lives to our supreme goddess there is no place for ruinous chance. How did subjecting you to thieves, to wild beasts, to slavery, to cruel choices at every turn, to a daily expectation of death benefit fate? For now another fate has taken you under her protection, one not blind but one who can see, and the light of her radiance illuminates even the other gods. What is emphasized here is Lucius' individual guilt, which delivered him over to the power of chance, blind fate. 
we also see a clear opposition of blind fate and ruinous chance to a seeing fate, that is, to the hegemony of the goddess who had saved Lucius. And here, finally, the essential meaning of blind fate is revealed to us, a fate whose power is limited on the one hand by Lucius' individual guilt and on the other by the power of a seeing fate, that is, the protection of the goddess. This essential meaning is contained in the fateful retribution and the path to present blessedness to which this blind fate, herself not knowing how, had led Lucius. Thus the entire adventure sequence must be interpreted as punishment and redemption. The adventure folktale sequence in the parallel subplot, the novella about Cupid and Psyche, is organized in precisely the same way. The individual guilt of Psyche serves as the initial link in the sequence, and the final link is the protection of the gods. Psyche's own adventures and folktale tribulations are interpreted as punishment and retribution. The role of chance, of blind fate, is here even more circumscribed and subordinated. Thus we see that the adventure sequence, governed as it is by chance, is here utterly subordinated to the other sequence that encompasses and interprets it, guilt punishment redemption dot blessedness. This sequence is governed by a completely different logic, one that has nothing to do with adventure logic. It is an active sequence, determining, as its first priority, the very metamorphosis itself, that is, the shifting appearance of the hero. Thus a frivolous and fecklessly curious Lucius beomes Lucius the ass, and after his suffering he becomes Lucius purified and enlightened. Furthermore, a definite shape and degree of ineluctability is essential to the sequence, whereas in the Greek adventure sequence there was no hint of either. Retribution must follow guilt, purification, and blessedness must follow upon the retribution of the hero. And furthermore, this ineluctability is human, it is not mechanical or depersonalized. Guilt is a function of individual personality itself, so is retribution, which is just as essential a force for purifying and improving the individual. This entire sequence is grounded in individual responsibility. Finally, the shifting appearance of one and the same individual gives the sequence its essential humanness. The above considerations demonstrate the indisputable advantages such a sequence has in comparison with Greek adventure time. Beginning with the purely mythological conception of metamorphosis, we have devised a means more legitimately to express some of the more critical and realistic characteristics of time. Here time is not merely technical, not a mere distribution of days, hours, moments that are reversible, transposable, unlimited internally, along a straight line, here the temporal sequence is an integrated and irreversible whole. And as a consequence, the abstractness so characteristic of Greek adventure time falls away. Quite the contrary, this new temporal sequence demands precisely concreteness of expression. But along with these progressive aspects some crucial limitations remain. As in a Greek romance, the individual is private and isolated. Therefore, his guilt, retribution, purification and blessedness are private and individual, it is the personal business of a discreet, particular individual. Such an individual's potential for initiating actions is, however, not creative, it is realized only negatively, in rash and hasty acts, in mistakes, in guilt. Therefore, the working of the entire sequence is limited by the particular shape of the individual and his fate. As in a Greek romance, this temporal sequence leaves no traces in the surrounding world. Therefore, the connection between an individual's fate and his world is external. The individual changes and undergoes metamorphosis completely independent of the world, the world itself remains unchanged. Therefore, metamorphosis has a merely personal and unproductive character. Thus, the basic temporal sequence of the novel although it is, as we have said, irreversible and integral is nevertheless a closed circuit, isolated, not localized in historical time, that is, it does not participate in the irreversible historical sequence of time, because the novel does not yet know such a sequence. Such is the basic adventure time of this type of novel. But everyday time is present in it as well. What is it like, and how does it mesh with that distinctive adventure time characterized by us above in such a way as to form one novelistic whole? 
The most characteristic thing about this novel is the way it fuses the course of an individual's life, at its major turning points, with his actual spatial course or road that is, with his wanderings. Thus is realized the metaphor the path of life. The path itself extends through familiar, native territory, in which there is nothing exotic, alien, or strange. Thus a unique novelistic chronotope is created, one that has played an enormous role in the history of the genre. At its heart is folklore. Various means for realizing the metaphor the path of life play a large role in all aspects of folklore. One can even go as far as to say that in folklore a road is almost never merely a road, but always suggests the whole, or a portion of, a path of life. The choice of a real itinerary equals the choice of the path of life. An intersection always signifies some turning point in the life of the folklore character, setting out on the road from one's birthplace, returning home, are usually plateaus of age in the life of the individual, he sets out as a youth returns a man. Road markers are indicators of his fate and so on. Thus this novelistic chronotope of the road is specific, organic, and deeply infused with folklore motifs. An individual's movement through space, his pilgrimages, lose that abstract and technical character that they had in the Greek romance, where it was merely a mannered and chaining of coordinates both spatial, near-slash-far, and temporal, at the same time-slash at different times. Space becomes more concrete and saturated with a time that is more substantial, space is filled with real, living meaning, and forms a crucial relationship with the hero and his fate. This type of space so saturates this new chronotope that such events as meeting, separation, collision, escape and so forth take on a new and markedly more concrete chronotopic significance. The concreteness of this chronotope of the road permits everyday life to be realized within it. But this life is, so to speak, spread out along the edge of the road itself, and along the side roads. The main protagonist and the major turning points of his life are to be found outside everyday life. He merely observes this life, meddles in it now and then as an alien force, he occasionally even dons a common and everyday mask but in essence he does not participate in this life and is not determined by it. The hero experiences events that are exclusively extraordinary, defined by the sequence of guilt retribution redemption blessedness. Such was the experience of Lucius. But in passing from retribution to redemption that is, precisely during the process of metamorphosis Lucius must descend to low everyday life, and he must play the most humiliating role in that setting, not even the role of a slave, but of an ass. As an ass, a beast of burden, he descends to the very depths of common life, life among muleteers, hauling a millstone for the miller, serving a gardener, a soldier, a cook, a baker. He suffers constant beatings and is persecuted by shrewish wives, the muleteer's wife, the baker's wife. But in all these situations Lucius performs not as Lucius but as an ass. At the end of the novel he casts off the appearance of an ass and in a triumphant ceremony re-enters the highest, most privileged spheres of life, a life outside ordinary events. We might add further that the time spent by Lucius in everyday life coincides with his presumed death, his family considers him dead, and his leaving that life is his resurrection. The ancient folkloric core of Lucius' metamorphosis is in fact precisely death, the passage to the nether regions and resurrection. In this instance everyday life corresponds to the nether regions, to the grave. Corresponding mythological equivalents might be found for all the narrative motifs in the Golden S. This stance of the hero vis a vis everyday life is a distinctive feature of this second type of ancient novel, and it is one of extreme importance. This feature is preserved, although of course with variations throughout the entire subsequent history of the type. It is always the case that the hero cannot, by his very nature, be a part of everyday life, he passes through such life as would a man from another world. Most often this hero is a rogue, a man who changes his everyday personalities as he pleases and who occupies no fixed place in everyday life, who plays with life and does not take it seriously. The hero might also be a wandering actor disguised as an aristocrat, or a highborn gentleman ignorant of his lineage, a foundling. 
Everyday life is that lowest sphere of existence from which the hero tries to liberate himself, and with which he will never internally fuse himself. The course of his life is uncommon, outside everyday life, one of its stages just happens to be a progression through the everyday sphere. Playing the lowest role in the lowest level of society, Lucius does not participate internally in that life and is, therefore, in an even better position to observe it and study all its secrets. For him this is the experience of studying and understanding human beings. I myself, says Lucius, remember my sojourn as an ass with great gratitude, for having suffered the turns of fate under cover of this animal's skin I have become, if not wiser, at least more experienced. The position of an ass is a particularly convenient one for observing the secrets of everyday life. The presence of an ass embarrasses no one, all open up completely. And in my oppressive life only one consolation remained to me, to indulge that curiosity which is my native bent, since people never took my presence into consideration and talked and acted as freely as they wished. Book 9. The ass has an additional advantage in this respect, his ears. And I although distraught at Photos mistake which had turned me into an ass instead of a bird found consolation in my pathetic transformation in this fact alone, that thanks to my huge ears I could hear excellently, even those things that happened far away, Book 9. This extraordinary positioning of the ass in the novel is a feature of extreme importance. The everyday life that Lucius observes and studies is an exclusively personal and private life. By its very nature there can be nothing public about it. All its events are the personal affairs of isolated people, they could not occur in the eyes of the world, publicly, in the presence of a chorus. These events are not liable to public reckoning on the open square. Events acquire a public significance as such only when they become crimes. The criminal act is a moment of private life that becomes, as it were, involuntarily public. The remainder of this life is made up of bedroom secrets, infidelities on the part of shrewish wives, husband's impotence, and so forth, secret profiteering, petty everyday fraud, etc. By its very nature this private life does not create a place for the contemplative man, for that third person who might be in a position to meditate on this life, to judge and evaluate it. This life takes place between four walls and for only two pairs of eyes. On the other hand public life any event that has any social significance tends toward making itself public, naturally, necessarily presuming an observer, a judge, an evaluator, and a place is always created for such a person in the event, he is in fact an indispensable and obligatory participant in the event. The public man always lives and acts in the world, and each moment of his life, in principle and in essence, will avail itself to being made public. Public life and public man are by their very essence open, visible, and audible. Public life adopts the most varied means for making itself public and accounting for itself, as does its literature. Therefore, the particular positioning of a person who could observe or eavesdrop on this life, a third person, presents no special problem, nor do the particular forms necessary for making that life public. For this reason the problem was unknown in classical ancient literature, which was a literature of public life and public men. But when the private individual and private life entered literature, in the Hellenistic era, these problems inevitably were bound to arise. A contradiction developed between the public nature of the literary form and the private nature of its content. The process of working out private genres began. But this process remained incomplete in ancient times. This problem was especially critical in connection with larger epic forms, the major epic. In the process of resolving this problem, the ancient novel emerged. The quintessentially private life that entered the novel at this time was, by its very nature and as opposed to public life, closed. In essence one could only spy and eavesdrop on it. The literature of private life is essentially a literature of snooping about, of overhearing how others live. This life may be exposed and made public in a criminal trial, either directly, by inserting the trial into the novel, along with searches and investigations, by inserting criminal activities into private life, or circumstantially and conditionally, in a half-hidden way, 
by utilizing eyewitness accounts, confessions of the accused, court documents, evidence, investigative hunches and so forth. And finally we encounter those forms of self-revelation that occur in the ordinary course of our everyday lives, the personal letter, the intimate diary, the confession. We have already seen how the Greek romance resolved this problem of portraying the personal life and the private individual. It tried to fit the content of a private life into external, inadequate public and rhetorical forms forms that were by that time already stiff and dead, this was possible only in the context of Greek adventure time and the extreme abstractness through which it was portrayed. In addition, on such a rhetorical basis the Greek romance introduces as well the criminal trial, as something that plays a crucial role in the novel. The Greek romance also frequently makes use of everyday forms such as the epistle. In the subsequent history of the novel, the criminal trial in its direct and oblique forms and legal criminal categories in general have an enormous organizational significance. Crimes play a correspondingly huge and significant role in the actual content of such novels. Various forms and varieties of the novel make use of these manifold legal and criminal categories in different ways. It suffices to mention, on the one hand, the adventure detective novel, the investigation, clues, piecing together of events with the help of these clues, and on the other hand, the novels of Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment and the Brothers Karamazov. The significance of legal criminal categories in the novel, and the various ways they are used as specific forms for uncovering and making private life public is an interesting and important problem in the history of the novel. The criminal aspect plays a large role in Apuleo's The Golden Ass. Several of the inserted novellas are structured precisely as stories about criminal acts, the 6th, 7th, 11th, and 12th novellas. But the criminal material itself is not essential for Apuleo's, what matters are the everyday secrets of private life that lay bare human nature that is, everything that can be only spied and eavesdropped upon. For the spying and eavesdropping on private life, the position of Lucius the Ass is most advantageous. For this reason, tradition has reinforced such a position, and we encounter it in a multitude of variations in the later history of the novel. What is preserved of the metamorphosis into ass is precisely the specific placement of the hero as a third person in relation to private everyday life, permitting him to spy and eavesdrop. Such is the positioning of the rogue and the adventurer, who do not participate internally in everyday life, who do not occupy in it any definite fixed place, yet who at the same time pass through that life and are forced to study its workings, all its secret cogs and wheels. This is particularly true of the positioning of the servant who goes from one master to the other. The servant is the eternal third man in the private life of his lords. Servants are the most privileged witnesses to private life. People are as little embarrassed in a servant's presence as they are in the presence of an ass, and at the same time the servant is called upon to participate in all intimate aspects of personal life. Thus, servants replace the ass in the later history of the adventure novel of the second type, that is, the adventure novel of everyday life. The picaresque novel, from Lazarillo de Tormes to Gil Blas, makes extensive use of the servant's role but other aspects and motifs from the golden ass live on in this classical, pure, picaresque novel first of all, they share the same chronotope. In a more complicated, no longer pure variant on the adventure novel of everyday life, the figure of the servant retreats into the background but his significance remains the same. And in other types of novels as well, indeed, in other genres too, the servant has the same essential significance, C.F. Diderot's Jacques L.E. Fatalist, Beaumarchais' Dramatic Trilogy and other works. The Servant is that distinctive, embodied point of view on the world of private life without which a literature treating private life could not manage. The prostitute and courtesan occupy a place in the novel analogous, in their functions, to that of the servant, C.F. for example, Defoe's Mal Flanders and Roxanne. Their position is likewise extremely convenient for spying and eavesdropping on private life with its secrets and intimacies. The procurer has the same significance in the novel, although he is a minor character, most often he functions as the storyteller. In The Golden Ass, for instance, 
the ninth inserted novella is narrated by an old procuress. I recall the magnificent story by an old procuress in Sorrel's Francien, almost equal to Balzac in the power with which it realistically portrays private life, and incomparably superior to analogous passages in Zola. Finally, as we have said, the adventurer, in the broad sense of the term, and in particular the parvenu fulfill analogous functions in the novel. The role of the adventurer and parvenu is the role of one who has not yet found a definite or fixed place in life, but who seeks personal success building a career, accumulating wealth, winning glory, always out of personal interest, for himself, this role impels him to study personal life, uncover its hidden workings, spy and eavesdrop on its most intimate secrets. And so he begins his journey to the depths, where he rubs shoulders with servants, prostitutes, pimps, and from them learns about life as it really is such a character can climb upward, usually via the courtesan route, and thus reach the high peaks of private life or can suffer a reversal on the road or can remain to the very end a lowly adventurer, an adventurer of the slum world. The position of such characters is admirably suited to exposing and portraying all layers and levels of private life. Thus, the role of the adventurer or the parvenu can be said to determine the structure of the more complicated type of adventure novels of everyday life, we have an adventurer, in the broad sense, in Sorrel's list war comique de Francien degree, although of course he is no parvenu, the heroes of Scarron's comical romance, 17th century, are likewise adventurers, Captain Singleton and Colonel Lack, the heroes of Defoe's picaresque novels, the word is used loosely, are also adventurers. Parvenus first appear with Mari Vox, L.E. Paysan Parvenu and adventurers with the heroes of Smollett. Rameau's nephew in Diderot embodies and distills in himself, in a wonderfully complete and profound way, all the specific attributes of an ass, a rogue, a tramp, a servant, an adventurer, a parvenu, an actor, he offers us a remarkably strong and deep example of the philosophy of the third person in private life. This is the philosophy of a person who knows only private life and craves it alone, but who does not participate in it, who has no place in it and therefore sees it in sharp focus, as a whole, in all its nakedness, playing out all its roles but not fusing his identity with any one of them. In the complex, synthesizing novel of the great French realists Stendhal and Balzac, the positioning of the adventurer and the parvenu retains in full its organizing significance. All kinds of other third-person representatives of private life courtesans, prostitutes, pimps, servants, clerks, pawnbrokers, doctors live and move in the background of their novels. In classic English realism Dickens and Thackeray the role of the adventurer and parvenu is less important. In their works such characters play secondary roles, the exception is Becky Sharp in Thackeray's Vanity Fair. I note in passing that in all the examples we have analyzed, the factor of metamorphosis is preserved, to a certain extent and in one or another form, the rogue's change of roles or masks, the transformation of the beggar into the rich man, the homeless tramp into the wealthy aristocrat, the thief and pickpocket into the kind and repentant Christian and so forth. In addition to the figures of rogue, servant, adventurer, pimp, the novel devised other means for spying and eavesdropping on private life and while these other means are at times very clever and subtle, they became neither typical nor essential to the genre as such. For example, the lame devil in Lesage, in his novel Le Diable Boitux, removes the roofs from houses and exposes personal life at those moments when a third person's presence would not be permitted. In Smollett's Peregrine Pickle the hero makes the acquaintance of the Englishman Cadwallader, a man who is completely deaf, in whose presence no one is embarrassed to speak on any topic whatever, as has been the case with Lucius the Ass, later on it turns out that Cadwallader is not deaf at all, but has only pretended to be so in order to eavesdrop on the secrets of private life. Such, then, is the extraordinarily important position Lucius the Ass occupies as an observer of private life. In what sort of time does this private life unfold? In The Golden Ass and other examples of the ancient adventure novel of everyday life, everyday time is in no sense cyclical. In general, such novels offer few instances of repetition as such, 
of a periodic return of one and the same features, phenomena. The only cyclical time known to ancient literature was an idealized, agricultural, everyday time, one interwoven with the times of nature and myth, the basic stages of its development are Hesiod, Theocritus and Virgil. Novelistic everyday time differs sharply from all these variants of cyclical time. First and foremost, novelistic time is thoroughly cut off from nature and from natural and mythological cycles. This alienation of the everyday plane from nature is actually emphasized. Nature motifs turn up in Apuleius only in the sequence Guilt Redemption Blessedness, cf., for example, the seashore scene before Lucius' return trip. Everyday life is the nether world, the grave, where the sun does not shine, where there is no starry firmament. For this reason, everyday life is presented to us as the underside of real life. At its center is obscenity, that is, the seamier side of sexual love, love alienated from reproduction, from a progression of generations, from the structures of the family and the clan. Here everyday life is priapic, its logic is the logic of obscenity. But around this sexual nucleus of common life, infidelity, sexually motivated murder, etc., are distributed other everyday aspects, violence, thievery, various types of fraud, beatings. In this everyday maelstrom of personal life, time is deprived of its unity and wholeness it is chopped up into separate segments, each encompassing a single episode from everyday life. The separate episodes and this is especially true of the inserted novellas dealing with everyday life are rounded off and complete, but at the same time are isolated and self-sufficient. The everyday world is scattered, fragmented, deprived of essential connections. It is not permeated with a single temporal sequence, which has its own specific systematization and ineluctability. These temporal segments of episodes from everyday life are, therefore, arranged, as it were, perpendicular to the pivotal axis of the novel, which is the sequence guilt.punishment redemption purification blessedness, precisely at the moment of punishment redemption. Everyday time is not parallel to this basic axis and not interwoven with it, but separate segments of this time those parts into which everyday time breaks down are perpendicular to this basic axis and intersect with it at right angles. Despite all the fragmentariness and naturalistic quality of this everyday time, it is not absolutely without effect. Taken as a whole it is perceived as a punishment that purifies Lucius, taken in its separate episodic moments it serves Lucius as experience, revealing to him human nature. The everyday world itself is static in Apuleos, it has no becoming, this is precisely the Arie sun why there is no single everyday time. But it does reveal social heterogeneity. Social contradictions have not yet become apparent in this heterogeneity, but the situation is fraught with them. If such contradictions were to surface, then the world would start to move, it would be shoved into the future, time would receive a fullness and a historicity. But this process was not brought to completion in ancient times, and certainly not with Apuleos. It is true that this process was advanced somewhat in Petronius. In his world, socially heterogeneous elements come close to being contradictory. As a result his world bears witness to the distinguishing features of a particular era, the earliest traces of historical time but in his works as well the process is nevertheless far from completed. The Satyricon of Petronius belongs, as we have already said, to the same type of everyday adventure novel. But in this work adventure time is tightly interwoven with everyday time, therefore, the Satyricon is closer to the European type of picaresque novel. Underlying the wanderings and adventures of its heroes, and Calpius and others, there is no clearly defined metamorphosis nor any specific sequence of guilt retribution dash. Redemption. This theme is replaced, it is true, by an analogous motif, persecution by the infuriated god Priapus although the motif is muffled and parroted, it is also a parody on the precedent-setting epic wanderings of Odysseus and Aeneas. But the location of the heroes vis a vis the everydayness of ordinary private life is in all respects the same as it was for Lucius the S. They pass through the everyday sphere of private life but do not participate internally in it. 
These rogues are spies, charlatans, and parasites, spying and eavesdropping on all the cynical aspects of private life. That life is here even more priapic. But, we repeat, traces of historical time, however unstable, turn up in the social heterogeneity of this private life world. The image of Trimalchio's feast and the way it is described serve to bring out the distinguishing features of the era, that is, we have to some extent a temporal whole that encompasses and unifies the separate episodes of everyday life. In hagiographic examples of the everyday type adventure, the factor of metamorphosis is foreground, a sinful life. Crisis redemption sainthood. The everyday plain adventure is given in the form of an exposure of a sinful life, or of a repentant confession. These forms and particularly the latter already border on a third type of ancient novel. 3. Ancient Biography and Autobiography Moving on to the third type of ancient novel, we must from the outset make one crucial reservation. By this third type we have in mind a biographical novel, although antiquity did not produce the kind of novel that we, in our terminology, would call a novel, that is, a large fiction influenced by biographical models. Nevertheless a series of autobiographical and biographical forms was worked out in ancient times that had a profound influence not only on the development of European biography, but also on the development of the European novel as a whole. At the heart of these ancient forms lies a new type of biographical time and a human image constructed to new specifications, that of an individual who passes through the course of a whole life. From the point of view made available by this type of time and new human image, we will briefly survey ancient autobiographical and biographical forms. In our survey we will not pretend to any completeness of the data, nor to an exhaustive analysis of it. We will select only those details that bear a direct relationship to our subject of inquiry. We know two essential types of autobiography in classical Greece. Provisionally we will call the first type Platonic, since it found its earliest and most precise expression in such works of Plato as the Apology of Socrates and the Phaedo. This type, involving an individual's autobiographical self-consciousness, is related to the stricter forms of metamorphosis as found in mythology. At its heart lies the chronotope of the life course of one seeking true knowledge. The life of such a seeker is broken down into precise and well-marked epochs or steps. His course passes from self-confident ignorance, through self-critical scepticism, to self-knowledge and ultimately to authentic knowing, mathematics and music. This early Platonic scheme of the seeker's path is made more complex in Hellenistic and Roman times by the addition of various highly important motifs, the seeker's passage through a series of philosophical schools with their various tests, and the marking of this path by temporal divisions determined by their own biographical projects. We will return later to this more complex scheme, for it is one of great importance. In the Platonic scheme there is also a moment of crisis and rebirth, the words of the oracle as a turning point in the course of Socrates' life. The specific nature of the seeker's path is all the more clearly revealed when contrasted with an analogous scheme, the course of the soul's ascent toward a perception of the forms, the symposium, the phaedra, and others. In such works the mythological and mystery cult bases of the scheme are clearly in evidence. Such sources reinforce the kinship between the scheme and those conversion stories we discussed in the previous section. Socrates' life course, as it is revealed to us in the Apology, is a public and rhetorical expression of the same metamorphosis. Real biographical time is here almost entirely dissolved in the ideal, and even abstract, time of metamorphosis. What is important about the figure of Socrates is therefore not to be found in this idealized biographical scheme. The second Greek type is the rhetorical autobiography and biography. At the base of this type lies the encomium the civic funeral and memorial speech that had replaced the ancient lament, Trenos. The form of the encomium also determined the first autobiography of ancient times, the advocatory speech of the Attic orator Isocrates. When speaking of this classic type one must above all keep the following in mind. These classical forms of autobiography and biography were not works of a literary or bookish nature, kept aloof from the concrete social and political act of noisily making themselves public. On the contrary, 
such forms were completely determined by events, either verbal praise of civic and political acts, or real human beings giving a public account of themselves. Therefore, the important thing here is not only, and not so much, their internal chronotope, that is, the time-space of their represented life, as it is rather, and preeminently, that exterior real-life chronotope in which the representation of one's own or someone else's life is realized either as verbal praise of a civic political act or as an account of the self. It is precisely under the conditions of this real-life chronotope, in which one's own or another's life is laid bare, that is, made public, that the limits of a human image and the life it leads are illuminated in all their specificity. This real-life chronotope is constituted by the public square, the agora. In ancient times the autobiographical and biographical self-consciousness of an individual and his life was first laid bare and shaped in the public square. When Pushkin said that the art of the theater was born in the public square, the square he had in mind was that of the common people, the square of bazaars, puppet theaters, taverns, that is the square of European cities in the 13th, 14th, and subsequent centuries. He also had in mind the fact that the state and official society, that is, the privileged classes, with their official arts and sciences, were located by and large beyond the square. But the square in earlier, ancient, times itself constituted a state, and more it constituted the entire state apparatus, with all its official organs, it was the highest court, the whole of science, the whole of art, the entire people participated in it. It was a remarkable chronotope, in which all the most elevated categories, from that of the state to that of revealed truth, were realized concretely and fully incarnated, made visible and given a face. And in this concrete and as it were all-encompassing chronotope, the laying bare and examination of a citizen's whole life was accomplished, and received its public and civic stamp of approval. It is fully understandable that in such a biographized individual, in such an image of a man, there was not, nor could there be, anything intimate, or private, secret or personal, anything relating solely to the individual himself, anything that was, in principle, solitary. Here the individual is open on all sides, he is all surface, there is in him nothing that exists for his sake alone, nothing that could not be subject to public or state control and evaluation. Everything here, down to the last detail, is entirely public. It is fully understandable that under such conditions there could not in principle be any difference between the approach one took to another's life and to one's own, that is, between the biographical and autobiographical points of view. Only later, in the Hellenistic and Roman era, when the public unity of the individual began to disintegrate, did Tacitus, Plutarch and various rhetoric eons specifically pose the question, is it permissible to write an appraisal of one's own self? This question was resolved in the affirmative. Plutarch, by selecting material going back to Homer, whose heroes glorified themselves, established the permissa hill ity of self-glorification and indicated those forms by which it should be molded, so as to avoid anything offensive. A second-rank rhetorician, Aristides, likewise sorted through a wide body of material on this question and concluded that proud self-glorification was a pure Hellenistic trait, and as such was fully permissible and correct. But it is highly significant that such a question should arise at all. Self-glorification, after all, is but the most sharply focused, most vivid distinctive feature of a biographical and autobiographical approach to life. Thus there lurks beneath the specific question of the propriety of glorifying oneself a more general question, namely, the legitimacy of taking the same approach to one's own life as to another's life, to one's own self as to another self. The very posing of such a question is evidence that the classical public wholeness of an individual had broken down, and a differentiation between biographical and autobiographical forms had begun but there could be no talk of such a differentiation under the conditions of the Greek public square, where the self-consciousness of the individual originated. There was as yet no internal man, no man for himself, I for myself, nor any individualized approach to one's own self. An individual's unity and his self-consciousness were exclusively public. Man was completely on the surface, 
in the most literal sense of the word. This utter exteriority is a very important feature of the human image as we find it in classical art and literature. It manifests itself in many ways, and by the most varied means. I will mention here only one familiar example. Already by Homer's time, Greeks as reflected in their literature were individuals who behaved in a most unrestrained manner. Homer's heroes express their feelings vividly and noisily. We are particularly struck by how often and how loudly they sob and weep. In the familiar scene with Priam, Achilles weeps so noisily in his tent that his moans are heard throughout the entire Greek camp. This trait has been variously explained, it has been attributed to the peculiarities of a primitive psychology, to the arbitrary prerequisites of literary canon, to the particular nature of Homer's language in which varying degrees of emotion could be transmitted only by indicating the varying degrees of its external expression, or allusion is sometimes made to general relativity of methods for expressing emotions, it is well known, for instance, that people of the 18th century the rational men of the Enlightenment themselves wept often and willingly. But what is important is the fact that this is not an isolated feature in the ancient hero, it fits harmoniously with his other features and is rooted in a principle that is larger than is usually supposed. This feature is but one manifestation of that complete exteriority of public man we have been discussing. For the classical Greek, every aspect of existence could be seen and heard. In principle, in essence, he did not know an invisible and mute reality. This applied to existence as a whole, but preeminently to human existence. A mute internal life, a mute grief, mute thought, were completely foreign to the Greek. All this that is, his entire internal life could exist only if manifested externally in audible or visible form. Plato, for example, understood thought as a conversation that a man carries on with himself, the Theaetetus, the Sophist. The concept of silent thought first appeared only with the mystics, and this concept had its roots in the Orient. Moreover, in Plato's understanding of the process, thought conceived as a conversation with oneself did not entail any special relationship to oneself, as distinct from one's relationship to others, conversation with one's own self turns directly into conversation with someone else, without a hint of any necessary boundaries between the two. There is no mute or invisible core to the individual himself, he is entirely visible and audible, all on the surface. But in general there are no mute or invisible spheres of existence either, of the sort in which a man might take part and by which he might be shaped, the platonic realm of forms is thoroughly visible and audible. To locate the basic controlling nodes of human life in centers that are mute and invisible was even further from the classical Greek worldview. This is the defining characteristic of the remarkable and immediate exteriority we find in the classical individual and in his life. It is only with the Hellenistic and Roman epochs that we have the beginnings of a translation of whole spheres of existence within the individual himself, as well as in the world outside him onto a mute register, and into something that is in principle invisible. But this process was also far from completed in ancient times. It is significant that even today one cannot read St. Augustine's Confessions to oneself, it must be declaimed aloud to such an extent is the spirit of the Greek public square still alive in it, that square upon which the self-consciousness of European man first coalesced. When we speak of the utter exteriority of Greek man we do so, of course, from our own point of view. It is precisely our distinction between internal and external which the Greek did not know, therefore he did not acknowledge the categories mute and invisible. Our internal was, for the Greeks' conception of man, laid out on the same axis as our external, that is, it was just as visible and audible and it existed on the surface, for others as well as for oneself. Therefore, all aspects of the human image were related to one another. But this utter exteriority of the individual did not exist in empty space, under a starry sky, on the bare earth, but rather in an organic human collective, in the folk. For that reason the surface, on which the entire man existed and was laid bare, was not something alien and cold, the desert of the world, it was his own native folk. To be exterior meant to be for others, for the collective, for one's own people. 
a man was utterly exteriorized, but within a human element, in the human medium of his own people. Therefore, the unity of a man's externalized wholeness was of a public nature. This explains the unrepeatable distinctiveness of the human image in classical art and literature. In it, everything corporeal and external is made more high-spirited and intense, while everything that is, from our point of view, spiritual and internal is made corporeal and externalized. This image had neither core nor shell, neither an inner nor an outer, and was similar to nature as Goethe saw it, it was in fact just this image that provided the earth phenomenon. In this it differs profoundly from the concept of man held in succeeding epochs. In following epochs, man's image was distorted by his increasing participation in the mute and invisible spheres of existence. He was literally drenched in muteness and invisibility. And with them entered loneliness. The personal and detached human being Dash the man who exists for himself lost the unity and wholeness that had been a product of his public origin. Once having lost the popular chronotope of the public square, his self-consciousness could not find an equally real, unified and whole chronotope, it therefore broke down and lost its integrity, it became abstract and idealistic. A vast number of new spheres of consciousness and objects appeared in the private life of the private individual that were not, in general, subject to being made public, the sexual sphere and others, or were subject only to an intimate, conditional, closeted expression. The human image became multi-layered, multifaceted. A core and a shell, an inner and an outer, separated within it. We will show below that the most remarkable experiment to re-establish the fully exteriorized individual in world literature although without the stylization of the ancient model was made by Rabelais. Another attempt to resurrect the ancient wholeness and exteriority, but on an entirely different basis, was made by Goethe. But let us return to the Greek encomium and the first autobiography. As we have analyzed it, the defining characteristic of the ancient world's peculiar consciousness of self was the fact that biographical and autobiographical approaches to life were identical, and were, therefore, both necessarily public. But in the encomium the image of man is extremely simple and preformed, in it there is almost no quality of becoming. The starting point for an encomium is the idealized image of a definite life type, a specific profession that of military commander, ruler, political figure. This idealized form is nothing but an accumulation of all the attributes adhering to a given profession, a commander should be like this, followed by an enumeration of all the qualities and virtues of a commander. All these idealized qualities and virtues are then discovered in the life of the man being eulogized. The ideal is fused together with the figure of the deceased. The figure of the eulogized man is one that is already formed, and the figure is usually given us at the moment of its greatest maturity and fullness of life. It was on the basis of biographical schemes developed for the encomium that the first autobiography arose, in the form of an advocatory oration, the autobiography of Isocrates, which was to have an enormous influence on all of world literature, and especially on Italian and English humanists. This was a public accounting of a man's own life, in the form of an apologia. Human image in such a form was shaped by the same principles as shaped the image of the deceased in the encomium. At its heart was the ideal of a rhetorician. Isocrates glorifies rhetorical activity as the loftiest of life's activities. Isocrates' professional self-consciousness is fully particularized. He gives us the details of his material circumstances, even mentioning how much money he makes as a rhetorician. Elements which are, from our point of view, purely personal, or, again from our point of view, narrowly professional, or matters relating to society and the state, or even philosophical ideas, are all laid out in one detailed series, tightly interwoven. All these elements are perceived as completely homogeneous, and they come together to form a single human image that is both complete and fully formed. The individual's consciousness of himself in such cases relies exclusively upon those aspects of his personality and his life that are turned outward, that exist for others in the same way they exist of the individual himself, in those aspects alone can self-consciousness seek its support and integrity, it knows of no aspects other than these, 
aspects that might be intimately personal, unrepeatably individual, charged with self. Such is the normative and pedagogical character of this earliest autobiography. At its conclusion a formative and educational moral is baldly stated. But this same normative and pedagogical quality suffuses the entire autobiography. One must not forget, however, that the epoch that produced the first autobiography witnessed as well the initial stages in the breakdown of the Greek public wholeness of the human image, a wholeness that had manifested itself in epic and tragedy. Thus, this autobiography is still somewhat formal, rhetorical, and abstract. Another real-life chronotope is responsible for Roman autobiographies and memoirs. Both sprang from the soil of the Roman family. Such autobiographies are documents testifying to a family clan consciousness of self. But on such family clan soil, autobiographical self-consciousness does not become private or intimately personal. It retains a deeply public character. The Roman patrician family which was not a bourgeois family is the symbol for all that can be private and intimate. The Roman family, precisely as a family, fuses directly with the state. Certain functions the state usually fulfills are entrusted to the heads of families. The religious cults of the family or clan, whose role was enormous, function as a direct extension of the cults of the state. The national ideal is represented by ancestors. Self-consciousness organizes itself around the particularized memory of a clan and ancestors, while at the same time looking toward future descendants. The traditions of the family and clan had to be passed down from father to son. Thus every family had its own archive, in which written documents on all links in the clan were kept. Autobiography writes itself in the orderly process of passing clan and family traditions from link to link, and these were preserved in the archive. This made even autobiographical consciousness public and historical, national. The specific historicity that Rome gave to autobiographical self-consciousness distinguishes it from its Greek counterpart, which was oriented toward living contemporaries, toward those who were actually there on the public square. Roman self-consciousness felt itself to be primarily a link between, on the one hand, deceased ancestors, and on the other, descendants who had not yet entered political life. Such self-consciousness is thus not as preformed as in the Greek model, but it is more thoroughly saturated with time. Another specific peculiarity of Roman autobiography, and biography, is the role of the protege, that is, of various auguries and their interpretations. In this context they are not an external feature of the narrative, as they become in 17th century novels, but an important means for motivating and shaping autobiographical material. Tightly tied up with them is the important, and purely Roman, autobiographical category of fortune, fortuna. In the protege, that is, in the auguries of a man's fate his separate acts and undertakings as well as his life as a whole individualized and personal elements indissolubly fuse with state and public elements. The protege are an important moment at the beginning and at the completion of all state acts and undertakings, the state takes no step without having first read the omens. The protege are indicators of the fate of the state, predicting for it either fortune or misfortune. From the state level they move to the individual personality of the dictator or military commander, whose fate is indissolubly bound up with the destinies of the state, and readings of the protege for the state fuse with his personal destiny. The dictator of the lucky arm, Sulla, and of the lucky star, Caesar, appear. In this context the category of luck has a distinctive life-shaping significance. It becomes the form for expressing a personal identity and the course of a whole life, faith in one's own star. Such is the origin of Sulla's consciousness of self in his autobiography. But, we repeat, in the good fortune of a Sulla or a Caesar, the destinies of the state and of single persons fuse into a single whole. There can be no question of anything narrowly personal, any private luck. This is, after all, a luck measured in deeds, in projects of state, in wars. This good fortune is absolutely inseparable from deeds, creative activity, labor from objective, public and state-oriented content. Thus this concept of good fortune includes as well our concepts of talent, 
intuition and that specific understanding of genius that was so important in the philosophy and aesthetics of the late 18th century, Young, Hammond, Herder, the Sturmer, and Dranger. In succeeding centuries this category of good fortune became more fragmented and private. Good fortune lost all its creative, public and state attributes and came to represent a principle that was private, personal, and one that was ultimately unproductive. Hellenistic Greek autobiographical traditions functioned alongside these specifically Roman ones. In Rome the ancient laments, Nania, were likewise replaced by funeral speeches, the so-called Laodicei. Here Greek and Hellenistic rhetorical schemas reigned supreme. Works on one's own writings emerged as an authentic autobiographical form in the Roman Hellenistic context. As we have shown above, this form reflected the crucial influence of the Platonic schema, that of the life course of a seeker after knowledge. But an entirely different objective support was found for it in this new context. What we get is a catalogue of a man's works, an exposition of their themes, a record of their successes with the public, autobiographical commentary on them, Cicero, Galen, and others. It is the sequence of one's own works that provides solid support for perceiving the passage of time in one's own life. The continuity of one's works provides a critical sequential marker for biographical time, its objectification. And furthermore, consciousness of self in this context is not revealed to some general someone, but rather to a specific circle of readers, the readers of one's works. The autobiography is constructed for them. The autobiographical concentration on oneself and one's own life acquires here a certain minimum of essential publicness, but of 7. In this concept of luck, the ideas of genius and success are fused together, thus an unrecognized genius was a contradictionary in adjecto, a contradiction in terms. A completely new type. Saint Augustine's retractationes belong to this autobiographical type. In more recent times a whole series of humanistic works, for example, Chaucer, could be included in this type, but in later periods this type is reduced to a single stage, albeit very important, in artistic biographies, for example, in Goethe. Such are the types of ancient autobiography, which might all be called forms for depicting the public self-consciousness of a man. We will briefly touch upon the mature biographical forms of the Roman Hellenistic epoch. Here one must note, first and foremost, the influence of Aristotle on the distinctive methods of the ancient biographers, and in particular his doctrine of Ent Lechei as the ultimate purpose of development that is at the same time its first cause. This Aristotelian identification of ultimate purpose with origin inevitably had a crucial effect on the distinctive nature of biographical time. From here it follows that a character at its most mature is the authentic origin of development. It is here that we get that unique inversion in a character's development that excludes any authentic becoming in character. A man's entire youth is treated as nothing but a preliminary to his maturity. The familiar element of movement is introduced into biography solely as a struggle of opposing impulses, as fits of passion or as an exercise in virtue in order to invest this virtue with permanence. Such struggles and exercises serve to strengthen qualities of character that are already present, but create nothing new. The base remains the stable essence of an already completed character. Two models for structuring ancient biography were created on this base. The first may be called the energetic type. At its heart lies the Aristotelian concept of energia, the full existence, the essence of a man is realized not by his condition, but by his activity his active force, energy. This energy manifests itself as the unfolding of his character in deeds and statements. And these acts, words, and other expressions of a man are not merely external manifestations, that is, for others, for a third person, of some internal essence of character existing apart from its effects, predating them and located outside them. The manifestations themselves constitute the character's being, which outside its energy simply does not exist. Apart from its surface manifestations, its ability to express itself, its visibility and audibility, character possesses no fullness of reality, no fullness of being. The greater the power of self-expression, the fuller the being. Therefore human life, 
BIOS, and character may no longer be portrayed by means of an analytical enumeration of the characterological qualities of the man, his vices and virtues, and through their unification into a single stable image of him but rather, one must portray him by means of his deeds, his speeches and other extensions and expressions of the man. This energetic type of biography was first established by Plutarch, who has had an enormous influence on world literature, and not only on biography. Biographical time in Plutarch is specific. It is a time that discloses character, but is not at all the time of a man's becoming or growth. It is true that outside this disclosure, this manifestation, there is no character but in keeping with the principle of Ent Lecce, character is predetermined and may be disclosed only in a single defined direction. Historical reality itself, in which disclosure of character takes place, serves merely as a means for the disclosure, it provides in words and deeds a vehicle for those manifestations of character, but historical reality is deprived of any determining influence on character as such, it does not shape or create it, it merely manifests it. Historical reality is an arena for the disclosing and unfolding of human characters nothing more. Biographical time is not reversible vis a vis the events of life itself, which are inseparable from historical events. But with regard to character, such time is reversible, one or another feature of character, taken by itself, may appear earlier or later. Features of character are themselves excluded from chronology, their instancing can be shifted about in time. Character itself does not grow, does not change, it is merely filled in, at the beginning it is incomplete, imperfectly disclosed, fragmentary, it becomes full and well-rounded only at the end. Consequently, the process of disclosing character does not lead to a real change or becoming in historical reality, but rather solely to a fulfillment, that is, to a filling in of that form sketched at the very outset. Such is the Plutarchian biographical type. The second type of biography may be called analytic. At its heart we have a scheme with well-defined rubrics, beneath which all biographical material is distributed, social life, family life, conduct in war, relationships with friends, memorable sayings, virtues, vices, physical appearance, habits, and so forth. Various features and qualities of character are selected out from the various happenings and events that occur at different times in the hero's life, but these are arranged according to the prescribed rubrics. To prove the rubric valid, only one or two examples from the life of a given personality need be provided. In this way, the temporal progression of the biographical sequence is broken up, one and the same rubric subs ums moments selected from widely separate periods of a life. Here as well, what governs from the outset is the whole of the character, and from such a point of view time is of no importance at all, nor is the order in which various parts of this whole make their appearance. From the very first strokes, the first manifestations of character, the firm contours of the whole are already predetermined, and everything that comes later distributes itself within these already existing contours in the temporal order, the first, energetic Plutarchian type, as well as in the systematic, the second, atemporal, type. The major representative of this second ancient type of biography was Suetonius. If Plutarch had exercised a profound influence on literature, especially on the drama, for the energetic type of biography is essentially dramatic, then Suetonius primarily influenced the narrowly biographical genre, particularly during the Middle Ages. Biography structured by rubrics survives to our very day, the biography of a human being, a writer, a family man, an intellectual and so forth. The forms that we have mentioned so far, autobiographical as well as biographical, and there was no distinction, in principle, between the approaches toward the individual adopted by each, had an essentially public character. We must now touch upon those autobiographical forms in which the breakdown of this public exteriority of a man is already evident, where the detached and singular individual's private self-consciousness begins to force itself through and bring to the surface the private spheres of his life. In the area of autobiography as well, we get in ancient times only the beginning of the process by which a man and his life become private. 
new forms for autobiographical expression of a singular self-consciousness were therefore not developed. Instead there ensued merely specific modifications of already available public and rhetorical forms. We will note three basic kinds of modifications. The first modification consists of a satirico-ironic or humorous treatment, in satires and diatribes, of oneself and one's life. Special note should be taken of the familiar ironic autobiographies and self-characterizations in verse by Horace, Ovid, and Propertius, which include an element of the parodying of public and heroic forms. Here personal and private topics, unable to find a positive form for their expression, are clothed in irony and humor. A second modification, and one that has had important historical resonance, is represented by Cicero's letters to Atticus. Public and rhetorical forms expressing the unity of the human image had begun to ossify, had become official and conventional, heroization and glorification, as well as self-glorification, were felt to be stereotyped and stilted. Moreover, the available public and rhetorical genres could not by their very nature provide for the expression of life that was private, a life of activity that was increasingly expanding in width and depth and retreating more and more into itself. Under such conditions the forms of drawing-room rhetoric acquired increasing importance, and the most significant form was the familiar letter. In this intimate and familiar atmosphere, one that was, of course, semi-conventionalized, a new private sense of self, suited to the drawing-room, began to emerge. A whole series of categories involving self-consciousness and the shaping of a life into a biography success, happiness, merit began to lose their public and state significance and passed over to the private and personal plane. Even nature itself, drawn into this new private and drawing room world, begins to change in an essential way. Landscape is born, that is, nature conceived as horizon, what a man sees, and as the environment, the background, the setting, for a completely private, singular individual who does not interact with it. Nature of this kind differs sharply from nature as conceived in a pastoral idol or Georgic to say nothing of nature in an epic or tragedy. Nature enters the drawing room world of private individuals only as picturesque remnants, while they are taking a walk, or relaxing or glancing randomly at the surrounding view. These picturesque remnants are woven together in the unstable unity of a cultured Roman's private life, but they did not come together to form a single, powerful, animating independent nature complex, such as we see in epic or in tragedy, nature as it functions in Prometheus bound, for instance. These picturesque remnants can exist only in the isolation created by closed verbal landscapes that surround them. Other categories as well undergo analogous transformations in this new little private drawing room world. Numerous petty details of private life begin to take on an importance, in them, the individual feels himself at home, his private sense of self begins to take its bearings from these petty details. The human begins to shift to a space that is closed and private, the space of private rooms where something approaching intimacy is possible, where it loses its monumental formedness and exclusively public exteriority. Such is the characteristic space of the letters to Atticus. There is, nevertheless, a great deal in them that is still public and rhetorical, conventionalized and ossified as well as much that is still vital and dynamic. It is as if the old public and rhetorical unity of the human image had been drenched with fragments of a future, thoroughly private man. The third and final modification we will call the Stoic type of autobiography. First and foremost, we must include in this group the so-called consolations, consolations. These consolations were constructed in the form of a dialogue with philosophy the consoler. For our first example, one which has not survived, we must take the consolatio of Cicero, which he wrote after the death of his daughter. Cicero's Hortensius belongs here as well. In succeeding epochs we meet such consolations in Augustine, Boethius, and finally in Petrarch. We must also include in this third modification Seneca's letters, Marcus Aurelius' autobiographical book, To Myself, and, finally, the Confessions and other autobiographical works of St. Augustine. Typical of all the above-named works is the advent of a new form for relating to oneself. 
One might best characterize this new relationship by using Augustine's term soliloquia, that is, solitary conversations with oneself. Conversations with philosophy The consoler in the consolations are, of course, also examples of such solitary conversations. This is a new relationship to one's own self, to one's own particular I with no witnesses, without any concessions to the voice of a third person, whoever it might be. Here the self-consciousness of a solitary individual seeks support and more authoritative reading of its fate in its own self, without mediation, in the sphere of ideas and philosophy. There is even a place here for struggle with another's point of view for example, in Marcus Aurelius. The point of view that another takes toward use which we take into account, and by which we evaluate ourselves functions as the source of vanity, vain pride, or as the source of offense. It clouds our self-consciousness and our powers of self-evaluation, we must free ourselves from it. Another distinctive feature of this third modification is a sharp increase in the weight of events pertaining to one's own personal and intimate life, events enormously important in the private life of a given individual have no importance at all for others, and almost no larger social or political significance for example, the death of a daughter, in Cicero's Consolatio, in such events a man feels himself to be preeminently alone. In events that have a public significance, however, the personal side of these events now begins to be accentuated. As part of this process, such issues as the transitoriness of all that is good, man's mortality, become very prominent, in general, the theme of personal death, and diverse variants on that theme, begins to play a crucial role in an individual's autobiographical self-consciousness, in public self-consciousness its role had been, of course, reduced almost to zero. Despite these new features, even this third modification remains to a significant extent public and rhetorical. There is, as yet, nothing of that authentically solitary individual who makes his appearance only in the Middle Ages and henceforth plays such an enormous role in the European novel. Solitude, here, is still a very relative and naive thing. A sense of self is still rooted firmly in the public sphere, although this influence is well on the way to being ossified. The very Marcus Aurelius who excluded another's point of view, in his struggle to overcome his sensitivity to insult, is, nevertheless, filled with a profound respect for his own public dignity, and he is haughtily grateful to fate and to other men for his virtues. And the very form assumed by autobiography in this third modification bears a public and rhetorical stamp. We have already said that even Augustine's confessions require a noisy declamation. Such are the basic forms of ancient autobiography and biography. They were to exercise enormous influence on the development of similar forms in European literature, as well as on the development of the novel. For the problem of historical inversion and the folkloric chronotope, in concluding our survey of ancient forms of the novel, we will note some general characteristics of the methods used to express time in these works. How is the fullness of time treated in the ancient novel? We have already seen that in any temporal representation some minimum sense of time's fullness is inevitable, and literature's primary mode of representation is temporal. Moreover, there can be no question of reflecting an epoch outside of the passage of time, outside any contact with past or future, outside time's fullness. Where there is no passage of time there is also no moment of time, in the full and most essential meaning of the word. If taken outside its relationship to past and future, the present loses its integrity, breaks down into isolated phenomena and objects, making of them a mere abstract conglomeration. Even the ancient novel had a certain minimum fullness of time peculiar to it alone. Such time is, so to speak, minimal in the Greek novel, and only slightly more important in the adventure novel of everyday life. In the ancient novel, this fullness of time has a dual character. In the first place, its roots are in a popular and mythological understanding of time's fullness. But these fixed, temporal forms were already in decay and, under conditions of sharp social differentiation beginning to be felt at that time, they could not of course incorporate and adequately shape new content. But these folkloric forms for expressing the fullness of time nevertheless functioned in the ancient novel. 
On the other hand, the ancient novel also contained the feeble first efforts at new forms for expressing time's fullness forms related to the uncovering of social contradictions. Every such uncovering inevitably pushes time into the future. The more profoundly these contradictions are uncovered and the riper they become in consequence, the more authentic and comprehensive becomes time's fullness as the artist represents it. We have seen the first beginnings of such a real-life unity of time in the adventure novel of everyday life. But these first efforts were too feeble to stave off the collapse of the major epic forms into novelness. Here it is imperative to pause on a distinctive feature of that feeling for time that exercised an enormous and determining influence on the development of literary forms and images. This distinctive feature manifests itself preeminently in what might be called a historical inversion. The essence of this inversion is found in the fact that mythological and artistic thinking locates such categories as purpose, ideal, justice, perfection, the harmonious condition of man and society and the like in the past. Myths about paradise, a golden age, a heroic age, an ancient truth, as well as the later concepts of a state of nature, of natural, innate rights and so on, are all expressions of this historical inversion. To put it in somewhat simplified terms, we might say that a thing that could and in fact must only be realized exclusively in the future is here portrayed as something out of the past, a thing that is in no sense part of the past's reality, but a thing that is in its essence a purpose, an obligation. This peculiar transpositioning, this inversion of time typical of mythological and artistic modes of thought in various eras of human development, is characterized by a special concept of time, and in particular of future time. The present and even more the past are enriched at the expense of the future. The force and persuasiveness of reality, of real life, belong to the present and the past alone to the is and the was and to the future belongs a reality of a different sort, one that is more ephemeral, a reality that when placed in the future is deprived of that materiality and density, that real life weightiness that is essential to the is and was. The future is not homogeneous with the present and the past, and no matter how much time it occupies it is denied a basic concreteness, it is somehow empty and fragmented since everything affirmative, ideal, obligatory, desired has been shifted, via the inversion, into the past, or partly into the present, en route, it has become weightier, more authentic, and persuasive. In order to endow any ideal with authenticity, one need only conceive of its once having existed in its natural state in some golden age, or perhaps existing in the present but somewhere at the other end of the world, east of the sun and west of the moon, if not on earth then underground, if not underground then in heaven. There is a greater readiness to build a superstructure for reality, the present, along a vertical axis of upper and lower than to move forward along the horizontal axis of time. Should these vertical structurings turn out as well to be otherworldly, idealistic, eternal, outside time, then this extra-temporal and eternal quality is perceived as something simultaneous with a given moment in the present, it is something contemporaneous, and that which already exists is perceived as better than the future, which does not yet exist and which never did exist. From the point of view of a present reality, historical inversion, in the strict sense of the word, prefers the past which is more weighty, more fleshed out to such a future. And these vertical, otherworldly structurings prefer to such a past that which is eternal and outside time altogether, yet which functions as if it were indeed real and contemporary. In its own way each of these forms empties out the future, dissects and bleeds it white, as it were. The historical inversion in philosophical structures is characterized by a corresponding assumption of beginnings as the crystal clear, pure sources of all being, of eternal values and modes of existence that are ideal and outside time. Another form that exhibits a like relationship to the future is eschatology. Here the future is emptied out in another way. The future is perceived as the end of everything that exists, as the end of all being, in its past and present forms. In this respect it makes no difference at all whether the end is perceived as catastrophe and destruction pure and simple, as a new chaos, as a twilight of the gods, as the advent of God's kingdom it matters only that the end affect everything that exists, and that this end be, moreover, relatively close at hand. 
Eschatology always sees the segment of a future separating the present from the end as lacking value, this separating segment of time loses its significance and interest, it is merely an unnecessary continuation of an indefinitely prolonged present. Such are the specific characteristics of a mythological and literary relationship to the future. In all forms that partake of this relationship, the real future is drained and bled of its substance. But within the limits of each form, concrete variants of differing degrees of value are possible. But before we deal with these individual variants, we must define in more detail the relationship between these forms and an actual future. For even in these forms, after all, everything must lead into a real future, into precisely that which does not yet exist but which at some point must exist. In essence these forms strive to make actual that which is presumed obligatory and true, to infuse it with being, to join it to time, to counterpose it as something that actually exists and is at the same time true to the available reality, which also exists, but which in contrast is bad, not true. Images of this future were inevitably located in the past, or transferred to some land of Kaken, beyond the seven seas, their dissimilarity to a cruel and evil present-day reality was measured by temporal and spatial distancing. But such images were not taken out of time as such, they were not torn out of the real and material world of the here and now. On the contrary, one might even say that all the energy of this presumed future served only to deepen and intensify images of material here and now reality, and above all the image of the living, corporeal human being, a man grew up at the future's expense, became a bogatir compared with the present generation, you are no bogatirs, he had access to unseen physical strength and great capacity for work, his struggle with nature was portrayed as heroic, his sober-minded, and pragmatic. Intelligence was heroic, even his healthy appetite and his thirst became heroic. In such work symbolic size, strength, and a man's symbolic significance were never separated from spatial dimensions and temporal duration. A great man was physically a big man as well, with a huge stride, requiring an enormity of space and living a long time over the course of a real physical lifespan. It is true that in several folkloric forms such a great man may undergo a process of metamorphosis during which he may indeed be small, and not realize his full potential in space and time, like the sun, he sets, he descends into the nether regions, into the earth, but in the end he always realizes his full potential, spatially and temporally, becoming once again big and long-lived. We are simplifying somewhat this feature of authentic folklore, but it is important to emphasize that such a folklore did not know a system of ideals separate from embodiment of that system in time and space. In the final analysis everything that carries significance can and must also be significant in terms of space and time. Folkloric man demands space and time for his full realization, he exists entirely and fully in these dimensions and feels comfortable in them. A deliberate opposition between ideational significance and physical dimensions, in the broad sense of the word, is utterly foreign to folklore, as is the accommodation of the ideal to temporally and spatially skimpy forms, which would have the effect of playing down the importance time and space have. Here we must stress one additional feature characteristic of authentic folklore, in it a character is great in his own right, not on some other account, he himself is tall and strong, he alone is able to triumphantly repel enemy troops, as did Cuculain during the winter hibernation of the Olids. He is the very antithesis of a little Tsar ruling a great folk, folkloric man is the great folk, great in his own right. The only thing he enslaves is nature, and he himself is served only by wild beasts, and even these are not his slaves, a social category, tri. This spatial and temporal growth of a man, calibrated in forms of here and now, material, reality, appears in folklore not only as the above-mentioned features of external growth and strength, but in other highly diverse and subtle forms as well. Nevertheless the logic is everywhere the same, it is a direct and straightforward growth of a man in his own right and in the real world of the here and now, a growth process without any inauthentic debasing, without any idealized compensation in the form of weakness and need which would be there only to offset his greatness, trj. 
we will discuss in some detail other forms for expressing the growth of a man in connection with our analysis of Rabelais' great novels. Therefore, the fantastic in folklore is a realistic fantastic, in no way does it exceed the limits of the real, here and now material world, and it does not stitch together rents in that world with anything that is idealistic or otherworldly, it works with the ordinary expanses of time and space, and experiences these expanses and utilizes them in great breadth and depth. Such a fantastic relies on the real-life possibilities of human development possibilities not in the sense of a program for immediate practical action, but in the sense of the needs and possibilities of men, those eternal demands of human nature that will not be denied. These demands will remain forever, as long as there are men, they will not be suppressed, they are real, as real as human nature itself, and therefore sooner or later they will force their way to a full realization. Thus folkloric realism proves to be an inexhaustible source of realism for all written literature, including the novel. This source of realism had a special significance for the Middle Ages, and in particular for the Renaissance. But we will return again to this question in connection with our analysis of Rabelais. V. The Chivalric Romance we will touch very briefly on the distinctive features of time and consequently of the chronotope as well in the chivalric romance, we must refrain from an analysis of individual works. The chivalric romance functions with adventure time of the basically Greek type although in certain novels time is closer to the everyday adventure type used by Apuleos, this is particularly true of Wolfram von Eschenbach's Partival. Time breaks down into a sequence of adventure fragments, within which it is organized abstractly and technically, the connection of time to space is also merely technical. We encounter here the same simultaneities and disjunctions in time, the same play with distance and proximity, the same retardations. The chronotope of this novel is also close to Greek romance the otherness of its world is portrayed in a variety of ways, and has a somewhat abstract character. A testing of the identity of heroes land things, basically, their fidelity in love and their faithfulness to the demands of the chivalric code plays the same organizing role. Inevitably there also appear moments crucial to identity, presumed deaths, recognition slash non-recognition, a change of names and the like, and also a more complex play with the issue of identity, such as the two Isolds, the beloved and the unloved, in Tristan. We also find oriental and fairy tale motifs that are ultimately linked to the issue of identity, enchantments of every sort, which temporarily take a man out of the ordinary course of events and transport him to a strange world. But alongside this, a radically new element appears in the adventure time of the chivalric romance, which in turn pervades everything in its chronotope. Any adventure time will contain a mixture of chance, fate, the gods, and so forth. Indeed, this type of time emerges only at points of rupture, when some hiatus opens up, in normal, real-life, law-abiding temporal sequences, where these laws, of whatever sort, are suddenly violated and events take an unexpected and unforeseen turn. This suddenly is normalized, as it were, in chivalric romances, it becomes something generally applicable, in fact, almost ordinary. The whole world becomes miraculous, so the miraculous becomes ordinary without ceasing at the same time to be miraculous. Even unexpectedness itself since it is always with us ceases to be something unexpected. The unexpected, and only the unexpected, is what is expected. The entire world is subject to suddenly, to the category of miraculous and unexpected chance. The hero of Greek romances, on the other hand, had striven to establish some systematic illness, to reunite the sundered links in the normal course of life's events, to escape from the game of fate and to return to ordinary, normal life, which of course exists outside the limits of the novel, he endured adventures as if they were calamities sent from above but he was not an adventurer per esse, he himself did not seek out adventures, he was deprived of any initiative in this respect. The hero of a chivalric romance, on the other hand, plunges headfirst into adventures as if they were his native element, for him, the world exists exclusively under the sign of the miraculous suddenly, it is the normal condition of his world. He is an adventurer, but a disinterested one, he is not, of course, 
an adventurer in the later sense of the word, that is, in the sense of a man who cold-bloodedly pursues his own greedy goals by extraordinary means. By his very nature he can live only in this world of miraculous chance, for only it preserves his identity. And the very code by which he measures his identity is calibrated precisely to this world of miraculous chance. Moreover, the very coloration chance takes on the fortuitous simultaneities and equally fortuitous disjunctions in time is, in the chivalric romance, quite different from the Greek novel. In the Greek novel the mechanics of temporal partings and combings together are unadorned, they take place in an abstract space filled with rarities and curiosities. In the chivalric romance, by contrast, chance has all the seductiveness of the miraculous and the mysterious, it is personified by good and evil fairies, good and evil magicians, in enchanted groves, in castles and elsewhere it lies in wait. In the majority of cases the hero does not endure real misfortunes which intrigue only the reader rather, he lives miraculous adventures, which are interesting and attractive to him as well. Adventure takes on a new tone in the context of this completely miraculous world in which it occurs. Furthermore, in this miraculous world heroic deeds are performed by which the heroes glorify themselves, and glorify others, their liege lord, their lady. The heroic deed is the feature that sharply distinguishes the chivalric romance from a Greek one, and brings it closer to epic adventure. Glory and glorification are features completely alien to the Greek romance, and this fact heightens the similarity between the chivalric romance and the epic. In contrast to the heroes of Greek romance, the heroes of chivalric romance are individualized, yet at the same time symbolic. The heroes of different Greek romances resemble each other, although they bear different names, only one novel can be written about each such hero, cycles, variants, series of novels by different authors cannot be created around such heroes. The hero of such a novel is the private property of its author and belongs to him as might a thing. As we have seen, all such heroes represent nothing and no one beyond themselves, they simply exist as such. In contrast to this, the different heroes of chivalric romances in no way resemble each other, neither in their physical appearance nor in their diverse fates. Lancelot in no way resembles Partival, Partival does not resemble Tristan. But several novels have been created around each of these figures. Strictly speaking these are not heroes of individual novels, in general there are no individual, self-contained chivalric romances, what we get is heroes of cycles. They cannot, therefore, belong to individual novelists as their private property, of course, we do not have in mind authors copyright and such notions, like epic heroes, they belong to a common storehouse of images, although this is an international storehouse and not, as in the epic, one that is merely national. Finally, both the hero and the miraculous world in which he acts are of a piece, there is no separation between the two. This world is not, to be sure, his national homeland, it is everywhere equally other, but this otherness is not emphasized, the hero moves from country to country, comes into contact with various masters, crosses various seas but everywhere the world is one, it is filled with the same concept of glory, heroic deed, and disgrace, throughout this world the hero is able to bring glory on himself and on others, everywhere the same names resound and are glorious. In this world the hero is at home, although he is not in his homeland, he is every bit as miraculous as his world. His lineage is miraculous, as are the conditions of his birth, his childhood, and youth, his physique and so forth. He is flesh of the flesh and bone of the bone of this miraculous world, its best representative. All these distinctive features of the chivalric adventure romance set it off sharply from the Greek romance and bring it closer to the epic. In fact the early chivalric romance in verse lies on the boundary between epic and novel. It is this that determined its place in the history of the novel. The above-mentioned features also determine the unique chronotope of this type of novel a miraculous world in adventure time. In its own way this chronotope is very organic and internally consistent. It is no longer filled with rarities and curiosities, but with the miraculous, everything in it weapons, clothing, a spring, or bridge either has something miraculous about it or is outright bewitched.
There is also a great deal of symbolizing in this world, but not of a sort that is crudely Rebus-like, it is rather of a type closer to the Oriental fairy tale. In the chivalric romance, adventure time itself is structured by this tendency toward the miraculous. In the Greek novel, adventure time was technically true to life within the limits of individual adventures, a day was equal to a day, an hour to an hour. In the chivalric romance, on the contrary, time itself becomes to a certain extent miraculous. There appears a hyperbolization of time typical of the fairy tale, hours are dragged out, days are compressed into moments, it becomes possible to bewitch time itself. Time begins to be influenced by dreams, that is, we begin to see the peculiar distortion of temporal perspectives characteristic of dreams. Dreams no longer function merely as an element of the content, but begin to acquire a form-generating function, in the same way that visions are made analogous to dreams, in medieval literature, visions are a very important organizing form. In general the chivalric romance exhibits a subjective playing with time, an emotional and lyrical stretching and compressing of it, excepting those fairy tale and dream vision deformations mentioned above, whole events disappear as if they had never been, thus in partival the episode in Montsalvat when the hero fails to recognize the king disappears, turns into a non-event, and so on. Such a subjective playing with time is utterly foreign to antiquity. In fact, time at least within the boundaries of individual adventures was characterized in the Greek romance by a dry and considered precision. Antiquity treated time with great respect, it was sanctioned by myths, and did not permit itself the liberty of any subjective playing around with time. The chronotope of the miraculous world, which is characterized by this subjective playing with time, this violation of elementary temporal relationships and perspectives, has a corresponding subjective playing with space, in which elementary spatial relationships and perspectives are violated. In the majority of cases, Moreover, there is no trace of the free relationship of a man to space that is affirmed in folklore and fairy tales what we get rather is an emotional, subjective distortion of space, which is in part symbolic. Such is the chivalric romance. In its subsequent development the almost epic wholeness and unity characterizing the chronotope of the miraculous world disintegrates, this occurs in the later prose forms of the chivalric romance, in which Greek elements have more force, and this wholeness and unity are never again to be resurrected in their epic fullness. But separate aspects of this highly distinctive chronotope in particular the subjective playing with spatial and temporal perspectives now and then re-emerge in the subsequent history of the novel, of course, with somewhat changed functions among the romantics, for example, novelist Heinrich von Ofterdingen, the symbolists, the expressionists, for example, the very subtle psychological playing with time in Marinx Golem, X and occasionally among the surrealists as well. Toward the end of the Middle Ages, a special sort of work begins to appear, encyclopedic, and synthetic, in its content, and which is structured as a vision. We have in mind here Roman de la Rose, Guillaume de Loris, and its continuation, Jean de Mung, Piers Plowman, Langland, and, finally, the Divine Comedy. These works are of great interest in their treatment of time, but we can touch only on the most basic features common to them all. Here the influence of the medieval, otherworldly, vertical axis is extremely strong. The entire spatial and temporal world is subject to symbolic interpretation. One might even say that in such works time is utterly excluded from action. This is a vision, after all, and visions in real time are very brief, indeed the meaning of what is seen is itself extratemporal, although it does have some connection with time. In Dante, the real time of the vision as well as the point at which it intersects with two other types of time, the specific biographical moment, the time of a human life, and historical time has a purely symbolic character. All that is spatial and temporal, the images of people and objects, as well as actions, have either an allegorical significance, especially in Roman de la Rose, or a symbolic one, occasionally in Langland and to a very high degree in Dante. What is most remarkable in these works is the fact that especially in our last two examples there lies at their heart an acute feeling for the epic's contradictions, long overripe, 
This is, in essence, a feeling for the end of an epoch. From this springs that striving toward as full as possible an exposition of all the contradictory multiplicity of the epoch. And the manifold contradictions must be posited and portrayed by means of a single feature. In a meadow during the plague Langland gathers together, around the image of Piers Plowman, representatives of all social classes and levels of feudal society from king to pauper, representatives of all professions and all ideological persuasions, and all of them take part in a symbolic deed, coming to Piers Plowman in a pilgrimage after truth, to help him in his agricultural labors, etc. In both Langland and Dante this contradictory multiplicity is profoundly historical. But Langland and even more Dante stack up these many contradictions and stretch them out along a vertical axis. Literally, and with the consistency and force of genius, Dante realizes the stretching out of the world a historical world, in essence along a vertical axis. He structures a picture of the world remarkable for its architectonic say world that has its life and movement tensely strung along a vertical axis, nine circles of hell beneath the earth, seven circles of purgatory above them and above that ten circles of paradise. Below, a crude materiality of people and things, above, only the light and the voice. The temporal logic of this vertical world consists in the sheer simultaneity of all that occurs, or the coexistence of everything in eternity. Everything that on earth is divided by time, here, in this verticality, coalesces into eternity, into pure simultaneous coexistence. Such divisions as time introduces dash earlier and later have no substance here, they must be ignored in order to understand this vertical world, everything must be perceived as being within a single time, that is, in the synchrony of a single moment, one must see this entire world as simultaneous. Only under conditions of pure simultaneity or, what amounts to the same thing, in an environment outside time altogether can there be revealed the true meaning of that which was, and which is and which shall be, and this is so because the force, time, that had divided these three is deprived of its authentic reality and its power to shape thinking. To synchronize diachrony, to replace all temporal and historical divisions and linkages with purely interpretative, extratemporal and hierarchized ones such was Dante's form generating impulse, which is defined by an image of the world structured according to a pure verticality. But at the same time, the human beings who fill, populate, this vertical world are profoundly historical, they bear the distinctive marks of time, on all of them, the traces of the epoch are imprinted. Furthermore, Dante's historical and political conceptions, his understanding of both progressive and reactionary forces of historical development, an understanding that was very profound, are drawn into this vertical hierarchy. Therefore, the images and ideas that fill this vertical world are in their turn filled with a powerful desire to escape this world, to set out along the historically productive horizontal, to be distributed not upward, but forward. Each image is full of historical potential, and therefore strains with the whole of its being toward participation in historical events toward participation in a temporal historical chronotope. But the artist's powerful will condemns it to an eternal and immobile place on the extra-temporal vertical axis. Now and then these temporal possibilities are realized in separate stories, which are complete and rounded off like novellas. It is as if such stories as Francesca and Paolo, or Count Ugolino and the Archbishop Ruggieri, are horizontal time-saturated branches at right angles to the extra-temporal vertical of the Dantesque world. This is the source of the extraordinary tension that pervades all of Dante's world. It is the result of a struggle between living historical time and the extra-temporal otherworldly ideal. The vertical, as it were, compresses within itself the horizontal, which powerfully thrusts itself forward. There is a contradiction, an antagonism between the form-generating principle of the whole and the historical and temporal form of its separate parts. The form of the whole wins out. The artistic resolution of precisely this struggle is what gives rise to the tension and provides Dante's work with its extraordinary power to express its epoch, or more precisely, the boundary line between two epochs. In the subsequent history of literature, the Dantesque vertical chronotope never again appears with such rigor and internal consistency. 
but there are frequent attempts to resolve, so to speak, historical contradictions along the vertical, attempts to deny the essential thought-shaping power of earlier or later, that is, to deny temporal divisions and linkages, from this point of view, all essentials can exist simultaneously, there are attempts to lay open the world as a cross-section of pure simultaneity and coexistence, a rejection of the inability to see the whole of time that is implicit in any historical interpretation. After Dante, the most profound and consistent attempt to erect such a verticality was made by Dostoevsky. 6. The Functions of the Rogue, Clown and Fool in the Novel Simultaneously with forms of high literature in the Middle Ages, development took place in those low folkloric and semi-folkloric forms that tended towards satire and parody. These forms tended to become cycles, parodic and satiric epics emerge. In the Middle Ages, this literature of the dregs of society features three prominent types, enormously significant for the later development of the European novel. These figures are the rogue, the clown and the fool. Of course, they are not in any sense new figures, both classical antiquity and the ancient Orient were familiar with them. If one were to drop a historical sounding lead into these artistic images, it would not touch bottom in any of them they are that deep. The cultic significance of the ancient masks corresponding to these figures is not far to seek, even in the full light of historical day, but the images themselves go back even further, into the depths of a folklore that pre-exists class structures. But here, as elsewhere in our study, the problem of Genesis will not concern us. For our purposes, what is important is only those particular functions assumed by these masks in the literature of late medieval times, which will later influence the development of the European novel so crucially. The rogue, the clown and the fool create around themselves their own special little world, their own chronotope. In the chronotopes and eras we have so far discussed, none of these figures occupied an essential place, with the possible partial exception of the everyday adventure chronotope. These figures carry with them into literature first a vital connection with the theatrical trappings of the public square, with the mask of the public spectacle, they are connected with that highly specific, extremely important area of the square where the common people congregate, second and this is of course a related phenomenon the very being of these figures does not have a direct, but rather a metaphorical, significance. Their very appearance, everything they do and say, cannot be understood in a direct and unmediated way but must be grasped metaphorically. Sometimes their significance can be reversed but one cannot take them literally, because they are not what they seem. Third and last, and this again follows from what has come before, their existence is a reflection of some other's mode of being and even then, not a direct reflection. They are life's maskers, their being coincides with their role, and outside this role they simply do not exist. Essential to these three figures is a distinctive feature that is as well a privilege the right to be other in this world, the right not to make common cause with any single one of the existing categories that life makes available, none of these categories quite suits them, they see the underside and the falseness of every situation. Therefore, they can exploit any position they choose, but only as a mask. The rogue still has some ties that bind him to real life, the clown and the fool, however, are not of this world, and therefore possess their own special rights and privileges. These figures are laughed at by others, and themselves as well. Their laughter bears the stamp of the public square where the folk gather. They re-establish the public nature of the human figure, the entire being of characters such as these is, after all, utterly on the surface, everything is brought out onto the square, so to speak, their entire function consists in externalizing things, true enough, it is not their own being they externalize, but a reflected, alien being however, that is all they have. This creates that distinctive means for externalizing a human being, via parodic laughter. Where these figures remain real life people, they are fully understandable, and we take them so much for granted that they do not seem to create any problems at all. But from real life they move into literary fiction, taking with them all of the aforementioned attributes. Here, in novel texts, they themselves undergo a series of transformations, 
and they transform certain critical aspects of the novel as well. In this essay we can only scratch the surface of this very complex issue only insofar as is necessary for our subsequent analysis of several forms of the novel, in particular Rabelais, and to a certain extent Goethe. The transforming influence of these images we are analyzing branched out in two directions. First of all, they influenced the positioning of the author himself within the novel, and of his image, if he himself is somehow embedded in the novel, as well as the author's point of view. Indeed, compared with epic, drama, and lyric, the position of the author of a novel vis a vis the life portrayed in the work is in general highly complex and problematical. The general problem of personal authorship, a particular problem that has arisen only recently, since autograph literature is a mere drop in an ocean of anonymous folk literature, is here complicated by the need to have some substantive, uninvented mask that would have the capacity both to fix the position of the author vis a vis the life he portrays, how and from what angle he, a participant in the novel, can see and expose all this private life, and to fix the author's position vis a vis his readers, his public, for whom he is the vehicle for an expose of life as a judge, an investigator, a chief of protocol, a politician, a preacher, a fool, etc. Of course such questions as these exist whenever personal authorship is an issue, and they can never be resolved by assigning the author to the category of professional man of letters. By contrast with other literary genres, the epic, the lyric, the drama, however, questions of personal authorship in the novel are posed on a philosophical, cultural, or socio-political plane. In other genres, the drama, the lyric, and their variants, the most contiguous possible position of the author, the point of view necessary to the shaping of the material, is dictated by the genre itself, such a maximal proximity of the creator's position to the material is imminent in the very genre. Within the genre of the novel, there is no such imminent position for the author. You may publish your own real-life diary and call it a novel, under the same label you may publish a packet of business documents, personal letters, a novel in letters, a manuscript by nobody knows who, written for nobody knows who and who found it and where nobody knows. For the novel the issue of authorship is not therefore just one issue among others, as it is for the other genres, it is a formal and generic concern as well. We have already touched upon this question in connection with forms for spying and eavesdropping on private life. The novelist stands in need of some essential formal and generic mask that could serve to define the position from which he views life, as well as the position from which he makes that life public. And it is precisely here, of course, that the masks of the clown and the fool, transformed in various ways, come to the aid of the novelist. These masks are not invented, they are rooted deep in the folk. They are linked with the folk through the fool's time-honored privilege not to participate in life, and by the time-honored bluntness of the fool's language, they are linked as well with the chronotope of the public square and with the trappings of the theater. All of this is of the highest importance for the novel. At last a form was found to portray the mode of existence of a man who is in life, but not of it, life's perpetual spy and reflector, at last specific forms had been found to reflect private life and make it public. We might add here that the making public of specifically non-public spheres of life for example, the sexual sphere is one of the more ancient functions of the fool. C.F. Goethe's Description of Carnival The indirect, metaphorical significance of the entire human image, its thoroughly allegorical nature is of the utmost importance. For this aspect is, of course, related to metamorphosis. The clown and the fool represent a metamorphosis of Tsar and God but the transformed figures are located in the nether world, in death, cf in Roman Saturnalia and in Christ's Passion the analogos feature of the metamorphosis of God or ruler into slave, criminal, or fool. Under such conditions man is in a state of allegory. The allegorical state has enormous form generating significance for the novel. All this acquires special importance when we consider that one of the most basic tasks for the novel will become the laying bare of any sort of conventionality, the exposure of all that is vulgar and falsely stereotyped in human relationships. 
the vulgar conventionality that pervades human life manifests itself first and foremost as a feudal structure, with something like a feudal ideology downplaying the relevance of spatial and temporal categories. Hypocrisy and falsehood saturate all human relationships. The healthy natural functions of human nature are fulfilled, so to speak, only in ways that are contraband and savage, because the reigning ideology will not sanction them. This introduces falsehood and duplicity into all human life. All ideological forms, that is, institutions, become hypocritical and false, while real life, denied any ideological directives, becomes crude and bestial. In fabliocsi and schwanki equals in farces, in parodic and satiric cycles, a battle is launched against this feudal backdrop, vulgar convention, and the falsehood that has come to saturate all human relationships. Opposed to convention and functioning as a force for exposing it, we have the level-headed, cheery, and clever wit of the rogue, in the form of a villain, a petty townsman apprentice, a young itinerant cleric, a tramp belonging to no class, the parroted taunts of the clown and the simple-minded incomprehension of the fool. Opposed to ponderous and gloomy deception we have the rogue's cheerful deceit, opposed to greedy falsehood and hypocrisy we have the fool's unselfish simplicity and his healthy failure to understand, opposed to everything that is conventional and false, we have the clown a synthetic form for the, parroted, exposure of others. The novel continues the struggle against conventionality, but along lines that have a deeper significance and are more complexly organized. The primary level, the level where the author makes his transformation, utilizes the images of the clown and the fool, that is, a naivete expressed as the inability to understand stupid conventions. In the struggle against conventions, and against the inadequacy of all available life slots to fit an authentic human being, these masks take on an extraordinary significance. They grant the right not to understand, the right to confuse, to tease, to hyperboleize life, the right to parody others while talking, the right to not be taken literally, not to be oneself, the right to live a life in the chronotope of the entract, the chronotope of theatrical space, the right to act life as a comedy and to treat others as actors, the right to rip off masks, the right to rage at others with a primeval, almost cultic, rage and finally, the right to betray to the public a personal life, down to its most private and prurient little secrets. The next stage in the transformation of the rogue, clown and fool occurs when they are introduced into the content of the novel as major protagonists, either in direct or transformed guise. Quite often the two levels on which these images function come together into one all the more so because the major protagonist is almost always the bearer of the authorial point of view. In one form or another, to one degree or another, all the aspects we have analyzed appear in the picaresque novel, in Don Quixote, in Quevedo, Rabelais, in German humanistic satire, Erasmus, Brandt H. H. Murner, Moskirosk degree Wickram, in Grimm Melshausen, Sorrel, L. E. Berger extravagant and to a certain extent in Francian, comma slash in Scarin, Lesage, Marivox, later, during the Enlightenment, in Voltaire, especially successfully in L. E. Dr. Akakios, H. H. in Fielding, Joseph Andrews, Jonathan Wilde, somewhat in Tom Jones, occasionally in Smollett and, after his own special fashion, in Swift. It is characteristic that internal man pure natural subjectivity could be laid bare only with the help of the clown and the fool, since an adequate, direct, that is, from the point of view of practical life, not allegorical, means for expressing his life was not available. We get the figure of the crank Kudak, who has played a most important role in the history of the novel, in Stern, Goldsmith, Hippel, Jean Paul, Dickens, and others. A personalized eccentricity, Shandyism, Stern's own term, becomes an important means for exposing the internal man and his free and self-sufficient subjectivity means that are analogous to the Pantagruelism that had served in the Renaissance to reveal a coherent external man. The device of not understanding deliberate on the part of the author, simple-minded and naive on the part of the protagonists always takes on great organizing potential when an exposure of vulgar conventionality is involved. 
conventions thus exposed in everyday life, mores, politics, art, and so on are usually portrayed from the point of view of a man who neither participates in nor understands them. The device of not understanding was widely employed in the 18th century to expose feudal unreasonableness, there are well-known examples in Voltaire, I mention also Montesquieu's Lettre per Saints, which gave rise to a whole genre of analogous exotic letters portraying French social structure from the point of view of a foreigner who does not understand it, Swift, in his Gulliver's Travels, makes use of this device in a great variety of ways. Tolstoy employs it very widely, for example, the description of the Battle of Borodino from the point of view of an uncomprehending Pierre, the influence of Stendhal is felt here, the depiction of an election of the nobility or a session of the Moscow Duma from the point of view of an uncomprehending Levin, the portrayal of a theatrical performance, a court, the famous description of the mass, in resurrection, and so forth. The picaresque novel by and large works within the chronotope of the everyday adventure novel by means of a road that wins through one's native territory. And the positioning of the rogue, as we have said, is analogous to the position of Lucius the Ass. What is new here is the sharply intensified exposure of vulgar conventions and, in fact, the exposure of the entire existing social structure, especially in Guzman Alfaric and in Gil Blasey. Characteristic for Don Quixote is the parroted hybridization of the alien, miraculous world chronotope of chivalric romances, with the high road winding through one's native land chronotope that is typical of the picaresque novel. Cervantes' novel has enormous significance in the long history of literature's assimilation of historical time a novel whose significance is not, of course, exhausted merely by this hybrid of two already familiar chronotopes and all the more so because the very process of hybridization radically changes their character, both of them take on metaphoric significance and enter into completely new relations with the real world. In this essay, however, we cannot undertake an analysis of Cervantes' novel. In the history of realism, all forms of the novel linked to a transformation of the rogue, the clown or the fool have enormous significance, but to the present day the significance has not been grasped in its essence. A profounder study of these forms would require first of all a genetic analysis of the meaning and functions of worldwide images of the rogue, clown and fool from the deep recesses of pre-class folklore up to the Renaissance. We must take into account the enormous, in fact, incomparable, role they have played in folk consciousness, we must study the differentiation of these images, both national and local, there were, no doubt, as many local fools as there were local saints, and the particular role they play in the national and local self-consciousness of the folk. Furthermore, the problem of transforming these images, while at the same time appropriating them for literature in general, non-dramatic literature, and especially for the novel, presents particular difficulty. It is a fact not usually fully appreciated that at this point in literary history, literature's sundered tie with the public square is re-established, by means both special and specific. Here, moreover, we encounter new forms for making public all unofficial and forbidden spheres of human life, in P.A. particular the sphere of the sexual and of vital body functions, copulation, food, wine, as well as a decoding of all the symbols that had covered up these processes, common everyday symbols, ritualistic ones, and symbols pertaining to the state religion. Finally, there is real difficulty with the problem of prosaic allegorization, if you will, the problem of the prosaic metaphor, which of course has nothing in common with the poetic metaphor, that is introduced into literature by the rogue, clown and fool and for which there is not even an adequate term, parody, joke, humor, irony, grotesque, whimsy, etc., are but narrowly restrictive labels for the heterogeneity and subtlety of the idea. Indeed, what matters here is the allegorized being of the whole man, up to and including his worldview, something that in no way coincides with his playing the role of actor, although there is a point of intersection. Such words as clownishness, crookedness, jurodstvo holy foolness, eccentricity take on a specific and narrow, experiential meaning. Thus the great practitioners of this prosaic allegorization created their own terms for the concept, taken from the names of their heroes Pantagruelism, Shandaiism. 
Together with this allegorical quality, a special complexity and multi-layeredness entered the novel, intervallic chronotopes appeared, such as, for example, the chronotope of the theater. We have an especially lucid example of this new element in the novel, one of many, in Thackeray's Vanity Fair. At the heart of Tristram Shandy lies the intervallic chronotope of the puppet theater, in disguised form. Sternenism is the style of a wooden puppet directed and commented upon by the author himself. Such is the hidden chronotope in Gogol's Nose and Petrusca. In the Renaissance, the above-mentioned forms of the novel violated that otherworldly vertical axis along which the categories of a spatial and temporal world had been distributed and had given value to its living content. Novels of this kind paved the way for a restoration of the spatial and temporal material wholeness of the world on a new, more profound, and more complex level of development. They paved the way for the novel's appropriation of that world, a world in which simultaneously America was being discovered, a sea route to India was being opened up, new fields in natural science and mathematics were being established. And the way was prepared for an utterly new way of seeing and of portraying time in the novel. In our analysis of Rabelais Gargantua and Pantagruel we hope to provide concrete examples of all the basic suppositions in this section. 7. The Rabelaisian Chronotope In our analysis of Rabelais novel, as in all our previous analyses, we shall avoid dealing with any specialized questions of Genesis, we will touch upon them only when absolutely necessary. We will examine the novel as a unified whole, permeated with a single ideology and a single artistic method. It should be mentioned that all our basic analytical positions are derived from the first four books, since the fifth book too sharply departs in its artistic method from the unity of the whole. One must note, first of all, the extraordinary spatial and temporal expanses that leap at us from the pages of Rabelais' novel. But the issue here is not merely that the action of the novel is not yet concentrated in the spaces of rooms where private family life goes on but rather unfolds under the open sky, in movement around the earth, in military campaigns and journeys, taking in various countries. All this we observe in the Greek romance as well, and for that matter also in the chivalric romance, we also see it in the bourgeois adventure novel of travel in the 19th and 20th century. What is at issue here is that special connection between a man and all his actions, between every event of his life and the spatial temporal world. This special relationship we will designate as the adequacy, the direct proportionality, of degrees of quality, value, to spatial and temporal quantities, dimension. This does not mean, of course, that in Rabelais world pearls and precious stones are worse than cobblestones because they are of incommensurately smaller size. But it does mean that if pearls and precious stones are good, they should be as big as possible, and as big as possible in every situation. Every year seven ships, loaded down with gold, pearls, and precious stones, are sent to the Abbey of Thelemae. In the Abbey itself there are 9,332 bathrooms, one for each room, and each mirror has a frame of pure gold, inset with pearls, book I, ch55. This means that everything of value, everything that is valorized positively, must achieve its full potential in temporal and spatial terms, it must spread out as far and as wide as possible, and it is necessary that everything of significant value be provided with the power to expand spatially and temporally, likewise, Everything evaluated negatively is small, pitiable, feeble, and must be destroyed and is helpless to resist this destruction. There is no mutual hostility, no contradiction between spatial and temporal measurements, and value of any kind food, drink, holy truth, the good, beauty, they are directly proportional to one another. Therefore, everything that is good grows, it grows in all respects and in all directions, it cannot help growing because growth is inherent in its very nature. The bad, on the contrary, does not grow but rather degenerates, thins out and perishes, but in this process its real life diminution is compensated for by a false idealization in the other world. Since it is a function of actual spatial and temporal growth, the category of growth is one of the most basic categories in the Rabelaisian world. When we speak of direct proportionality, 
we do not mean to suggest that there was a time when this quality was separated from its spatial and temporal expression in Rabelais' world, only later to be unified with it. On the contrary, these two were from the very start connected in an indissoluble unity of images in that world. But these images were deliberately counterposed to the disproportionality inherent in the feudal and religious worldview, where values are opposed to a spatial temporal reality, treating it as vain, transitory, sinful, a feudal world where the great is symbolized by the small, the powerful by the meek and powerless, the eternal by the moment. This direct proportionality is responsible for that extraordinary faith in earthly space and time, that passion for spatial and temporal distances and expanses that is so typical of Rabelais, as well as of other great Renaissance figures, Shakespeare, Camoens, Cervantes. But this passion for spatial and temporal equivalence in Rabelais is far from naive as it was in the ancient epic and in folklore. As we have already suggested, equivalence is specifically contrasted with medieval verticality, and this polemical opposition receives a special emphasis. Rabelais' task is to purge the spatial and temporal world of those remnants of a transcendent worldview still present in it, to clean away symbolic and hierarchical interpretations still clinging to this vertical world, to purge it of the contagion of antithesis that had infected it. In Rabelais this polemical task is fused with a more affirmative one, the recreation of a spatially and temporally adequate world able to provide a new chronotope for a new, whole, and harmonious man, and for new forms of human communication. This fusion of the polemical and the affirmative tasks the tasks of purging and restoring the authentic world and the authentic man is what determines the distinctive features of Rabelais' artistic method, the idiosyncrasies of his fantastic realism. The essence of this method consists, first of all, in the destruction of all ordinary ties, of all the habitual matrices, so sets vag of things and ideas, and the creation of unexpected matrices, unexpected connections, including the most surprising logical links, illogisms, and linguistic connections, Rabelais specific etymology, morphology, and syntax. Amid the good things of this here and now world are also to be found false connections that distort the authentic nature of things, false associations established and reinforced by tradition and sanctioned by religious and official ideology. Objects and ideas are united by false hierarchical relationships, inimical to their nature, they are sundered and separated from one another by various otherworldly and idealistic strata that do not permit these objects to touch each other in their living corporeality. These false links are reinforced by scholastic thought, by a false theological and legalistic casuistry and ultimately by language itself shot through with centuries and millennia of error false links between, on the one hand, good material words, and, on the other, authentically human ideas. It is necessary to destroy and rebuild the entire false picture of the world, to sunder the false hierarchical links between objects and ideas, to abolish the divisive ideational strata. It is necessary to liberate all these objects and permit them to enter into the free unions that are organic to them, no matter how monstrous these unions might seem from the point of view of ordinary, traditional associations. These objects must be permitted to touch each other in all their living corporeality, and in the manifold diversity of the values they bear. It is necessary to devise new matrices between objects and ideas that will answer to their real nature, to once again line up and join together those things that had been falsely disunified and distanced from one another as well as to disunite those things that had been falsely brought into proximity. On the basis of this new matrix of objects, a new picture of the world necessarily opens up a world permeated with an internal and authentic necessity. Thus, in Rabelais the destruction of the old picture of the world and the positive construction of a new picture are indissolubly interwoven with each other. In prosecuting the more positive side of his task, Rabelais relies upon folklore and antiquity where the contiguity of objects more exactly corresponded to their various natures and where imposed conventionality and otherworldly idealism were quite unknown. In prosecuting his negative task, the foremost device is Rabelaisian laughter directly linked to the medieval genres of the clown, rogue, and fool, whose roots go deep back into pre-class folklore. But Rabelaisian laughter not only destroys traditional connections and abolishes idealized strata, 
it also brings out the crude, unmediated connections between things that people otherwise seek to keep separate, in pharisaical error. The disunification of what had traditionally been linked, and the bringing together of that which had traditionally been kept distant and disunified, is achieved in Rabelais via the construction of series, rich adage of the most varied types, which are at times parallel to each other and at times intersect each other. With the help of these series, Rabelais can both put together and take apart. The construction of series is a specific characteristic of Rabelais' artistic method. All these widely varied series can be reduced to the following basic groups, are, series of the human body, in its anatomical and physiological aspects, 2, human clothing series, 3, food series, 4, drink and drunkenness series, 5, sexual series, copulation, 6, death series, 7, defecation series. Each of these seven series possesses its own specific logic, and each series has its own dominance. All these series intersect one another, by constructing and intersecting them, Rabelais is able to put together or take apart anything he finds necessary. Almost all the themes in Rabelais' broad and thematically rich novel are brought about via these series. We offer a series of examples. Throughout the entire novel Rabelais presents the human body, all its parts and members, all its organs and functions, in their anatomical, physiological, and nadir philosophy aspects alone. This idiosyncratic artistic presentation of the human body is a very important element in the Rabelaisian novel. It was important to demonstrate the whole remarkable complexity and depth of the human body and its life, to uncover a new meaning, a new place for human corporeality in the real spatial-temporal world. In the process of accommodating this concrete human corporeality, the entire remaining world also takes on new meaning and concrete reality, a new materiality, it enters into a contact with human beings that is no longer symbolic but material. Here the human body becomes a concrete measuring rod for the world, the measurer of the world's weight and of its value for the individual. And here we have the first attempt of any consequence to structure the entire picture of the world around a human conceived as a body which is to say, in a zone of physical contact with such a body, although this zone is, in Rabelais, infinitely wide. This new picture of the world is polemically opposed to the medieval world, in whose ideology the human body is perceived solely under the sign of decay and strife, where in real life practice, there reigned a crude and dirty physical licentiousness. The reigning ideology served neither to enlighten nor to make sense out of the life of the body, rather it rejected such life, therefore, denied both words and sense, the life of the body could only be licentious, crude, dirty, and self-destructive. Between the word and the body there was an immeasurable abyss. For this reason Rabelais opposes human corporeality, and the surrounding world that is in a direct zone of contact with the body, not only to medieval, ascetic otherworldly ideology, but to the licentiousness and coarseness of medieval practice as well. He wants to return both a language and a meaning to the body, return to it the idealized quality it had in ancient times, and simultaneously return a reality, a materiality, to language, and to meaning. The human body is portrayed by Rabelais in a variety of different aspects, various first of all in its anatomical and physiological aspect. Then follows the clownish and cynical, then the fantastic, grotesque allegorization, the human being as a microcosm. And finally there is its peculiarly folkloric aspect. These aspects interpenetrate each other and are only rarely present unalloyed. But anatomical and physiological precision and attention to detail are sure to be there wherever the human body is present. Thus, gargantua's birth, it is portrayed with a clownish cynicism, with precise anatomical and physiological details gargantua's mother, who had eaten too much tripe, suffers a prolapsus of the rectum resulting in severe diarrhea, the defecation series, and then the birth itself thanks to this unfortunate accident there took place a weakening of the uterus, the child leapt up through the fallopian tubes to a hollow vein and, scrambling across the diaphragm to the upper arm where this vein divides in two, he took the left fork and crawled out through the left ear, book I, ch6, dot. Here, 
grotesque fantasy is combined with the precision of anatomical and physiological analysis. In all his descriptions of battles and beatings, we get, alongside grotesque exaggeration, precise anatomical descriptions of the injuries, wounds, and deaths inflicted on the human body. Thus, in his description of Friar John beating up the enemy who had broken into the monastery vineyard, Rabelais gives us a detailed series of human members and organs, Book I, ch. 27. He beat the brains out of some, broke the arms and legs of others, disjointed the neck bones, demolished the spines, split the noses, punched out the eyes, smashed the jaws, knocked the death down throats, broke the legs, dislocated the shoulder blades, hips, cracked the elbow bones in yet others. If one of them tried to hide himself in the thick vines, he would bruise him up and down his spine and break the base of his back, as if he were a dog. If one of them tried to save himself by flight, he knocked the man's head into pieces along the lambdoidal suture. Here is the same Friar John killing a guard. And with one blow he sliced the man's head in two, cutting through the skull over the temple bone, thus separating from the back of his head both parietal bones and a great part of the frontal bone together with the sagittal suture. With the same blow he sliced through both membranes of the brain thus exposing the ventricles, and the posterior part of the brain was left hanging over the shoulders, just like a doctor's cap, black outside and red within. And then the guard tumbled to the ground dead. Yet another analogous example, in Panurge's grotesque story of his being roasted on the spit in Turkey and how he saved himself, we notice the same anatomical detail and precision, Book 2, ch. 14. Having run in, he the master of the house M.B. Seized the spit on which I was trussed up and struck my tormentor with it on the spot, from which blow he died, for lack of treatment, he ran him through with the spit, a little above and to the right of the navel, and pierced the third lobe of his liver, and the diaphragm as well. Having passed through the pericardium the spit came out through the upper shoulder, between the vertebrae and the left shoulder blade. In Panurge's grotesque tale, the human body series, on its anatomical plane, is crossed with the food and kitchen series, Panurge being roasted like meat on a spit, having first been basted with fat, and the death series, the distinctive features of that series appear below. None of these anatomical analyses appear as static descriptions, they are drawn into the living dynamics of action battles, fist fights, and so on. The anatomical structure of the human body is revealed in action, and it becomes, as it were, a character in the novel in its own right. But it is not the individual body, trapped in an irreversible life sequence, that becomes a character rather it is the impersonal body, the body of the human race as a whole, being born, living, dying the most varied deaths, being born again, an impersonal body that is manifested in its structure, and in all the processes of its life. With the same degree of precision and visual clarity Rabelais describes the external actions and movements of the human body for example, in his description of gymnast's acrobatics on horseback, book I, ch. 35. The expressive possibilities of human body movement and gesture are illustrated with extraordinary clarity and detail in the mute debate, by means of gestures, between the Englishman Thomast and Panurge, here this expressiveness has no precise denotative meaning, it is important precisely because it is self-sufficient, Book 2, ch. 19. An analogous example can be found in Panurge's conversation on marriage with the deaf mute goat's nose, Book 3, ch. 20. This grotesque use of the fantastic to describe the human body and all its processes is well illustrated in the portrayal of Pantagruel's illness, whose cure involves lowering into his stomach workers with spades, peasants with pick shovels and seven men with baskets to clean the filth out of his stomach, Book 2, ch. 33. The same is true of the author's journey into Pantagruel's mouth, Book 2, ch. 32. In order to describe the human body in its grotesque and fantastic aspect, a mass of the most varied objects and phenomena are drawn into the body series. In this new context they are immersed in an atmosphere of the body and of the life of the body, they enter into a new and unexpected matrix with body organs and processes, in this body series, they are brought down to earth and made more material. 
we have seen evidence of all this in the two examples offered above. To purge his stomach, Pantagruel swallows like pills some great copper balls, like those on Virgil's monument in Rome. Locked up inside these pills are workers with equipment and baskets for the cleaning out of the stomach. After the purging is over Pantagruel vomits, and the balls spring out. When the workers are released from their pills, Rabelais recalls how the Greeks exited from the Trojan horse. One of these pills can be seen in Orleans, on the steeple of the Church of the Holy Cross, Book 2, ch. 33. An even wider circle of objects and phenomena enter the grotesque anatomical series of the author's journey inside Pantagruel's mouth. It turns out that there is a whole new world inside the mouth, high mountains, teeth, meadows, forests, fortified towns. There is a plague in one of the towns, the result of foul vapors rising from Pantagruel's stomach. There are over 25 populated kingdoms in the mouth, inhabitants tell each other apart by their hailing from the hither or yon side of the teeth, as in the human world we refer to the hither and yon side of mountains and so forth. The description of the world disclosed inside Pantagruel's mouth takes up almost two pages. The folkloric basis of this entire grotesque image is patently obvious, cf analogous images in Lucian. If the geographical and economic world was drawn into the body series in the episode in Pantagruel's mouth, then the ordinary everyday agricultural world is drawn into the body series in the episode with the giant slitnose Bren Neril, Book 4, ch. 17. The terrifying giant slitnose had swallowed all the saucepans, cauldrons, pots, pans and even stoves and ovens on the island, owing to the lack of windmills which were his usual fare. As a result shortly before dawn he hour of his digestion he fell seriously ill with an upset stomach, caused as the doctors said, by the fact that the digestive powers of his stomach, naturally accustomed to absorbing windmills, could not fully process stoves and braziers, pots and pans were digested well enough, as witnessed by the sediment found in four barrels of urine that he had filled twice that morning. Slitnose avails himself of a health resort cure on the island of the winds. Here he swallows windmills. He tries out on the advice of local specialists on stomach ailments spicing the windmills with roosters and chickens. They sing in his belly and fly about, which brings on the colic and cramps. Moreover, the foxes of the island leap down his throat in pursuit of the birds. At that point he must take a wheat and millet enema to purge his stomach. The chickens make a dash for the grain, and the foxes rush after them. He puts more pills into his mouth, this time compounded of racing and hunting dogs, Book 4, ch. 44. What is characteristic here is the unique, purely Rabelaisian logic by which the series is constructed. The process of digestion, curative machinations, everyday household objects, phenomena of nature, farm life, and the hunt are here united in one dynamic, living, grotesque image. A new and unexpected matrix of objects and phenomena is created. It should be obvious that at the heart of grotesque Rabelaisian logic lies the logic of realistic folklore fantasy. In this minor episode with Slit Nose, the body series as is usual with Rabelais intersects with the defecation series, the food series and the death series, about which we will be more precise below. Even more grotesque and monstrously aberrant is the parroted anatomical description of King Lent Icarem Prenant, which occupies three chapters in the fourth book, 30, 31, 32. King Lent is a faster, a grotesque personification of the Catholic fast and ascesis in general, a personification of the bias against natural processes characteristic of medieval ideology. The description of Lent ends with Pantagruel's familiar discourse on antiphasis. All offspring of antiphasis chaos and disharmony are drawn as parodies on the human body, Book 4, ch. 32. The heads of these newborn ones were spherical and round on all sides, like a ball, and not flattened slightly on either side as is the case with humans. Their ears were high up on their heads and huge, like asses' ears, their eyes bugged out, eyelashless, fastened to little bones and as hard as crab's eyes, their feet were round as a ball, their arms were attached backwards to their shoulders. As they walked they continually turned cartwheels, walking on their heads with their feet in the air. 
Further on, Rabelais lists a series of other offspring of Antiphasis, Ibid. Since that time she has brought forth into the world holy hypocrites, bigots, and pope mongers, followed by maniacal nobodies, Calvinist impostors from Geneva, furious puiherbalts, dissemblers, cannibals, and in general every sort of belly stuffing monk, as well as other unnatural and misshapen monsters, brought forth to spite nature. Such a series manifests all the ideological monsters of a transcendent worldview, brought together in a single all encompassing series of bodily deformities and perversions. An excellent example of the penchant for making grotesque analogies is found in Panurge's discourse on borrowers and lenders in chapters 3 and 4 of the third book. We are offered, by analogy with the mutual interaction between borrowers and lenders, the description of the harmonious structure of the human body as microcosm. The intention of the builder of this microcosm is that it should provide shelter for the soul which he had placed there as a guest and that it should support life. Life consists of blood, blood is the locus for the soul, therefore, there is only one task in this world, and that is continuously to forge blood. At this forge their hierarchy is such that one is always borrowing from another, one puts another in debt. The material and metal suitable for transmutation into blood are provided by nature, it is bread and wine. All forms of nourishment are contained in these two. To find, to prepare, to cook this nourishment, hands work, feet move, and transport the whole mechanism, eyes act as guides. The tongue tastes, the teeth chew, the stomach receives, digests and evacuates, this food. The nutritive portion goes to the liver which again transmuts it and turns it into blood. Then the blood is transported for further refinement to another workshop to the heart itself, which by its diastolic and systolic movements refines and inflames it, so that it is perfected in the right ventricle and sent through the veins to all members. Each organ feet, hands, eyes and all the rest draws the blood to itself and each in its own way takes nourishment from it. Thus they become debtors who were previously creditors. In this one grotesque series the analogy with debtors and creditors Rabelais offers a picture of the harmony of the universe and the harmony of human society. All these grotesque, parroted and clownish series of the human body on the one hand serve to expose the body's structure and its life and on the other hand drag into the body matrix a heterogeneous world of things, phenomena, and ideas that were, in the medieval picture of the world, infinitely far from the body, and included in completely different series of words and objects. Whatever direct contact these objects and phenomena had with the body was brought about, first and foremost, via a verbal matrix, their verbal compacting into a single context, a single phrase, a single compound word. On occasion Rabelais does not shy away from even completely nonsensical compound words, if only they will serve to place in series, to matricize I these words and concepts that human speech based as it was on fixed structure, a fixed worldview, a fixed system of values had never as yet used in a single context, a single genre, a single style, a single sentence, with a single intonation. Rabelais is not afraid of a logic along the lines of the melon is in the garden, but my uncle is in Kiev. He makes frequent use of the peculiar logic of sorcerers, as this was understood in the medieval formulas for blaspheming God and Christ, and the formulas for calling up unclean spirits. He makes wide use of the special logic of profanity Hoff which more below. This unbridled phantasmagoria has a special significance, it permits him to create verbal series of objects that are in themselves reasonable, but become monstrous when linked together, for example, the episode with slit nose, the swallower of windmills. But at the same time it must not be thought that Rabelais is preoccupied with form alone. All these word linkages, even those that seem the most absurd in terms of the objects they name, are aimed primarily at destroying the established hierarchy of values, at bringing down the high and raising up the low, at destroying every nook and cranny of the habitual picture of the world. But simultaneously he is accomplishing a more positive task, one that gives all these word linkages and grotesque images a definite direction, to embody the world, to materialize it, to tie everything into spatial and temporal series, to measure everything on the scale of the human body, 
to construct on that space where the destroyed picture of the world had been a new picture. Even the most monstrous and unexpected word matrices are saturated with the unifying force of these ideological impulses of Rabelais. But there is, as we will see below, still another and even more profound and idiosyncratic meaning hiding behind Rabelais grotesque images and series. Alongside this grotesque anatomical physiological use of corporeality for embodying the whole world, Rabelais a humanist physician and pedagogue was concerned with direct propaganda on behalf of the culture of the body and its harmonious development. Thus, Rabelais opposes to the original scholastic upbringing of Gargantua one that ignored the body the subsequent humanist upbringing under Ponocrates, where enormous attention is paid to anatomical and physiological studies, hygiene, and various types of sports. To the medieval body course, hawking, farting, yawning, spitting, hiccuping, noisily nose-blowing, endlessly chewing and drinking there is contrasted the elegant, cultured body of the humanist, harmoniously developed through sports, book I, ch 21, 23 and 24. The Abbey of Thelemy also devotes enormous attention to body culture, book R, ch 52, s 7. We will have reason to return to this harmonious, affirmative pole of Rabelais worldview to this harmonious world with its harmonious human being. The next series is that of eating and drinking drunkenness. This series plays an enormous role in the Rabelaisian novel. Almost all the themes of the novel come about through it, hardly an episode could manage without it. The most varied objects and phenomena of the world are brought into direct contact with food and drink including the most lofty and spiritual things. The author's prologue begins right off with a nod to drunkards, to whom the author dedicates his writings. In the same prologue he insists that he worked on this book only during periods of eating and drinking, indeed, this is the proper time for writing of such lofty matters and profound sciences, as Homer, who was the paragon of all philologists, very well knew, and Aeneas, the father of Latin poets, and Horace testifies to it as well although a certain imbecile declared that his verses smack rather of wine than of oil. The author's prologue to the third book is even more striking in this respect. Here the barrel of the cynic Diogenes is inscribed into the drink series in order that it may become a wine cask. Here the motif of drunken creativity is repeated, and in addition to Homer and Aeneas, writers who composed while drunk, we also have Aeschylus, Plutarch, and Cato. The very names of Rabelais major protagonists derive etymologically from the drink series, Grand Gaussier, Gargantua's father, is Great Gulp. Gargantua is born into the world with a terrible cry on his lips, Drink! 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 How healthy you are! K. Grand to as, says Grand Gaussier, referring to his son's throat. This first word, spoken to the father, causes the child to be called Gargantua, book I, ch 7. Rabelais likewise etymologically interprets the name Pantagruel as he who is always thirsty. Even the birth of the major protagonists takes place under the sign of eating and drunkenness. Gargantua is born on a day of great feasting and drinking arranged by his father thus it is that his mother overeats on tripe. The newborn infant is immediately wined. Pantagruel's birth on the other hand, is preceded by a great drought and consequently by a great thirst affecting people, animals, the earth itself. The picture of this drought is given in biblical style and saturated with concrete reminders of antiquity and the Bible. This lofty plane is interrupted by the physiological series with its grotesque explanation for the salinity of sea water, the earth was so heated that it burst into a great sweat, which caused it to sweat out the whole sea which for that reason is salty, for all sweat is salt. You will admit this to be true if you taste your own sweat, or the sweat of pox patients when they are made to sweat it is all the same to me, book 2, ch 2. The salt motif, as well as the drought motif, prepares the way for, and intensifies, the fundamental motif of thirst under whose aegis Pantagruel is born the king of the thirsty. In the year, the day, the hour of his birth, everything in the world is thirsty. The motif of salt is introduced in a new way at the very moment of Pantagruel's birth. Before the infant himself appears, 
out of his mother's womb leap 68 mule tears, each pulling by the collar a mule heavily laden with salt, after which there follows nine dromedaries loaded down with bales of ham and smoked ox dungs, seven camels loaded with salted eels, followed by twenty-five cartloads of leeks, garlics, and green onions. After the series of salty thirst-provoking hors d'oeuvres, Pantagruel himself appears in the world. Thus, Rabelais constructs the grotesque series, drought, heat, sweat, when it is hot people sweat, salt, sweat is salty, salty hors d'oeuvres, thirst, drink, drunkenness. Dragged into the series along the way, the sweat of pox patients, holy water, whose use is regulated by the church during the drought, the Milky Way, the sources of the Nile and a whole series of biblical and classical references, mention is made of the parable of Lazarus, Homer, Phoebus, Phaeton, Juno, Hercules, Seneca. All this occurs in the space of a page and a half, describing Pantagruel's birth. Rabelais here creates a characteristic new and monstrous matrix of objects and phenomena elements that within quite ordinary contexts are completely incompatible. Gargantua's genealogy is found among the symbols of drunkenness, it is uncovered in a crypt, amid nine wine flasks under a goblet on which was inscribed Heek Bibiter, Book I, Ch. I. Let us now turn our attention to the matrix of words and things that links the crypt and the drinking of wine. Almost all the truly important episodes in the novel are introduced into the eating and drinking series. The war between Grand Gaussier's kingdom and the kingdom of Picricali, which takes up most of the first book, is caused by scones and grapes, foods that are in addition viewed as a remedy for constipation and thus intersect with the highly detailed defecation series, CFCH 25. Friar John's celebrated battle with Picricali's warriors is over the monastery vineyards, which satisfy the monastery's need for wine, not so much for the Eucharist as for the drunkenness of the monks. Pantagruel's famous journey that fills the whole fourth book, as well as the fifth, is a search for the Oracle of the Sacred Bottle. All the ships that set sail are decorated with symbols of drunkenness in the form of heraldic devices, a bottle, a goblet, a pitcher, amphora, a wooden jug, a glass, a cup, a vase, a wine basket, a wine barrel, Rabelais describes each ship's device in detail. The eating and drinking series are, like the body series, highly detailed and hyperboleized in Rabelais. In every instance we are given the most detailed enumerations of the most varied appetizers and main dishes, along with a precise account of their exaggerated quantities. Thus, for example, the following list occurs during a description of the supper in Grand Gaussier's castle following the battle, Book 1, ch. 37. Supper was served. First 16 oxen were roasted, then 3 heifers, 32 calves, 63 suckling kids, 95 sheep, 300 suckling pigs in a marvelous sauce, 220 partridges, 700 woodcock, 400 capons from London and Cornwall and 1,700 juicy varieties from other breeds, 600 pullets and as many pigeons, 600 guinea fowls, 1,400 hares, 303 bustards and 1,700 capon chicks. Game they could not get in such quantity, there were only two wild boars sent by the abbot of Turpinay, and 18 fallow deer, a gift from the lord of Garndmont, together with 140 pheasants from the lord of Esses, and some dozens of wild pigeons, water hens, teal, bitterns, curlews, plovers, heathcock, brigandres, sea ducks, lapwings, sheldrakes, both large and dwarf, and also creosted herons, storks, bustards and flamingos with red plumage, land rails and turkey hens, together with various sorts of dumplings. In the description of Gaster's Island, the Maw, there is a particularly detailed enumeration of the most varied dishes and appetizers, two whole chapters, 59 and 60 in Book 4, are devoted to this list. As we have already stated, the most varied objects, phenomena, and ideas are drawn into the eating and drinking series items completely foreign to that series from the reigning point of view in its ideological and literary practice, as well as in spoken language, 
items also foreign to the customary way of ordering things. The means of incorporation are the same as in the body series. We offer several examples. The struggle of Catholicism with Protestantism, and particularly with Calvinism, is portrayed as a struggle between King Lent and the sausages that inhabit Savage Island. The episode with the sausages takes up eight chapters in the fourth book, 35 to 421. The sausage series is a highly detailed one, developed through a grotesque obsession with sequence. Starting with the shape of a sausage, Rabelais proves, relying on various authorities, that the serpent that bit Eve was a sausage, that the ancient giants who had stormed Mount Olympus and who had tried to pile Mount Pelion on Asa were half sausage. Molossine was also half sausage, as was Eric Thonius, the inventor of the hearse and the cart, so that he might hide his sausage legs. In preparation for this battle with the sausages, Friar John concludes a treaty with the cooks. A huge sow is armed to the teeth like the Trojan horse. The sow is described in a parroted epic Homeric style, and it takes several pages to list the names of all the warrior cooks who entered the cell. The battle takes place, and at the critical moment Friar John opens the doors of his cell and burst out with his stout soldiers. Some of them were dragging iron spits, others frying pans, dripping pans, blades, racks, kettles, pots, pokers, tongs, cooking pots, mortars and pestles all in battle array like so many firemen, shouting and howling in a deafening roar, Nebuzaradan. 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 And with such shouts and uproar they struck out at the pate and the wieners. The sausages are defeated, there appears over the field of battle the flying hog of Minerva who throws down a barrel of mustard this is the holy grail of the sausages, it heals their wounds and even resurrects their dead. The intersection of the food series with the death series is of particular interest. In chapter 46 of the fourth book we find a lengthy discourse by the devil on the relative tastiness of various human souls. The souls of slanderers, petty clerks and lawyers are only good when freshly salted. Scholars' souls are good for breakfast, lawyers' souls for dinner, chambermaids for supper. From vine dressers' souls one gets a colic in the stomach. Elsewhere we are told how the devil breakfasts on a fricassee made from the soul of a sergeant, and how he falls seriously ill with an upset stomach. Into the same series are introduced the fires of the Inquisition, which separate men from their faith and thus guarantee devils a steady supply of tasty souls. A further example of the intersection of the eating series with the death series is found in the Lucianic episode of Epistemon's visit to the kingdom of the dead in chapter 30 of the second book. The resurrected Epistemon promptly begins to speak, saying that he has seen devils, that he has held intimate conversation with Lucifer, and has feasted well both in hell and in the Elysian fields. The eating series is extended throughout the entire episode, in the world beyond the grave, Demos thence is a vine dresser, Aeneas a miller, Scipio Africanus trades in yeast, Hannibal in eggs. Epictetus, under a spreading tree and surrounded by numerous maidens, dances and feasts at every opportunity. Pope Julius hawks pasties. Xerxes hawks mustard, since he asks too much for it, Francois Villain pisses in his mustard tub, as mustard makers do in Paris, an intersection here with the defecation series. Pantagruel interrupts Epistemon's tale of the nether world with words that both resolve the theme of death and the world beyond the grave and serve as a summons to eating and drinking, well, now, it's time for some feasting and drinking. I beg you, my lads, because it's good drinking season all this month. Book 2, CH 30 Frequently Rabelais will tightly intertwine his eating and drinking series with religious concepts and symbols the prayers of monks, monasteries, papal decrees and so forth. The young Gargantua, after stuffing himself at dinner, this is during that time when he is still under the tutelage of the scholastics, only with difficulty managed to mouth a piece of a prayer. On the Isle of the Poppy Maniacs Pantagruel and his fellow travelers are invited to a dry mass, that is, a mass without church singing, but Panurge prefers one moistened with a little good Anjou wine. On this same island they are fed a dinner where every dish, 
be it kid, capon, or hog which is very plentiful in poppy mania pigeon, rabbit, hare, turkey, and so on and so forth all were stuffed with bottomless subtleties. This stuffing gives epistamine a most severe case of diarrhea, book 4, ch 51, misprint in Russian original, where it is given as chi, tr. Two special chapters are devoted to the theme of the monks in the kitchen, chapter 15 of the third book, explanation of the monastic Kabbalah in the matter of salt beef, and chapter 2 of the fourth book, why monks love to be in kitchens. Here is a highly typical excerpt from the first of these chapters, book 3, ch 15. You like vegetable soup, but I prefer mine with bay leaf, with perhaps the addition of a slice of pluffman salted till the ninth hour. I understand you, replied Friar John. You drew that metaphor from the stockpot of the cloister. You call an ox that pluffman who is plowing, or has plowed. To salt for nine hours means to cook to a turn. By a certain cabalistic institution of the ancients, unwritten but passed from hand to hand, our good spiritual fathers, having gotten up for matins, would in my time go through certain important preliminaries before entering the church. They spat in the spitteries, vomited in the vomitoria, dreamed in the dreamaries, pissed in the pissaries. And also that they might bring nothing unclean to the divine service. Having done all this, they moved devotedly into the holy chapel for that in their jargon was the name they gave to the convent kitchen and they devotedly saw to it that from that moment on the beef was on the fire, for the breakfast of our holy friars, brethren in our Lord. Often they lit the fire under the pot themselves. And since the matins lasted nine hours, they had to get up earlier, and consequently as the hours increased so did their appetite and thirst much more so than if the matins had contained only one or three hours, lessons. The earlier they arose, thus spake the Kabbalah, the earlier the beef was on the fire, the longer it was on, the better it stewed, the better it stewed the tenderer it became, the less it wore down the teeth, the more it delighted the palate, the less it weighed on the stomach, and the better it nourished the good monks. And this was the sole purpose and prime aim of the founders of the monastery, who took into consideration the fact that one does not cat to live but rather one lives to eat, there being no other reason to live on this earth. This excerpt is very typical of Rabelais artistic methods. First and foremost, we see here a realistically drawn picture of everyday monastic life. But at the same time this genre painting is given as the decoding of an expression peculiar to monastic, monks, jargon, a slice of pluffman, salted till the ninth hour. Hidden behind the allegory in this expression is a tight matrix of meat, the pluffman, and the mass, the nine hours are the parts read out at the morning service. The number of texts to be read, nine hours, conduces to the best stewing of the meat and to the best appetite. This holy mass come eating series intersects with the defecation series, which would include spitting, vomiting, pissing, and with the bodily physiological series, the role of the teeth, the palate, and the stomach. Monastic masses and prayers serve merely to fill up the time necessary for the proper cooking of food and for the wetting of the appetite. Point 12 from this follows the generalizing conclusion, monks eat not to live, but live to eat. Using the principles for constructing series and images in Rabelais, we will pause in what follows for a more detailed treatment of the material already provided by the five leading series. As a general principle we are not concerning ourselves with questions of genesis, with questions of sources or influences. But in this instance we will tentatively put forward a general observation. The introduction of religious concepts and symbols into the eating, drunkenness, defecation, and sexual acts series in Rabelais is not, of course, anything new. We are familiar with the most diverse kinds of parody formulas used by sorcerers in the literature of the late Middle Ages parodied gospels, parodied liturgies, the all drunkards mass of the 13th century, parodied holy days and rituals. Such an intersection of series is typical for the poetry of the Vaganti, Latin poetry, and even for their special argot. And we encounter it, of course, in the poetry of Villain, who is connected with the Vaganti. Along with this parodic witchcraft literature, black magic formulas of a type used by sorcerers are of special significance, 
and they were both widespread and widely known in the late Middle Ages and Renaissance, and without doubt were well known to Rabelais, and, finally, we have the formulas for obscene profanity, whose ancient cultic importance has not yet been extinguished, this obscene profanity was widespread in unofficial everyday speech and gives rise to the stylistic and ideological idiosyncrasies of unofficial everyday speech, most especially in the lower social classes. Witchcraft magical formulas, including obscenity, and everyday Billingsgate are themselves related to each other, being in fact two branches of the same tree, whose roots go deep into pre-class folklore but of course they are branches that have profoundly distorted the original noble nature of the tree. Besides this medieval tradition, we should also mention a more ancient tradition, and in particular Lucian who substantially altered the method of rendering the everyday, physiological detail of erotic and quotidian aspects embedded in myths, cf, for example, the copulation of Aphrodite with Ares, Athena's birth from Zeus for it and so on. And finally we must mention Aristophanes, who influenced Rabelais, especially in matters of style. We will return later to the question of Rabelais reworking of this tradition, as well as to the question of that deeper folkloric tradition that formed the basis for his artistic world. At this point we touch on these questions only provisionally. Let us return to the eating and drinking series. As with the body series, we have in these, along with grotesque exaggeration, Rabelais basically affirmative view of the significance, the culture, of eating and drinking. Rabelais by no means advocates crude gluttony and drunkenness. But he does affirm the lofty importance of eating and drinking in human life, and strives to justify them ideologically, to make them respectable, to erect a culture for them. The transcendental ascetic worldview had deprived them of any affirmative value, had taken them as nothing more than a sad necessity of the sinful flesh, such a worldview knew only one formula for making such processes respectable, and that was the fast a negative form, hostile to their nature, dictated not by love but by enmity, cf the figure of King Lent, the faster, as the typical offspring of antithesis. But insofar as they were ideologically negative and unstructurable, sanctioned by neither word nor thought, eating and drinking could only take the form of the crudest gluttony and drunkenness. As a consequence of this inevitable falseness inherent in the ascetic worldview, gluttony and drunkenness flourished precisely in the monasteries. A monk in Rabelais is first and foremost a glutton and a drunkard, cf especially chapter 34 concluding book 2. We have already pointed out that whole chapters are devoted to this special affinity between monks and kitchens. The grotesque and fantastic image of gluttony is illustrated by the episode of Pantagruel's visit, along with his fellow travelers, to the island of Gaster. Five chapters are devoted to this episode, 57 to 62, in the fourth book. Here, using material from ancient times particularly from the poet Perseus the entire philosophy of Gaster, the maw, is worked out. It was precisely a maw, and not fire, that was the first great teacher of all the arts, ch. 57. The maw is credited with the invention of agriculture, of military arts, transportation, sea travel, and so forth, ch. 56-57. The doctrine of famine as the moving force for economic and cultural development is partially a parody, and partially a truth, as is the case with the majority of Rabelais analogously grotesque images. The culture of eating and drinking is contrasted with crude gluttony throughout the account of Gargantua's upbringing, in Book I. The theme of culture and moderation in food is discussed in connection with spiritual productivity in Chapter 13 of the third book. Rabelais conceives this culture not only in its medical and hygienic aspect, as a function of the healthy life, but also from the point of view of the gourmet, the purely culinary. In somewhat parroted form, Friar John's sermon on humanism in the kitchen expresses the culinary preference of Rabelais himself, Book 4, CHIO. By Almighty God, de Jurandi, why don't we remove ourselves into some grand holy kitchen, and there consider the turning of the spits, the music of the hissing chunks of meat, the placing of the bacon fat, the temperature of the soups, the preparation of the dessert, and the order of the wine service. BD Immaculate in Via. 
that's how it goes in the breviary. Interest in the culinary details of preparing food and drink in no way contradicts, of course, the Rabelaisian ideal of a whole and harmoniously developed physical and spiritual human being. Pantagruelian feasts occupy a very special place in the Rabelaisian novel. Pantagruelism means the ability to be cheerful, wise and kind. Therefore, the ability to feast cheerfully and wisely is the very essence of Pantagruelism. But the feasts of the Pantagruelists are in no way feasts of idlers and gluttons, men who are perpetually at table. One may devote to the feast only the evening leisure hours at the completion of the working day. Dinner, in the middle of the working day, should be short and, so to speak, merely utilitarian. Rabelais defends on principle the transfer of the eating and drinking center of gravity to the evening supper. And so it was decreed in the pedagogical system of the humanist Ponocrates, Book I, Ch. 23. Gargantua's dinner, note, was moderate and simple because they ate only to still the gnawings of the stomach, but supper was copious and lengthy, for at that time Gargantua ate as much as he needed to nourish himself and replenish his energies. This is the proper diet prescribed by the art of good sound medicine. There is that special discourse on supper, put into Panurge's mouth, that we already cited from chapter 15 of the third book. When I've well and truly breakfasted and my stomach has been cleaned out and well pumped, in a pinch and in case of necessity I'll do without dinner. But to miss my supper. A pox on that. Why, that's an error, a violation of nature. Nature created man that he may exercise his strengths, that we may work, that each man may occupy himself with his affairs, and to help us do this more conveniently she provides us with a candle, that is, with the gay and joyful light of the sun. But in the evening she begins to withdraw this light from us, as if to say silently, You, my children, have been good. That's enough work. Night is coming, you must cease from your labors and fortify yourself with good bread, good wine, good meat, and you must enjoy yourselves a bit, then lie down and sleep, so as to rise up in the morning just as fresh and ready to work. At these Pantagruelian evenings while eating the bread, the wine, and the various meats, or directly afterwards Pantagruelian conversations get going, conversations that are wise but filled as well with laughter and banter. In what follows we will have more to say on the special significance of these evenings, the new Rabelaisian variant on the Platonic Feast Symposium. In such a way the eating and drinking series, through their grotesque development, perform the task of destroying archaic and false matrices between objects and phenomena, and create new matrices, fleshed out ones, that materialize the world. At its positive pole the series ends in nothing less than ideological enlightenment, the culture of eating and drinking, which is an essential feature of the new human image, a man who is harmonious and whole. Let us pass on to the defecation series. This series occupies a large place in the novel. The antiphysis infection required a strong dose of the physis antivenin. In general, the defecation series creates the most unexpected matrices of objects, phenomena, and ideas, which are destructive of hierarchy and materialize the picture of the world and of life. We will take as an example of such unexpected matrices the theme of arse-wiping. The infant Pantagruel delivers a speech on the various means he had investigated for wiping himself, and on the best method he had found. In the grotesque series of items he lists for arse-wiping we find, a lady's velvet muffler, a neckerchief, silk ear flaps, a page's hat, a March cat, who scratched his behind with his claws, his mother's glove scented with benzoin, sage, fennel, marjoram, cabbage leaves, greens, lettuce, spinach, the eating series, roses, nettles, a blanket, curtains, napkins, hay, straw, wool, a cushion, slippers, a game bag, a basket, a hat, the very best arse wipe turned out to be a baby goose with soft down, one feels a marvelous pleasure from the softness of the down, and from the warmth of the goose itself, and this spreads throughout the bum gut and the rest of the intestines reaching all the way to the heart and the brain. Later, relying on the opinion of the master Dun Scotus, 
Gargantua claims that the heavenly bliss experienced by the heroes and demigods in the Elysian fields consists precisely in their wiping their arses with baby geese. In the conversation in praise of the decretals that takes place during a dinner on the Isle of the Poppy Maniacs, even papal decrees are entered into the defecation series. Friar John once used them for an arsewipe, from which he got hemorrhoidal tumors. Panurge suffered a severe case of constipation after reading the decretals, Book 4, ch. 52. An intersection of the body series with the series of eating drinking and with the defecation series occurs in the episode with the six pilgrims. Gargantua swallows six pilgrims with his salad, and washes them down with a healthy gulp of white wine. At first the pilgrims hide behind the teeth, and then they are all but carried away into the abyss of Gargantua's stomach. With the help of their staffs they manage to hang on to the surface of the teeth. At this point they accidentally touch a sore tooth, and Gargantua spews them out of his mouth. And while the pilgrims are making their escape Gargantua begins to urinate, his urine cuts across the road, and they are forced to make their way across this great current of urine. When they are finally out of danger, one of the pilgrims exclaims that all these tribulations had been foretold in the Psalms of David, when the people rose up against us it was as if we were to be swallowed alive dash that's when we were eaten in the salad, with salt, he said. And since a great wrath fell upon us, as if water had swallowed us up dash that was when he made that huge swallow. Perhaps our soul crosses an insuperable current of water. Dash that's. When we crossed the great torrent of his urine, by which he cut off our path of escape, book R, ch. 38. Thus, even the Psalms of David are tightly interwoven with the processes of eating, drinking, and urinating. There is a characteristic episode concerning the Isle of the Winds, whose inhabitants nourish themselves on wind alone. The theme of wind and the entire complex of lofty motifs associated with it in literature and poetry the wafting of zephyrs, the wind in sea storms, breathing, and sighing, the soul as a breath, the spirit, and so on are here, via the intermediary expression to pass wind, pulled into the eating series, the defecation series and the quotidian series, cf air, breath, wind, which functions as a standard and as the internal form of words, images and motifs from a loftier plane life, the soul, the spirit, love, death, etc. Book 4, ch. 42 and 44. On this island there is no spitting, no urinating, but people pass wind and gas in great abundance. The most widespread disease is inflation of the stomach and colic. As a cure they apply carminatives in great quantities, and use cupping glasses for aerating the stomach. They all die from swollen stomachs, as if from dropsy, the men passing wind, the women gas. So it is that their souls depart by the back passage. Here the defecation series intersects with the death series. Within the defecation series Rabelais constructs a series of local myths. A local myth explains the genesis of a geographical space. Each locality must be explained, beginning with its place name and ending up with the fine details of its topographical relief, its soil, plant life, and so forth all emerging from the human event that occurred there and that gave to the place its name and its physiognomy. A locality is the trace of an event, a trace of what had shaped it. Such is the logic of all local myths and legends that attempt, through history, to make sense out of space. And Rabelais also creates, on the plane of parody, such local myths. Rabelais explains the place name Paris in the following way. When Gargantua enters the city, a crowd of people gather round him and for the fun of it, P-A-R-R-I-S, he unbuttoned his magnificent codpiece and then and there drenched them so copiously that 260,418 persons were drowned, not counting women and children. Hence it was that the city was ever afterwards called Paris, Book I, CH 17, misprint in Russian original, where the chapter is given as 42, TR. The explanation given for the source of the hot baths in France and Italy is that Pantagruel's urine, during his illness, was so steaming hot that it has not to this day cooled off. Book 2 cannot be as given in Russian original CH 17, TR. The stream that flows by Saint Victor was created by dog's urine, 
This episode is related in CH 22 of Book 2. The examples we have cited are sufficient to characterize the functions of the defecation series in the Rabelaisian novel. Let us pass on to the sexual act series, and to the series of sexual indecencies in general. The sexual series occupies an enormous place in the novel. It appears in a wide variety of forms, from sheer obscenity to subtly coded ambiguity, from the body joke and anecdote to medical and naturalistic discourses on sexual potency, male semen, sexual reproductive processes, marriage and the significance of the origin of the genders. Openly indecent expressions and jokes are sprinkled throughout the whole of Rabelais' novel. They are especially frequent in the mouth of Friar John and Panurge, but the other heroes are not strangers to them either. When, during the Pantagruelist's journey, they come upon some frozen words and among them discover a cluster of indecent words, Pantagruel refuses to store in the hold several of these frozen indecencies, he said it was folly to stock up on those things which one is never short of, and which are always at hand as are indecent words among the good and jovial Pantagruelists, Book 4, ch. 56. This principle of word use adhered to by the good and jovial Pantagruelists is sustained by Rabelais throughout the entire novel. No matter what themes are discussed, Intchenchis always find a place for themselves in the verbal fabric that is being woven, drawn in by means of the most remarkable object associations, as well as by purely verbal ties and analogies. There is in the novel no small number of short, indecent novellas built on jokes, which are often borrowed from folkloric sources. Such, for instance, is the anecdote about the lion and the old lady, related in chapter 15 of the second book, and the story of how the devil was deceived by the old woman of Pope Figland, book 4, ch. 47. The basis for this story is the ancient folkloric analogy between the female organ and an open wound. Along the lines of a local myth we have the celebrated story about the reason why in France there are such short leagues, where space is measured by the frequency of occurrence of the sexual act. King Pharamond chose from Paris 100 splendid young fellows and just as many fine young Picardy maidens. He gave one girl to each youth and ordered them to set out in couples, in all directions, on each spot where the youths made love to their girls he ordered them to set up a stone, and that should be a league. The dispatched couples made love well and often at the beginning, while they were still in France, thus the French leagues are so short. But later on they grew weary, their sexual energy exhausted, they were satisfied with one measly little bout a day, this is what makes the leagues in Brittany, in Londis, and in Germany so long, Book 2, ch. 23. A further example could be found in the introduction of worldwide geographical space into the indecency series. Panurge says, there was a time when Jupiter copulated with fully one-third the world with animals, humans, rivers, and mountains that is, with Europa, Book 3, ch. 12. Panurge's bold and grotesque discourse on the best means to build walls around Paris is of a somewhat different character. He says, Book 2, ch. 15. I see that in the city women are cheaper than stone, therefore, let us build walls out of female organs. And moreover let us lay out those organs with full architectural symmetry, we'll place the big ones in the first rows, next, rising like two slopes, the middle-sized ones, and finally the little ones. Then we will fill them up as in the great tower of Bourges with those firmed-up swords which dwell in monastic cod pieces. What devil would be able to overthrow walls like that? A different logic governs the discussion of the sexual organs of the Roman Pope. The poppy maniacs consider the kissing of the feet an insufficient expression of respect toward the Pope, Book 4, ch. 47. We want to show more. More respect. They reply. It's all decided. We will kiss his bare bum and other parts as well. For he has them, the Holy Father has. So it is spoken in our great decretals. Otherwise he wouldn't be the Pope. In fact our subtle decretaline philosophy tells us that this is a necessary consequence he is a Pope, therefore he has these organs. If there ceased to be such organs in the world, the world would have no Pope. 
we consider the examples cited here fully sufficient to characterize the various means by which Rabelais introduces and develops the series of sexual enchanches, for our purposes we do not require, of course, an exhaustive analysis of these means. In the organization of all the material of the novel, one theme entered into the indecency series is of crucial significance, namely, the theme of horns. Panurge wants to marry but he decides against it, afraid of being horned. Almost half of the book, beginning with ch7, is devoted to Panurge's discourse on marriage, he consults with his friends, makes prophecies on the basis of Virgil, reads dreams, holds conversations with the Panzos Sibyl, consults first a deaf mute, then the dying poet R. A. Minogrobes, then Herr Trippa Agrippa Netus Games Kill, then the theologian Hippothadius, the physician Rondibulus, the philosopher Word Spinner, the fool of Tribolet. The theme of horns and the fidelity of wives figures into all these episodes, conversations, and discourses a theme that in its turn draws into the story, via a thematic or a verbal similarity, the most varied themes and motifs from the sexual series, for example, the discussion of male potency and of the perpetual arousability of women in the speeches of the physician Rondibulus, or the survey of ancient mythology in connection with the bestowing of horns and the fidelity of women, ch. 31 and 12 of the third book. The fourth book of the novel is organized as a journey of the Pantagruelists to the Oracle of the Sacred Bottle, which was to put to rest, once and for all, Panurge's doubts about marriage and horns, although it is true that the theme of horns in itself is almost completely absent from the fourth book. The sexual series functions, as do all the above-mentioned series, to destroy the established hierarchy of values via the creation of new matrices of words, objects, and phenomena. He restructures the picture of the world, materializes it and fleshes it out. The traditional image of the human being in literature is also restructured in a radical way, moreover, it is restructured in a way that benefits the unofficial and extraverbal areas of his life. The whole man is brought out on the surface and into the light, by means of the word, in all the events of his life. But throughout all this the human being is not deheroicized or debased at all, nor does he in any sense become a man of low life. We might say rather that in Rabelais there is a heroization of all the functions of the life of the body, of eating, drinking, defecating and sexual activity. The very hyperbolization of these acts contributes to their heroization, they lose their commonplace quality, their everyday and naturalistic coloration. We will in what follows return again to this question of Rabelais naturalism. The sexual series has its positive pole as well. The coarse debauchery of medieval man was but the reverse side of the ascetic ideal that had denigrated sexuality. Its harmonious integration is illustrated in Rabelais by the Abbey of Thelemae. The four series selected by us do not exhaust all the materializing series of the novel. We have chosen only the dominant series, those that give the work its basic tone. One might also isolate a clothing series, which is worked out by Rabelais most meticulously. Special attention is paid here to the codpiece, that part of the clothing that covers the male sexual organ, which connects the series with the sexual series. And one might also isolate a series of objects from everyday life, or of household objects or a zoological series. All these series, gravitating toward the human being as body, carry out the same functions, a disunification of what had been traditionally linked and a bringing together of what had been hierarchically disunified and distant, serving to bring about, therefore, the materialization of the world. Having dealt with these materializing series, let us pass on to the final series, which has a different function in the novel, the series of death. At first glance it might seem that Rabelais' novel does not have anything like a death series. The problem of individual death and the intensity this problem usually has are presented as something absolutely foreign to Rabelais' healthy, whole, and virile world. And this impression is absolutely correct. But in that hierarchical picture of the world that Rabelais destroyed, death had occupied a commanding place. Death robbed life on earth of its value, considering it perishable and transitory, death deprived life of any independent value, 
turning it into a mere service mechanism working toward the future eternal fate of the soul beyond the grave. Death was not perceived as an inevitable aspect of life itself, beyond which life triumphed again and continued, life, taken in either its essential collective or historical aspect, but was perceived rather as a limiting phenomenon, one lying on the fixed boundary between that perishable temporary world and eternal life, like a door opening out on another, transcendental, world. Death was, therefore, conceived not as part of an all-encompassing temporal sequence but rather as something on the boundary of time, not in a life series but at the edge of that series. Rabelais, in destroying the old hierarchical picture of the world and in putting a new one in its place, was obliged to reevaluate death as well, to put it in its own place in the real world and, most importantly, to portray it as an unavoidable aspect of life itself, to portray it in the all-encompassing temporal series of life that always marches forward and does not collide with death along the way, nor disappear into the abyss of the world beyond, but remains entirely here, in this time. And space, under this sun, and Rabelais must portray, finally, a death that even in this world is not an absolute end for anyone, or anything. This means he must portray the material aspect of death within the triumphant life series that always encompasses it, without, of course, any poetic pathos, which is deeply alien to Rabelais, while at the same time portraying it as something that occurs just in passing, without ever overemphasizing its importance. The death series with a few exceptions appears in Rabelais on a grotesque and clownish plane, it intersects with the eating and drinking series, with the defecation series, with the anatomical series. On the same plane there are disquisitions on the question of a world beyond the grave. We are already familiar with examples of death in the grotesque anatomical series. A detailed anatomical analysis of a fatal blow is given, the physiological inevitability of death is demonstrated. In this instance death is presented as a naked anatomical and physiological fact, in all its clarity and precision. All the descriptions of death in battle are of this type. Here, death is seen as if it were part of the impersonal anatomical physiological series of the human body, and always in dynamic conflict. The general tone is grotesque, sometimes highlighting one or another of the comic aspects of death. Thus, we have, for example, the description of Trippett's death, book R, ch 35. Turning around quickly, he gymnastem. B threw himself on Trippet, and gave a flying thrust with the sharp of his sword, and, as the captain covered the upper part of his body, sliced him through the stomach, the colon, and half the liver with one blow, so that he fell to the ground, and falling emptied out more than four potfuls of soup, and mingled with the soup, his soul. Here the anatomical physiological image of death is introduced into a dynamic picture of the battle between two human bodies, and the image that results is a death in direct relationship with food, he emptied out his soul which had been mingled with his soup. We have cited above a sufficient number of examples of the anatomical image of death in battle the massacre of the enemy in the monastic vineyard, the murder of the guard, etc. All these images are analogous, and all present death as an anatomical physiological fact in an impersonal series constituted by the living and struggling human body. Here death does not interfere with the uninterrupted series comprising the struggling human life, rather, it appears as merely one aspect of this life, it does not violate the logic of this life, and is made out of the same stuff as life itself. In the defecation series, death has a different, grotesquely clownish character, one involving no anatomical physiological analysis. Thus, Gargantua drowns in his urine 260,418 persons, not counting women and children. Here this mass destruction is presented not only as something directly grotesque, but also as a parody on dry accounts of natural disasters, suppressed uprisings, religious wars, from the point of view of these official accounts, human life isn't worth a cent. The description of the enemy drowned in the urine of Gargantua's mare is downright grotesque. The image here is very detailed. Gargantua's companions must make their way across a stream made of urine, across the piled-up corpses of drowned men. Everyone gets across successfully, 
Book I, ch. 36. With the exception of Eudemon, whose horse had plunged its right leg knee-deep into the belly of a blubbery fat good-for-nothing who had drowned on his back, and the horse could not pull its leg out and, therefore, stayed stuck there until Gargantua shoved the rest of the scoundrel's giblets into the water with his staff, and then the horse pulled out her leg and, by what miracle of veterinary science, was cured of a tumor on that leg, through contact with that fat oaf's guts? What is characteristic here is not only the image of death in urine, or the tone and style of the description of the corpse belly, guts, giblets, blubbery fat good for nothing, scoundrel, fat oaf, but also the healing of the leg through contact with the innards of a corpse. Analogous cases are very widespread in folklore, they are based on one of the general folkloric assumptions concerning the generative power of death and of the fresh corpse, a wound is a womb, and the idea of healing the death of one by the death of another. Here we have the folkloric nexus of death with new life albeit extraordinarily weakened, of course, to the point of a grotesque image, the healing of a horse's leg through contact with the innards of a blubbery corpse. But the peculiar folkloric logic of this image is clear. We will mention another example, the intersection of the death series with the defecation series. When the inhabitants of the Isle of the Winds die, their souls pass out of their bodies along with their wind, in the case of the males, and with gas, in the case of the females, through the rear passage. In all these examples of the grotesque, clownish, portrayal of death, the image of death itself takes on humorous aspects, death is inseparable from laughter, while, however, not being associated with it in a series of objects. And in the majority of cases Rabelais portrays death with an inclination to laugh about it, he portrays cheerful deaths. We get a comic portrayal of death in the episode of Panurge's Herd. Desiring to avenge himself on the merchant who had directed him to a ship full of sheep, Panurge buys the bellwether and tosses it into the sea, all the remaining sheep rush into the sea after the bellwether, the merchant and his herdsmen throw themselves after the sheep in an attempt to hold them back, and they are themselves impelled into the sea, Book 4, CH8. Panurge stood beside the galley with an oar in his hand, not to help the herdsmen but to prevent them from somehow clambering aboard and thus escaping their death, and all the while preached to them eloquently, with rhetorical flourishes about the miseries of this world and the blessings of the next, affirming that those who had passed on to that place were happier than those who lived on in this veil of tears. The comic element in this death situation is provided by Panurge's accompanying sermon. The entire situation is a wicked parody on the conception of life and death as it was perceived by the medieval transcendental worldview. In another instance, Rabelais tells the story of monks who, instead of giving immediate aid to a drowning man, first felt compelled to advise him about his eternal soul and to confess him, during which time he sank to the bottom. In keeping with the spirit of violation by parody of medieval assumptions about the soul and the world beyond the grave, we are offered the cheerful image of Epistemon's temporary visit to the kingdom of the dead, we have already touched on this episode above. Here would belong as well the grotesque discourses on the gustatory qualities and gastronomic value of the souls of the newly dead, about which we have already spoken. We must keep in mind the cheerful representation of death in the eating series, in the story of Panurge and his misadventures in Turkey. Here we are given the externalized comic situating of death, which is at the same time in direct relation with food, roasting on the spit and impaling on the spit. The entire episode of the half-roasted Panurge's miraculous salvation ends with an encomium to the roast meat on a spit. Death and laughter, death and food, death and drink are frequently brought together in Rabelais. Everywhere the setting for death is a cheerful one. In chapter 17 of the fourth book we get a whole series of surprising and, more often than not, comic deaths. Here the story is told of the death of Anacreon, who suffocated on a grapeseed, Anacreon wine grapeseed death. The praetor Fabius died from a goat's hair that had fallen into a glass of milk. One man died from holding back the gas in his stomach, which he was embarrassed to release in the presence of the emperor Claudius and so forth. If in the above instances it was the external situation that made death laughable, then the death of the Duke of Clarence, the brother of Edward IV, 
was a cheerful death even for the dying man himself, sentenced to death, he himself was offered the choice of his means of execution, and he chose death by drowning in a barrel of Momsey. Book 4, CH 33 Here a cheerful death is directly associated with wine. The cheerfully dying man as a type is illustrated by Rabelais in the figure of the poet Raman Agrobis. When Panurge and his traveling companions visited the dying poet, he was already in his death agony, but he was cheerful in his looks, his face was bright and his eyes clear, Book 3, CH 21. In all these instances of a cheerful death there is laughter in the tone, in the style and in the form of portraying death. But laughter also enters the death series in a direct verbal and object association with death, in two places in his book, Rabelais lists a series of deaths from laughing. In chapter 20 of the first book, Rabelais mentions Crassus, who died laughing at the sight of an ass swallowing a red thistle, and Philemon, who also died laughing at the sight of an ass, this one gobbling down figs. In chapter 17 of the fourth book, Rabelais mentions the artist Zeuxis, who died laughing as he looked at the portrait of an old woman he had just finished painting. Finally, death is presented in close relationship with the birth of new life and simultaneously with laughter. When Pantagruel is born he is so huge and heavy that he could not appear in this world without suffocating his mother, Book 2, CH2. The mother of the newborn Pantagruel dies, and his father Gargantua finds himself in a difficult situation, he does not know whether to weep or to laugh. The doubt which so troubled his reason was due to not knowing whether he should weep of grief on account of his wife, or laugh with delight at the sight of his son. He was not able to resolve his doubt and as a result both wept and laughed. Remembering his wife, Gargantua bellowed like a cow. And then he suddenly began to laugh like a calf, remembering Pantagruel, Book 2, CH3. The nature of Rabelaisian laughter is revealed in its full vividness in the death series, at the points of intersection of the series with the eating, drinking, and sexual series and in its direct association of death with the birth of new life. Here are revealed the authentic sources and traditions of this laughter, the application of this laughter to the whole wide world of socio-historical life, the epic of laughter, to an epoch, or more precisely to the boundary line between two epochs, exposing its perspectives and its subsequent historical generative force. The cheerful death of Rabelais not only coincides with a high value placed on life and with a responsibility to fight to the end for this life but it is in itself an expression of this high evaluation, an expression of the life force that eternally triumphs over any death. In the Rabelaisian image of the cheerful death there is not, of course, anything decadent, there is no striving toward death, no romanticizing death. In Rabelais, the death theme itself, as we have already said, is in no way foreground, in no way emphasized. Of enormous importance in the working out of this theme is the sober and clear anatomical and physiological aspect of death. And laughter in Rabelais is certainly not set in opposition to the horror of death, this horror is missing entirely, and consequently there can be no sharp contrast. We find this tight matrix of death with laughter, with food, with drink, with sexual intchenches in other representative figures of the Renaissance as well, in Boccaccio, in the framing story itself, and in the material of the separate stories, in Pulsi, the description of deaths and of paradise during the Battle of Roncesvalles, in Margot, a prototype for Panurge, who dies of laughter, and in Shakespeare, in the Falstaff scenes, the cheerful gravediggers in Hamlet, the cheerful drunk. Porter in Macbeth the similarity among these scenes can be explained by the unity of the epoch and by the shared nature of sources and traditions, the differences are in the breadth and fullness with which these matrices are developed. In the subsequent history of literary development, these matrices continue to live with great vigor, in romanticism and then in symbolism, we are passing over the intervening stages, but in those contexts their character is utterly different. The wholeness of a triumphant life, a whole that embraces death, and laughter, and food and sexual activity, is lost. Life and death are perceived solely within the limits of the sealed-off individual life, where life is unrepeatable, and death an irremediable end, and, 
therefore, within the limits of life taken in its internal and subjective aspect. Thus, in the artistic imagery of the Romantics and the Symbolists, these matrices are transformed into sharp, static contrasts and oxymorons that are either not resolved at all, since there is no all-encompassing, larger real whole, or resolved on the plane of mysticism. It suffices to mention those phenomena that are externally more or less similar to the Rabelaisian matrices. There is a short story by Edgar Allan Poe set in the Renaissance called The Cask of Amontillado. The hero kills his rival during a carnival, the man is drunk and dressed in a clown's costume with little bells on it. The hero persuades his rival to go with him into his wine cellar, the catacombs, in order to determine the authenticity of a cask of Amontillado that he had bought, here, in the cellar, the hero walls his rival up alive in a niche, and the last thing he hears is laughter and the tinkling of the clown's bells. This entire short story is structured on sharp and completely static contrasts, the gay and brightly lit carnival slash the gloomy catacombs, the merry clown's costume of the rival slash the terrible death awaiting him, the cask of Amontillado and the gay ringing of the clown's bell slash the horror at impending death felt by the man being immured alive, the terrifying and treacherous murder slash the calm, matter-of-fact and dry tone of the protagonist narrator. At the heart of the story lies a very ancient and time-honored complex, Matrix Death the Fool's Mask, Laughter Wine the Gaiety of the Carnival, Cara Navalis Bacchus, The Grave, The Catacombs. But the golden key to this complex has been lost, there is no all-encompassing whole of triumphant life, there remain only the denuded, sterile and therefore, oppressive contrasts. Of course, behind these contrasts there is felt a dark dim forgotten kinship, a long series of reminders of artistic images in world literature in which these very elements were fused together but this remains a dim sensation, and these reminders affect only the narrowly aesthetic impression that one gets from the story as a whole. At the heart of the familiar story The Mask of the Red Death there lies a Boccaccian matrix, the plague, death, the grave, a holiday, gaiety, laughter, wine, eroticism. But here this matrix also turns out to be a naked contrast creating a tragic, in no sense Boccaccian atmosphere. In Boccaccio the all-embracing whole of life, not, of course, a narrowly biological life, life triumphant and moving ever forward, reduces the force of the contrasts. In Poe these contrasts are static and the dominant of the entire image is, therefore, oriented toward death. We see the same thing in the story King Pest, drunken soldiers feasting in a plague-infested quarter of a port city, although here the wine and drunken revelry of the healthy body in the plot shall head, but only in the plot, ensures a victory over the plague and over the phantoms of death. We are again reminded of the Rabelaisian motifs in The Father of Symbolism and Decadence, Baudelaire. In his poem L.E. Mort Joyo, cf. the concluding gesture to the worms, Voyas Venir of Un Mort Libre et Joyo, and in the poem L.E. Voyage, A Summoning of Death, the view Capitaine in the final stanzas, and finally in the cycle La Mort we notice the same indications of decline of the complex, an association that was never very full, and the same orientation of the dominant toward death the influence of Bellonism and the school of nightmares and horrors. I-14 here death, as is always the case with the romantics and the symbolists, ceases to be an aspect of life itself and becomes again a phenomenon on the border between my life here and now and a potential other kind of life. The whole problematic is concentrated within the limits of the individual and sealed off progression of a single life. But let us get back to Rabelais. In his work the Death series has an affirmative pull as well, where the theme of death is discussed with almost no trace of the grotesque. We have in mind those chapters devoted to the death of heroes and of the Great Pen, and the celebrated missive of the old Gargantua to his son. In the chapters on the death of heroes and the Great Pen, Book 4, ch. 26, 27, and 28, Rabelais, relying on ancient material, reports with almost no trace of the grotesque the special situation surrounding the death of heroes whose life and death was not without meaning to mankind. The death of highborn and heroic men is often accompanied by special natural phenomena that reflect the historical dislocation, storms rage, comets, 
falling stars appear in the sky, ch 271. The heavens tacitly tell us, by means of the airborne ethereal signs of the comets, mortal men, if you wish to learn from the dying something concerning public prosperity or profit call upon the dying as speedily as possible and obtain an answer from them. If you let this moment pass, your regrets will he in vain. And in another place, ch 26. While a torch or candle is alive and burning it shines on all those near it, it lights up its surroundings, offers its help and its brilliance to all and does no harm nor displeasure to anyone but the moment it is extinguished it poisons the air with its smoke and vapor, and offends and displeases everyone near it, it is the same with such noble and famous souls. As long as they inhabit their bodies, their presence brings peace, pleasure, profit, and honor. But at the hour of their decease, the isles and the mainland are habitually disturbed by mighty commotions, shuddering and darkness, thunder and hail, the earth trembles and quakes, storms and hurricanes start up over the seas, complaints and distress rise up among the people, religions change, kingdoms fall, states are overthrown. From the example cited above it is clear that in Rabelais the deaths of heroes occur in an utterly different tone and style, in place of a grotesque fantastic we have a heroizing fantastic, partly in the spirit of a popular epic, which in its basics provides for a tone and style corresponding to ancient sources, in his retelling, Rabelais adheres to these rather closely. All this bears witness to Rabelais' high evaluation of historical heroism. It is characteristic that those phenomena with which nature and the historical world react to the death of heroes although they contradict all the rules of nature are by themselves completely natural, storms, comets, earthquakes, revolutions, and they occur in the same external world that was the scene for the life and activity of the heroes. This resonance is epically heroicized, nature also participates in it. Even in this instance Rabelais represents death not in the progression of the individual life, sealed off and sufficient unto itself, but rather death in the historical world, as a phenomenon of socio-historical life. The death of Great Pan is told, or more precisely retold, from Plutarch, in such tones. In his retelling Pantagruel transfers events connected with this death to the death of the great savior of the faithful, but at the same time includes in his image purely pantheistic content, ch 28. The aim of all three chapters is to demonstrate historical heroes as a major and eradicable trace in a single, real world the world of nature and history. These chapters do not conclude in the manner we have learned to expect from Rabelais. After the conclusion of Pantagruel's speech, a great silence falls. A little later we noticed how tears fell from his eyes, big ones, like the eggs of ostriches. Strike me dead, zero lord, if I have uttered one word of untruth. The grotesque overtones are here combined with a seriousness that is extremely rare for Rabelais, concerning Rabelais' seriousness we shall have something to say later. Gargantua's letter to Pantagruel, which occupies chapter 8 of the second book, is important not only for the death series but also for the entire affirming, neither grotesque nor critical, pole of Rabelais' novel. In this regard it is similar to the episode on the Abbey of Thelemé. In what follows we will, therefore, return to it, as well as to the Abbey of Thelemé. Here we shall touch only on those parts that are relevant to the motif of death. We see developed here the theme of the continuation of the race, of generations, and of history. Despite the admixture of canonical Catholic tendencies, inevitable under the conditions of the time, a doctrine nevertheless emerges that contradicts these of the doctrine of the biological and historical immortality of man, the biological and historical do not of course contradict each other, the immortality of the seed, the name, and the act. Among the gifts, graces and prerogatives with which the Creator, God Almighty, endowed and embellished human nature in the beginning, one seems to me to be especially wonderful, that is, the one by which we can, in this mortal state, acquire a kind of immortality and, in the course of this transitory earthly life, perpetuate our name and seed. This we accomplish through descendants sprung from us in lawful marriage. Thus begins Gargantua's missive. Thanks to this propagation of seed, there lives on in the children what had perished in the parents, 
and in the grandchildren what had perished in the children. Not without just and equitable cause, therefore, do I offer thanks to God, my preserver, for permitting me to see my decrepitude and old age blossom afresh in your youth, and when, at the will of him who rules and measures all things, my soul shall quit this mortal habitation not all of me will die, but I shall only pass from one place to another, since in you and by you I shall remain in visible form here in this world of the living, visiting in society with men of honor and with my good friends, as I have been accustomed to do. In spite of the worshipful turns of phrase characterizing almost all the opening and closing paragraphs of the letter, the letter itself develops the idea of a different kind of immortality, one that is earthly, relative, deliberately and comprehensively opposed to the Christian doctrine of the immortality of souls. In no way does Rabelais posit the possibility of a static immortality of some aged soul that has emerged from the decrepit body in some transcendental realm where it is denied any further earthly growth or development. Gargantua wants to see himself, his old age and decrepitude blossom forth again in the fresh youth of his son, grandson, and great-grandson, what for him is precious is his own visible earthly image, whose features are preserved in his descendants. In the person of his descendants he wishes to remain in the world of the living, it is in his descendants that he wishes to circulate among good friends. What matters here is precisely the possibility of immortalizing the earthly on the earth, and the preservation of all the earthy values of life a fine physical appearance, blooming youth, good friends and, most important of all, a continuation of physical growth, of development and of the further perfection of the individual. Least of all does he posit an immortality that one might achieve at any particular point of development. We must emphasize one more feature, for Gargantua, Rabelais, it is not at all important to immortalize one's own I, one's self as a biological specimen, one's own selfhood, whatever values may attach to it, what matters to him is the immortalizing, or more precisely, the further growth, of his best desires and strivings. And thus if the qualities of my soul did not abide in you as does my bodily form, men would not consider you the guardian and treasure house of the immortality of our name, in which case my pleasure would be much reduced. For I would see that my lesser part had persisted, that is, my flesh, while the better part, which is the soul, by which our name continues to be blessed among men, that part would have degenerated and become, as it were, bastardized. Rabelais connects the growth of generations with the growth of culture, and with the growth of the historical development of mankind as well. The son will continue the father, the grandson the son and on a higher level of cultural development. Gargantua makes reference to a great revolution that had occurred during his lifetime, in my age dignity and enlightenment were restored to the sciences, and such a change has taken place that I should scarcely be accepted in the first grade of the lowest school I who in my ripe years was reputed, not without some justification, to be the most learned man of the age. And somewhat further, I find that nowadays robbers, hangmen, freebooters, and grooms are better educated than the doctors and preachers were in my time. This kind of growth where the most learned man of one epoch does not qualify for the first grade of the lowest school in the following, contiguous, epoch is welcomed by Gargantua, he does not envy his descendants, who will be better than he merely because they were born later than he. In the person of his descendants, in the person of other men, of the human race, his race, he will participate in this growth. Death begins nothing decisive, and ends nothing decisive, in the collective and historical world of human life. As we will see, the same constellation of problems arises in particularly acute form in the 18th century in Germany. The problem of a personal individual perfection and becoming of a man, of the perfection, and growth, of the human race, of earthly immortality, of the education vospitani of the human race, of rejuvenating culture through the youth of a new generation all these problems will arise in conjunction with each other. They inevitably lead to a more profound conceptualization of the problem of historical time. Three basic attempts at a resolution of these problems, which are interdependent, Emerged, Lessings, Erzihung de Menschengeschlex, Comma degree Herders, Auchin Philosophie der Geschichte zur Bildung der Menschheit, and finally Goethe's distinctive variant, 
particularly in Wilhelm Meister. All the series selected by us above serve in Rabelais to destroy the old picture of the world that had been formed in a dying epoch, and to create a new picture, at whose center we have the whole man, both body and soul. In the process of destroying the traditional matrices of objects, phenomena, ideas, and words, Rabelais puts together new and more authentic matrices and links that correspond to nature, and that link up all aspects of the world by means of the most marvelous grotesque and fantastic images and combinations of images. In this complex and contradictory, productively contradictory, flow of images, Rabelais brings about a restoration of the most ancient object associations, this flow enters one of the most fundamental channels of literary thematics. Along this channel flows a full-bodied stream of images, motifs, plots, fed by the springs of pre-class folklore. The direct association of eating, drinking, death, copulation, laughter, the clown, and birth in one image, in one motif and in one plot is the exterior index of this current of literary thematics. The elements themselves that make up the whole image, motif, or plot as well as the artistic and ideological functions of the entire matrix taken as a whole at various stages of development both change drastically. Beneath this matrix, which serves as the exterior index, there is hidden a specific form for experiencing time and a specific relationship between time and the spatial world, that is, there is hidden a specific chronotope. Rabelais' task is to gather together on a new material base a world that, due to the dissolution of the medieval worldview, is disintegrating. The medieval wholeness and roundedness of the world, as it was still alive in Dante's synthesizing work, had been destroyed. There was destroyed as well the medieval conception of history the creation of the world, the fall from grace, the first expulsion, redemption, the second exile, the final judgment concepts in which real time is devalued and dissolved in extra-temporal categories. In this worldview, time is a force that only destroys and annihilates, it creates nothing. It was necessary to find a new form of time and a new relationship of time to space, to earthly space, the frames of the old Orbis Terarum had been broken, only now, precisely now, was the earth opened up, dot. A new chronotope was needed that would permit one to link real life, history, to the real earth. It was necessary to oppose to eschatology a creative and generative time, a time measured by creative acts, by growth, and not by destruction. The fundamentals of this creating time were present in the images and motifs of folklore. 8. The folkloric bases of the Rabelaisian chronotope the basic forms of this productive and generative time can be traced back to a pre-class, agricultural stage in the development of human society. The preceding stages were poorly suited to the development of a differential feeling for time, and for its reflection in ceremonies and in linguistic images. A powerfully and sharply differentiated feeling for time could arise only on a collective, work-oriented agricultural base. Here was first constituted that feeling for time that had at its heart a taking apart and putting together of social everyday time, the time of holidays and ceremonies connected with the agricultural labor cycle, with the seasons of the year, the periods of the day, the stages in the growth of plants and cattle. And here we get, in the oldest motifs and plots, a reflection of such a time consolidated in language for the first time, a reflection of the temporal relationships of growth to the temporal contiguity of phenomena having widely differing characteristics, associations based on the unity of time. 